Hello friends, this is Zots, at least in one of the earlier scripts, and today we're going to talk about all the killer perks, all of them. This is my personal tier list, and we're going to be going from top to bottom and everything in between, giving each perk a little bit of love, a little bit of attention, and talking about what makes it, you know, stand out from the rest. You can use timestamps down below to skip to any one perk you're interested in, or watch the whole thing if you want to be a big nerd like myself. That being said, if you're a beginner, you might find this information a little bit overwhelming. I have made this picture, which I'll link down below, that has some advice on what perks and builds to aim for if you're starting out, which are going to be a bit simpler and more to the point. And also, if you want to know what is a good build for the killer that you want to play, say that you want to play the pig and you want to know what's a good build for her, you can check out ustaba.com slash spreadsheet or slash builds. And this is a website that has information that is up to date with builds that are good on every killer. So that might be a bit faster if that's what you're looking for. For everybody else, please grab some popcorn because we're going to start to talk about all the perks. And the first one is Corrupt Intervention. This is a perk that blocks the furthest three generators from the place that you spawn in, that you spawn in as a killer. And this is incredible. This is a really, really good effect and easily one of the best perks in the game, if not the best hands down. Now, uh, let's talk about the negatives of this perk first. Some killers do not want survivors to split up. If you're playing a stealth killer like Ghostface or uh, a killer that benefits from hitting multiple survivors one after another like Lesion, you might not actually prefer survivors to split up. You might actually want them to stick together in a corner of the map, in which case, don't run this perk. Some killers also don't like the fact that uh, their hexes might be more likely to be found or their setup might be more likely to be disturbed with this perk. Just don't equip it and that's completely fine. But for almost everyone else, this perk is incredible. In most maps, you will spawn away from many generators and survivors will spawn there. And this perk basically forces them to start walking away and splitting up and giving you more chances to find them even if you don't have any information perks. Now, it is true that this perk goes away if you down someone, but that's fine. Unless you down someone in three seconds, survivors will typically already have wasted enough time going away from their starting location. Some unlucky survivors might also spawn next to an to a generator that is blocked and then find another generator that is blocked and then find another generator that is blocked and that is terrible for them. This really helps in the bigger maps that will typically force survivors to run even further. In indoor maps where survivors already struggle to find gens, this perk works extra because they have to go room to room finding gens and then those gens might be blocked. And even if by some miracle you down someone in three seconds, guess what? That's fine. You're already winning the game more likely uh, just because you had such early pressure. So even in that unlikely scenario, this perk is not getting in your way. It's extremely easy to use. You just need to equip it and basically works on any killer. For that reason, and because it works so well with many other strategies and perks, it really just deserves the number one spot in my opinion. The fact that you only have four gems to worry about and then you can use other add-ons and perks to make those early two minutes uh, very difficult for the survivors to do any significant repairs just works like a charm. It's just easily the best perk in the game. Giving Corrupt a run for its money is Pain Resonance. This is a Scorch Hook perk that creates four white hooks around the map. It doesn't stack with the other Scorches. You will always have four, unless you have a particular one that spawns them in basement, but we'll get to that. And these, these hooks are very, very important to you. In some maps, like Dead Dog Saloon, they typically tend to be at the center and they're always available, and that's great. Some other maps, like the Swamp maps, at least right now, they often spawn Scorch Hooks in edges, and that sucks a little bit. However, even though there is an element of luck and RNG to this perk and any other Scorch Hook perk, for the most part, this perk is so strong that that element of RNG is still not enough to warrant this perk being lower. That's how good it is. Every time you hook a survivor for the first time on a white hook, on a Scorch Hook, that individual survivor has been hooked individually on that survivor for the first time, um, this perk triggers. That means that you can use it um, up to four times 
normally it will be the first time you hook someone, but sometimes, sometimes depending on how the match has gone, it might be on their second or even final hook. So whenever you hook someone for the first time on a scorch hook, whether that's their first, second, or third hook, this perk triggers. And at the moment of triggering, the gem that has the most progress will be slapped by a minus 25%. If the gen is at 99, it will go down to 74. If it's at 25, it will go down to zero. If it's at five, it will go to zero. If it's at zero, nothing will happen. So why is this so good? This is really, really good because shaving off 25% of a gen is incredible. It also happens across the map and is one of these things that can be done by any killer. Almost every single killer in the game will be getting hooks more or less early on. And having a minus 25% on the gen that needs to be regressed the most, even if it's across the map, is an, an absolute blessing for the slower killers that can't keep up otherwise. For the faster killers that can keep up, guess what? You can, pay, you can pair this with other aggressive regression perks like Pop Goes the Weasel. So one of the most popular combinations right now is this and Pop, so that you can kick a gen for minus 25 um, with this perk and then hit it with pop for a minus 20 or whatever, which would be really, really, really nasty that you can do that so quickly. Another really nice thing that can happen is that if a survivor exchanges at the hook and goes down, you will now hook and get another pain rest. And this creates a lose-lose situation for survivors. Say that you hook someone um, in a really awkward part of the map and now someone has to rescue them. If the person that comes to rescue them is a fresh person that you haven't hooked yet, then you get pain rest, which is awesome. And if it's someone that has already been hooked, then you hook someone that is already dead on hook or dead. So no matter what, it's a win-win situation. It This perk just gives you that little bit of motivation to actually hook fresh survivors. Without this perk and without other perks, going for multiple hooks on survivors that are not close to being dead is typically a horrible idea and anytime you have to do that you might be very well losing the game but with this perk not so much it is definitely one of these perks that even though it's decent on all killers it is particularly mean on the strongest killers that are already very good at having really short chases those killers can down someone in seconds prop proc this perk really really quickly before any gens really get done and then use other perks on top of that so pain rest is definitely one of these perks that makes killers that are already good even better and situations that are already one even more one-sided it doesn't always help when you're already struggling and that might give you the idea or the notion that this perk is not good, but the truth is, it is very, very good. It has good synergy with Jolt, with Ruin, uh, with Corrupt, arguably. It has good synergies with almost every um, perk in the game that is also around aggression. Not so much with Deadlock, but it has a very good synergy with Deadman Switch. If a survivor is doing a gen and they get hit by this perk, Deadman Switch will immediately block it for 30 seconds, which is huge and very easy to do, especially if you also add in Fearmonger. We'll talk about that later. So, very usable perk for almost every killer that does a lot of damage, that encourages you to hook multiple people, that punishes survivors for exchanges, pretty much no matter what so it is really really good and that's all i have to say about it next up is no way out no way out is a perk that is not really that much used compared to how strong it is for each person that you hook no way out gets stronger and at the end of the game when the generators are powered when survivors try to open gates, when they try to touch it, the gates will be blocked for a variable time. This time can go from 12 seconds if you don't hook anyone. So even at its worst, this perk is still stronger than, remember me, 12 seconds. Then it can go up to 24, 36, 48. And if you hooked every survivor, it blocks uh, the exit gates for 60 seconds. That is absolutely huge that is a really really big number now the thing about this perk is that you don't have to max it out if you do that's great but you don't have to even if you only have two or three stacks this perk provides a massive massive window at the end game for you to make a comeback or seal the deal and get an extra kill that you wouldn't otherwise again much like corrupt intervention this works kind of passively so this is a perk that for the most part every killer can use and you don't have to have a specific type of character to get use of so it's really really fantastic in that, in that regard uh, keep in mind that after the perk is gone survivors don't open the gates immediately they still have to open the 20 seconds so that means that someone has to wait there and be very careful uh, for about the timing 
and then begin to open it. So in endgame situations, you have a next, you could have an extra 80 seconds. And that's assuming that survivors touch the gates really early. Many survivors, especially if they're already in bad shape near the endgame and don't have many adrenalines, they will struggle. They might be hit by Noe, they might be hit by some other circumstance, they might not touch the gate right away. And that means that during the time they don't they don't touch the gate, this perk doesn't trigger, so they might waste a lot of time, and then when they try to open the gate last second, bam, this perk hits them like a truck. It is really, really mean and pairs well with endgame builds and on killers that have good mobility and can adapt to endgame situations. Did I also mention that this perk triggers in the 1v1? If you close the hatch, the last survivor trying to open the gates, even if they have wake up or soul survivor to open the gate faster, they can't do anything. They will basically, the, because the perk notifies you of which gate gets touched, you will basically basically know where they are and it will be impossible for them to escape. I don't know if this is very important. I personally don't care if I get three or four kills, but some people do. And for those, this perk is extremely, extremely valuable. Uh, for everyone else, I just think it's just a really, really, really solid perk. But you need to be a little bit smart and you need to play into it well. If you camp and they have reassurance or if you waste your time horribly or if you have no pressure, the perk is quite underwhelming. But guess what? Any perk can be underwhelming in those circumstances, so it's really not fair. I would say that, uh, as it is right now, it is one of the more consistent and good perks uh, for Killer. Next up is Deadlock. Now, Deadlock uh, is a bit of a strange cookie. It doesn't necessarily synergize extremely well with other uh, slowdown perks, but it is so good on its own and still has a good... Uh, a, a few good combinations that you can use it with. It is a really simple perk to use that requires zero input from the killer and works pretty much like a charm on its own. What this perk does is that when a, when a survivor finishes a generator, the next generator that has the most progress will be blocked for 30 seconds. While this generator is blocked, it cannot be affected negatively by either side. If it's stuck at 95%, you cannot make it go up, but you can also not make it go down. It will not regress to ruin or be hit by pain rest, which is bad for the killer, but it can also not be done by the survivors, which is a really, really big relief for the killer. So... Um, if you are AFK and you don't really do anything, even that alone, this perk, e even if you do nothing at all, uh, this perk will sometimes buy you very useful time. Worst case scenario, survivors are smart and they use those 30 seconds to go to another gen or start to heal or do some other useful thing. Uh, teams can be smart and they can play around this perk. Uh, as it is right now, it's still bucked. And if two survivors finish a gen at the same time, the perk doesn't trigger, but that's really, really rare and difficult to pull off. And sometimes if you are a little bit unlucky and the rest of your build doesn't make a lot of sense, you can have situations where... Uh, they have three gens ready to pop. They pop one, then they pop the other, and then they go work another, and then they pop the third one. And Deadlock is just a very minor stall. This perk can feel really, really bad at times, but that is more of a failure in your ability to pressure survivors and the rest of your build than the perk itself. If you have a build to never let multiple gens get done, let's say you include Tinkerer or the Scordons or whatever, this perk will force survivors to split up and when they do, they will eat it and they will eat the 30 seconds. It also allows you it also gives you a lot of time to set up and extend the game, uh, which is really useful for killers that need to constantly reset. Uh, there are a few killers where even survivors are not doing anything and they're just healing, that's good. It means you get to set more traps or get more stock or do whatever. So for the for the slow pace killers, this perk is really, really useful. And for everyone else, it is very, very usable. The fact that survivors don't have any way to counter it or avoid it too directly um, is also a big plus. For that, for, for that reason, I would say it's the final perk in the five stars. Um, everything past this point begins to have a few more downsides or requires a bit more or is a bit more killer specific. But yeah, that's pretty much it. The, the best survivor strategy, by the way, against Deadlock, if you're curious, is to 99 one gen. If they have one gen in a corner of the map and they leave it 99, they can make Deadlock constantly block that gen that you can't really defend because it's too far and then just go and pop it at the end. So there are some counterplays, but still... Com Considering how easy this perk is and how much value it gives you and how they ban it in some tournaments just because it is so powerful, yeah, it's it's a it's a really really good perk. And next up we have Pop Goes the Weasel. So 
Uh, what does this perk do? Every time you hook a swabber, you have a 45 second window where this perk is this perk is active, and you will act. You it is active, and you will use it if you kick a generator during that time. If you kick a generator during that time, first you will do the normal 2.5% damage. So say a gen is like 99.999. Let's say it's 100% pretty much. You hit it. Well, now minus 2.5, so now it's 97.5. And then after that, it will do 30% of a gen's current progress. 30%, not of the total, of the current progress. That means that if it was 90%, it will go down to 60. And if it was, I don't know, um, 30%, it will go down to 20. So it's going to take more damage the further the gen is progress. This is still really, really good. This perk got a minor buff from 20 to 30 recently, and it is a big, big deal. This perk, along with the kick, and along with the regression that happens afterwards, is just a huge, huge setback for survivors. A really quick thing to do for the killer, especially if they have mobility, and especially if they have other gen kick perks. So those are the situations where this perk really, really shines. If you put this perk on a trapper and the rest of your build doesn't really support it and you're a slow killer like a clown, yeah, this perk is all right. The numbers are pretty big and sometimes it will help, sometimes it will be underwhelming. But the moment you put this perk on a killer like Wraith and then add in Nowhere to Hide or Eruption or Overcharge or whatever other perk that you like for gen kicks, then kicking a gen is very natural. Uh, doing it after a hook is very quick. You apply a bunch of other perks that keep you in the flow, and guess what? Now you're adding a minus 30% of the current progress. It is extremely, extremely mean. Uh, even if you don't have other gen kick perks, it pairs really, really well with pain resonance for the high tier killers. The high tier killers all have insane chase potential, which means that even good survivors typically won't last much uh, much more than a minute in the best case of scenarios. And that means that every minute, you are getting a minus 25% from Pendress and a minus 20 or a minus 30 or a minus whatever from Pop. And sometimes you also have mobility to deliver this to the gen. So this perk is just disgusting. It's just disgusting because it makes those quick downs um, make quick work of gens. If you have a gen that's 50% and you're thinking of finishing it and your teammate goes down next to you, guess what? You eat a jolt, you eat a painless, you eat a pop, that gen goes back to nothing. So the way that this perk stacks with other gen kick perks and the way that it can be used by the higher tier killers, it just gives it that potential. For everybody else, it's not that insane, but it's still a decent perk. Next up is Jolt. Now, Jolt is a perk that has a surprising amount of counterplay from survivors. Um, the first thing that you need to know about this perk is that it triggers around you when you down someone with a basic attack. This already makes it a really poor pick for killers that use special attacks. So if you play Huntress uh, and you hit people with your hatchets or use the nurse and hit with your special blink attacks, this perk doesn't work and those killers don't benefit very much from it. For everyone else, this perk is really usable. Most killers uh, down with their basic attack, things like, even killers like uh, the Death Slinger, they reel you in and they hit you with a basic attack, so this perk is usable on almost everyone. And survivors, they do have a way to avoid it by going into lockers, but most survivors don't realize, don't care, or don't find a locker in time, so for the most part, this is a very usable perk that almost every single killer can benefit from. When you down a survivor with a basic attack, not injured but down, this perk triggers, and the gens around you in a big radius explode and lose a bit of progress. As of a recent update, survivors that are on those gens also scream, which will give you some information and might trigger some other perks as well. So, um, this can be incredible. If you pair this with other perks, or if you go to a map where the gens are stacked together, say you go Midwitch, where multiple floors are are laid on top of each other, if you down someone in the middle of the map, you can hit like three or four gens with this, which could be insanely good. There's also a lot of situations where you have insta down or have say the best for last and hit survivors really quickly, and you can get a down, and then a survivor might get picked up, or another survivor might show up, and then you get another down, and that will be a minus eight, and a minus eight, and a minus eight, and as many times as you get a down, because this perk doesn't have a cooldown, which is really, really, really good. Now, uh, the, the fact that it makes um, gens regress um, 
makes it a good pair with Surveillance to immediately check. Uh, it can work with Ruin, it can go with Pain Dress. Um, it has a bit of a weird synergy with Gen Kick perks, but you could use it with them. It's a bit of a kill, but you totally, totally could. And it can be very, very oppressive if survivors are struggling to heal and you keep downing them and you keep triggering this perk. So that is pretty wonderful. And like the, 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 the mere ease of use and the fact that you just do your job and for the most part, get this perk to work, that alone makes it really, really good. There's a little problem though, and that is the larger maps. In the larger maps, survivors will typically, if they're smart, try to run you away from the active gens and they will have so much space that the moment they they get a bit of a sprint they're already far away and the range of this perk is its biggest drawback on the larger maps you will be looking at hitting one gen per down and thus you need to run corrupt intervention or some other perk to help you with that so yeah it has the weakness that it can be used with them to killers some counterplay of survivors going into lockers and actively avoiding it and the downside that it won't help you in some of the worst maps in the game but keep in mind, it might also help you in some other maps that are tricky, like, for example, maps with buildings or basements, like Badham, you can hit gens underneath the floors and on different platforms without having to go up there, which can be a massive, massive uh, thing for you as a killer. So it does have some downside or some downside or some limitations, but for the most part, it is a very, very solid perk. Next up is Hex no one escapes dead uh also known as hex know it this is a very mean perk still uh, at the end of the of the game uh, when all the generators are powered or when you close the hatch typically when all the gens are powered you have uh this perk light up as long as one totem remains in the map if there is one dull totem the the ones that are white not the blue ones not the hexes it needs to be a white dull totem if as long as there's one this perk will occupy it at random and then you will become 4% faster, which is a big deal. It is a fairly big deal. It throws survivors off quite often and helps you maybe get hits in places that would otherwise uh, slow you down quite a bit. And you insta down with your basic attack. Mind you, the perk doesn't get revealed if you use your power or if you get a grab. Unlike the Bower Hope, which is a, a different perk that we'll talk about in a minute, if you use a hatchet or something else that doesn't revolve your main, your main attack, you don't actually show this perk to survivors. So if they're a little bit silly, they might they might miss the fact and go in willy-nilly and then eat this perk when it really, really matters. Whenever the perk is revealed to survivors, whenever you actually hit a survivor with this perk, with your basic attack, uh, everyone in the game will see it, and then they will the, the totem itself will become visible. Uh, if they get close to it, it will have a larger and larger and larger radius so that they can find it. So what typically will happen is that survivors will see this totem uh, once you down someone with it and then try to cleanse it if they have a reason to stay. If they don't have a reason to stay and the exit gates are open, guess what? They're just going to leave. So... Uh, is this perk incredible in the way it used to be? No. This perk used to be even dumber. It gave you no indication as a swabber that it was there. You couldn't find the totem. And yeah, it was really hard to find it. Now, even solo players might see it and they will see that someone's cleansing the totem. So the, the, the su solo survivors are no longer as screwed over as they were by this perk in the past, now that it shows itself. But it's still a really, really mean perk. And keep in mind, there are a few killers that are very good at interrupt uh, interrupt interrupting totems. If you play a trap killer, you can trap it. If you play doctor, you can zap it. If you play artist, you can send birds and swarm it. And that makes this perk really, really mean. It is a great counter to Adrenaline. It is a great counter to early uh, to late game body blocks and other shenanigans. It is a decent counter to the speed boost of Hope, which is becoming more popular. And if you have a build around it and you uh, reach the ending game in a solid state, you can convert that into an easy win and put survivors in very uncomfortable positions. Uh, it is a bit out of your control whether or not they do all the totems or they find the Noid really quickly. Uh, but for the most part, it is an RNG that benefits you, that, ha that gives you quite a bit of control. And if you have a build around that, I think it's still very, very strong. Um, just do be careful. Uh, if you run it by itself, you might actually be in a situation where you're down a survivor and their teammates, instead of doing anything else, they just leave. So again, you need to build around it, bring No Way Out, bring Bitter Murmur to see everyone at the end, have a killer that is suited for Noet, and I think it's a pretty decent perk. 
Next up is Save the Best for Last. Save the Best for Last affects the cooldown of your basic attack. Your basic attack has a cooldown of, I believe now, 2.7 seconds. So when you hit the survivor, you do your little blade swipe, 2.7 seconds. Uh, but this perk makes that shorter. On your first hit on a survivor, you will gain one stack and that will already make that very first swing 5% faster. Then the next one will be another 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, up until eight. Once you have eight stacks, you will be at the max, which is 40. 40% 40 is very fast. It is incredibly fast. With Save the Best for Last, you can hit a survivor and save many, many, many seconds of catch up. If the survivor is trying to do something risky, like finish a generator in front of you, open a gate in front of you, get a rescue in front of you, sometimes they won't even have any time to do that. You can hit a survivor and then immediately grab them out of a hook if they're a little bit unlucky or if the ping is a little bit bad, which is incredibly, incredibly good. Uh, some killers also benefit from Say the Best for Last in very unique ways in that they can hit you, uh, for example, Slinger, and then while you speed off, he can shoot you and get you really, really quickly. There is a new perk called Force Hesitation that makes survivors slow when you down someone. So you can down a survivor and then recover fast and hit another survivor that was healing it, for example. Uh, it also works while you're carrying. So if someone's trying to do a sabotage or, 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 or take hits, this perk absolutely murders that. It, it destroys that. It makes sabotaging in front of you after a hit pretty much impossible. So it, it destroys, uh, needless to say, body blocks become very difficult to do as well. So it does a lot. It does a lot. Um, however, um, it is an obsession perk that requires you to hit non-obsessions to power up. And every time you hit the obsession, you lose two stacks. So basically, what you want to do with this perk is have information perks like Discordance to find non-obsession survivors constantly, or play it on a killer that can hit the obsession with a special attack. So for example, if you run this on Demogorgon, which is very popular, um, or the Deathslinger, you can not use your basic attack, you can in instead injure or down them with the chain or with the shred or with something else. So on those killers, this perk is easy and comfortable to use, although be careful, it can be a bit of a trap. It can be sometimes uh, so comfy that you forget to actually use your power enough to make the killer fearsome. You don't want to rely on this perk on killers that have an actual nice power. It's a bit of a crutch. You want to use it on killers that don't have much of a chase power, and that really benefit from it. Trapper is a great idea. Uh, a pig it can be a great idea. Doctor can be a great idea. These killers benefit from this a lot. Um, and very, very directly. Um, do keep in mind, though, that sometimes if the obsession changes or if they, the obsession comes and takes hits, you need to be uh, smart and adapt to that. Now, uh, uh, is there any other downside uh, to this perk? One second. Uh, forgive me, yeah. The thing that I was forgetting that I need to mention is that if the obsession dies, this perk will become frozen in time. So if you have one stack and the obsession gets killed, that's it. You can't get any more. Uh, conversely, though, if you have eight stacks, the max, and the obsession dies, you get to keep them, which is really, really good. Uh, sometimes you might want to play around that fact a little bit. The worst thing that could happen is that you try to kill a survivor a bit too soon after they've been unhooked. They hit you with decisive then you hit them, then they have dead heart, then you hit them again, and now you've lost all of your stacks and you kill that person and you have none. Or worse, you don't kill that person, you lose the game. So, yeah. It is. It, it can induce players into making terrible mistakes. Sometimes going for the obsession is the right play, despite the perk. But if you're smart enough to use this on killers uh, that use it well, and if you have a build that complements it, I reckon that Say the Best for is one of the best perks in the game and really, really helps in end games where otherwise you would be really, really hard pressed to catch up to survivors. Next up is Lethal Pursuer. This perk shows you the aura of everyone at the start of the game for 9 seconds, and it affects every other aura reading perk uh, and add-on by extending the time that auras are shown to you for 2 seconds. So, let's talk about this side effect first. This does not affect perks that or add-ons that have a range modifier to them. So, for example, Nurse's Calling, which shows you the auras of anyone that heals within x meters of you, that doesn't work. It's only perks and add-ons that have a time aura reveal. 
almost every single perk and add-on that has a 3 second, 5 second, 9 second auto reveal, this perk will make that 2 seconds longer. There are a couple, a couple perks and add-ons that are bugged and don't work with this. I think the only one that comes to mind right now is uh, the Myers um, mirror add-ons, but almost every single one works as intended and shows you more auras. And that is awesome. That is great. The fact that this perk makes other perks and other add-ons better is good. However, however, I will say, be careful. Do not try to get too much synergy out of this perk because you will be a one-trick pony and you will have a glaring weakness. If you have Lethal Pursuer, and then you think, oh, wow, I'm going to make this other auto-reading perk better. Oh, wow, I'm going to put uh, three more auto-reading perks and I'm going to have two auto-reading add-ons. Guess what? If you play against a team that has multiple distortion users or multiple of the records, your all of your auto-reading perks and add-ons are going to be largely useless, at least useless at the start of the game when it really matters. So you need to be a little bit careful not to go too hard on the lethal pursuer train. If you exercise a little bit of restraint and you're smart about your add-on perks uh, and, and choices, I think this perk is great. It shows you the auto of everyone at the start, which is incredibly, incredibly useful. Sometimes it tells you that you're screwed. Yes, that every survivor is split. Yes, but you still have a great amount of information to use immediately and in the middle game. Many times you will down a survivor and then pick them up and then you'll find out that there was someone else there and they get a pallet save or a rescue with a flashlight and with lethal you would have known many times you've done a survivor you hook them and you don't know which gen to check because you haven't seen anyone else but with lethal pursuer you will have the memory of wherever survivor was and kind of be able to tell which gens they're likely to go to at the start you can also learn a lot with lethal uh, by watching a survivor at the start if you watch a survivor that is walking it's almost guaranteed that they'll have sprinters Keep that in mind, whether you want to chase that or not, up to you. If you see only two survivors, that tells you that the other two are running Distortion, which is a perk that hides the auras, so you might want to keep that in mind in the future as well. So you can learn a little bit about how survivors work, and ideally you find a group of survivors at the start, and you bother them, and then that's multiple people not doing anything for a while, which is amazing uh, for you as a killer to hurt their efficiency that much. It is just really, really good. Unfortunately... Um, as it is tradition, the weaker killers cannot benefit from this perk as much since they're not fast enough typically to catch up to survivors. And on the larger, larger maps, seeing survivors from super, super far sometimes is a bit redundant. Like, it gives you an idea, but by the time you're there, you don't even find them. So it is a little bit sad that in those situations, even this perk isn't all that great or not enough to help but in almost every other situation this perk is extremely comfy extremely reliable it makes you stronger in your earlier game which is it's possibly the most important part of your game it's it's the part where everything gets decided so if you have a good early game like that will often make or break the the rest of your match almost immediately so i cannot praise it enough Next up is Sloppy Butcher. This perk uh, makes it so that survivors have a mangled and hemorrhage effect when they are hit by a basic attack. Much like Jolt, this is not a perk that you want to put on characters that hit with their special attacks, so it's not a great pick on Nurse or not a great pick on Huntress, but don't worry, those characters typically have their own mangled add-ons. So what it does is survivors leave more blood on the ground when they're injured, which could be useful for some killer tracking. And more importantly... Um, they heal slower from the mangled, and if their healing is interrupted, they lose that progress. These two things combined are extremely, extremely mean. On killers that need people to stay injured, or that benefit massively from people staying injured, this perk is incredible. We're talking in uh, spirit who can immediately hear you and track you really well and injured. Um, we're talking Dredge, who builds up his Nightfall faster when you're injured. All of these killers are amazing. And if you pair Nurse's Calling or other tracking perks or add-ons, and you can constantly find people healing, even if, you, even if you can't commit to them for long, even if you don't have time to actually chase them for 20 seconds, you can just walk at them, run, run at them for a second, make them drop a pallet, and guess what? All of their healing progress is gone. This perk is 
I would say almost slightly overtuned to the point where many survivors these days just run adrenaline to counter it and don't bo and, and decide to stay injured or use syringes to counter it. So <laughs> it is it is really really that strong. Um, is there anything else remarkable about this perk? It does not stack with other forms of mangled, so do not use this perk with mangled add-ons or with other mangled perks such as Gift of Pain. It doesn't really, it doesn't do anything if you put them together. So it's a really, really good perk to run on its own. Uh, keep in mind, though, that some uh, some uh, survivors that you play against are comfortable being injured. It's not good enough to injure them if they're going to stay injured and get adrenaline at the end of the game and do gents with resilience faster. So do be careful. Against some teams, you might be digging your own grave if you try to be a bit too ambitious and split pressure. Um, typically, what you need to do against these teams is have a have a person dead on hook early so that everyone else wants to heal to take to get, take hits for them, defend them, and that's where this perk will really, really hurt. If you tunnel someone super aggressively, this perk does nothing. If you camp someone super aggressively, this perk does nothing. If you just kick gens and don't bother doing and letting people heal in the distance, then this perk does nothing. So keep that in mind. Uh, be smart about your build, and you'll get value for this. Next is Deathman Switch. This perk triggers every single time you hook a survivor. It does have a cooldown, so it doesn't trigger... Uh, on top of itself, but for the most part, it's very easy to play around it. Sometimes you can even wait a second before hooking to make sure that it triggers. When this perk is on, anytime you bother a survivor off a gen, they don't get a warning, uh, not anymore, they, they will block the gen that they were on. And this happens even if only one survivor leaves. So basically, for the next 30 seconds, yeah, it's 30 seconds now, for the next 30 seconds, this perk is like a trap that will make every gen blocked if someone leaves it. Um, let's talk about some of the situations where this can happen. The first and most obvious one is if the killer has pain resonance. If the killer has pain resonance and you're working on a gen, if you let go, then the pain rest happens and you touch it, you'll be fine. Even though there's a risk you might get a skill check while you let go, which would be terrible. But if you're doing the gen, you will be hit by the perk. This will make you scream. A similar thing happens with Jolt. And then, because you let go of the gen, bang, the gen gets blocked. After the gen gets blocked, it cannot continue to go down, which is good, but you can also not stop it. Uh, and, and, and you can also not reset it and make it go up again. So you need to wait out the remaining 30 seconds, which is a pretty big deal and a big, big momentum killer while the killer is busy doing other stuff. So it's a pretty big deal. Now, there are um, a few other situations where survivors can mess up. If you have three survivors on a gen, and one of them decides, oh, I'm going to go for the rescue. That survivor leaving will block the gen for everyone else, which is a big, big deal. And needless to say, there's also a lot of killers that have powers that can kick survivors out of a gen directly or indirectly. If you're playing Freddy and you fake a teleport, many people will let go of their gen. If you send birds to a generator, that is a lot of pressure on survivors typically need to let go at some point. If you're playing Doctor and you, sh and you blast... Uh, which is a really common strategy with this, you will also block gens. Uh, be careful, though, sometimes blocking a gen, if you're not going to harass it later, isn't all that good. Like, survivors will use that time to heal or do something else. You don't want to just walk to gens, block them, and then do nothing. You definitely want to be um, efficient with your own time. But if you manage to do that, demon switch is extremely mean. Uh, for the most part, hard to avoid. The first time or two survivors notice it, it might hurt their efficiency quite a bit. And it's fairly easy to use as a killer, so I rate it quite highly. Oh, I just noticed the cursor was off-center. Sorry about that. I'll fix that before I move on. Next up, Discordance. Discordance is an extremely easy to use perk that cannot be countered unlike most other information perks. It has a range that is very, very big, so it might as well be infinite. It covers pretty much the entirety of any map. And within this range, if two survivors or more, typically two survivors, are on a gen, the perk will trigger, give you a notification, and highlight the gen in yellow. If the survivors stay on the gen, then the perk will continue to ping you on and off, on and off, um, as the time happens. Now, this is incredible. This is really, really, really good. If Lethal Pursuer didn't exist, and if Corrupt Intervention wasn't a thing, I would run this perk almost religiously. Being able to know where two or three survivors are 
is useful for so many reasons. I don't even know if we have time to talk about all of them. Uh, let's do a, a super quick round of information. First, at the start of the match, if you find multiple survivors, guess what? You might find all four of them. Bothering all of them at once is a good thing. That's it. That's one thing. Number two, if you have an obsession perk, you're very likely to find the obsession or the non-obsession. Especially the non-obsession. Because if you find two people, one of them, by definition, is going to not be the obsession. So this is amazing with Sedus for Last. Um, it's amazing with Player to Food if you want to find the obsession. It's really, really good. It can also sometimes help you figure out the hints and cues of what has happened. So say, for example, um, someone gets unhooked next to a gen, and then you hear the scordons go off. Guess what? If you hear the scordons go off, that means that the person that got unhooked and the person that unhooked them both touched the gen for like a split second together. And that means that that person of the hook doesn't have off the record. If you go to them and they are completely silent, normally you would be like, mm, they're silent. Ah, that means they have off the record. That means that if I hit them, they're not going to go down. Ugh, what should I do? What should I do? But with this perk, you know that they touch the gen. And if they touch the gen, no decisive, no off the record, and no BS like that. So it can tell you that someone has done a conspicuous action which is huge. It can also help you find out where people are by elimination. So say that you have a survivor on the ground and a survivor on the hook, and you're asking yourself, oh, do I have enough time to hook this survivor? Ah, uh, probably not. Maybe I'm going to get flashy safe. Wait, maybe there's someone here to rescue with the pallet. But then if you hear the scoilings across the map, then you know where everybody is. And if you know where everybody is, you have the tools to make the best decision at any given time. So the, the information that the scoilings gives is incredible. And as I teased earlier, this is a perk that cannot be countered. Survivors have no actual way of confirming that you have this perk unless you're playing Nemesis and they notice that a zombie is attracted to it. That might be it. That might be the only way. Um, but for the most part, they don't have any way to know unless they guess. And there, this perk doesn't show you the auto of, of any survivor. It cannot be countered by distortion of the record. So it's a very reliable perk. And guess what? If you have this perk and then it doesn't turn on throughout the entire match, that might be a bit disappointing, but that is also information. If the perk doesn't go off, that means that at any point, survivors are just either not doing gens or splitting up. And that is also useful. If you have a generator that is at 50% and you are worried that that generator is going to pop before you show up there with some regression perk and the perk never activates, then you know that that generator is at least going to take 40-something seconds for a single person to do, because ne there was never two people on it. So you can deduce a lot of information and also gather a lot of, uh, of, of insight just by watching this perk not turn on. So, great perk, highly recommended. The only thing about it that I don't like is that, you know, lethal and corrupt intervention and some other perks like Tinker, they might actually be more useful for you, and you might prefer them instead of this perk. But overall, very, very solid perk. Devourer Hope is possibly the most oppressive perk in the game once it triggers, and it is the hardest hex perk to ignore in the game, period, if it triggers, if it gets active. For that reason, this perk, in my opinion, is very powerful. If I'm playing against a killer that has multiple hexes, and the killer has already gotten a couple hooks, I'm very, very scared of this perk. Almost any other perk, I wouldn't be too worried about. You can play around it, you can ignore it, even know it in the end game. Eh, sometimes you might be able to just get three people out, but this is a perk that you cannot ignore. The Vower Hope gains is a hex perk that starts out as a hex. It can be cleansed at the start, which would be tragic, so you need to defend it and maybe bring other hexes to protect it. And once you hook a survivor and this survivor becomes unhooked while you are a little bit far away, 24 meters, I think, then you gain one token. So basically, you need to let survivors unhook multiple times for this perk to begin to work. Uh, starting from your second unhook, the perk gives you a slight boost of speed. Actually, a decent boost of speed for 10 seconds, 10 seconds after you hook. You can see it in the HUD. This might not seem like much, but that little bit of extra speed is really, really, really good. It can really make your second or your third or fourth down much, much easier to get. And survivors almost never account for it. And then when you get three tokens, you be, you make every survivor exposed. They get a warning that you have the perk. Even if you hit with an M2, they will get a warning. So if you're playing, say, Huntress, uh, and you shoot them, uh, you hit them with a, with a Huntress hatchet, or if you're playing Slinger and you shoot them, even that shot, even that, 
will reveal the Bower Hope to everyone. So be careful. Don't reveal it too early if you don't have to. Uh, the only thing that won't reveal it is a grab, I think. And then they will be panicking. Because if you get to 3, yeah, it's insta-down with your basic attack. But if you get to 5, you can Mori them. You can just straight up kill them with your Mori animation. So, as I said, this is a really important perk for survivors to deal with. So, what's the deal with this perk? If you run Undying, you will need to do at least 2 hexes to get rid of it. If you run Undying and Pentimento, you will need to do 2 totems to get rid of it. And then the killer can relight those 2 totems to make it very, very annoying to do gens afterwards. And if you have Undying, um, Pentimento, and Haunted Ground, the survivors might trigger a trap and go and, and get themselves down. Or you can also add Retribution, so as you can see. So you see the trend, right? The, the perk by itself is not all that fantastic. It has the risk of getting cleansed early on, which would be a bit of a downer. Uh, it would still be okay. You would still waste survivor's time, I suppose, but... Um, the perk really shines when you pair it with other trap and other protective hexes and it becomes a bit of a time bomb Where if you are good at getting your first two to three downs Survivors are gonna be in a hell of a lot of trouble Not to mention that there's a lot of killers that can protect totems well trapper can trap them play can puke on them Many killers can can make survivors scream like doctor to occasionally stop the traps from being done So it is one of these really really nasty perks that most survivors are not ready to deal with and even dealing with them you don't really know what's the right thing to do because you could cleanse a totem and it could be haunted right so it is a big vibe check for solo players and a big uh coordination test for even coordinated teams so uh for that reason the perk is really 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 strong has all of the downsides of rng um that is uh, often associated to hexes but also is as strong as it comes and it's because of this perk that other hexes become a little bit scarier. And yeah, that's pretty much it for the Bower Hope. Next is Nowhere to Hide. This perk is extremely, extremely unique and very good on a variety of killers. I would say it's almost good on anyone, but it's just like the thing about this perk is that it shows you the aura of people around you when you kick a gen. And it has basically no cooldown. It has no cooldown basically to speak of. That is crazy. There are so many other perks like barbecue and chili or thwack that, that have like crazy restrictions on range or crazy cooldowns. And, and this perk just works. You kick a gen, you see people around you. They have distortion, you don't see them. But then next time they won't have it anymore because you keep doing that. It goes extremely well on killers that are fast. It goes extremely well on builds around eruption and pop and so on. Uh, dragon grip and so on. It works really well on killers that can really punish survivors that are hiding. It makes survivors hiding near gens a horrible idea. If you like, I've 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 seen so many games be lost, and I've lost so many games myself because the killer gets one free hit or one free down after using this perk. It is super 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 good. The nice thing about this perk as well is that when you kick a gen, it doesn't show the auras around the gen. It shows the auras around you. So if you run. If after kicking the gen you move a little bit, you will see people further. So if this is done on a killer like Oni who can move very fast, or God forbid Nurse, yeah, she can basically find anyone around, around a gen. And kicking a gen right now is, is a decent idea with perks. It, it's a very good idea. And with this one, it tells you a lot. Uh, the nice thing about this as well is that if there's a survivor nearby that was going to touch that gen and immediately undo your damage, now you chase that. So you're almost guaranteed that every time you kick a gen, that gen's going to keep going down for a little while since you'll know everyone that was around to touch it and reset it again. So very obnoxiously, uh, obnoxiously uh, powerful information perk. Next is Blood Favor. Blood Favor gives a bit of a run to the Bower Hope for the best hex in the game right now. I don't think it's as intense as the Bower, but it becomes useful a lot sooner. And there are a lot of killers and a lot of maps where this perk is really, really, really mean. And it also does something that almost no other perk will do which is to help you a lot in your first chase. And that is something that I cannot commend it enough for. So Blood Favor activates when you hit a survivor. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is... Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, forgive me. I just wanted to double check. Whenever you damage a survivor, so 
healthy to injured or healthy to down or injured to down. Whenever you deal a damage state, not if you make them mending, for example, uh, if they were out of the injured, whenever you actually make them lose a health state, this perk triggers and the pallets around 30 me 32 meters around you become blocked for a while. This is really, really decent. Um, in some of the simplest forms this perk can help you, it can be something as simple as you down a survivor on a pallet, and now if there's other survivors around you, you don't care. They cannot drop the pallet on you. The survivor on the ground cannot use flip-flop. They don't have anything like that. So the one of, those, one of the simpler, nicest things this perk can do for you is completely eliminate pallet rescue counterplay. So that's pretty damn nice. Um, but uh, more often than not, what you want this perk for is the help in chase. If you down, if you hit a survivor and they are a little bit panicky and don't make a lot of distance, which happens fairly often, they will have zero pallets and they might not be in a good spot to use a window either. So that will be an immediate down. Uh, sometimes they will be, they will react nice to your hit and try to make distance, but they might instead have to run away from a place where they want it to be. And now they have to run into another part of the map that is not as advantageous or that has teammates doing gens. So it will force survivors to run into awkward places. Because the 32 meters is obviously all around you, this also means that it works above you. If you hit a survivor in the basement, they will it will block the pallet up in the shack. If you hit a survivor on a building and then they go down, they won't have the pallets down below. So this, believe it or not, it comes in pretty often in maps like Midwich, where you down a survivor, where you hit a survivor and they take the stairs only to find that the pallet at the other side is gone, uh, even if they run ar around for a little while. So this helps a lot in your first chases. It is really good on killers that have some kind of mobility, particularly nasty on Spirit, uh, particularly nasty on Trickster, from my experience. But hardly, hardly uh, a perk that is only for a specific killer. It works really, really well on even basic killers. Um, I've even found it to be useful on Hag and other setup killers so that you don't have to necessarily worry too much about resources at the start. Like, it's it's just a really, really solid perk. And typically, what you'll want to do is also to protect it with Undying and or Pentimento so that if survivors get rid of it early, you have something else going on for you. Obviously, as a Hex, its main weakness is the fact that it can be cleansed early. Other than that, though, very, very solid perk. I'm a big fan of it. Next is Tinkerer. Tinkerer procs whenever any generator hits the 70% mark. Uh, there are seven generators on any map, so that means that this perk could activate up to seven times. It doesn't activate multiple times on the same generator. It used to, but not anymore. So you can get it to trigger up to seven times. More often than not, it will just be five or six, right? Because survivors don't typically do more gens than they have to. Uh, but that, that one thing is clear, Tinkerer is unavoidable. There's no way that they can do a whole gen without triggering Tinkerer. In a very bad case scenario, they might have something like potential energy or a brand new part or like three people on at once. Uh, so they might do they might trigger Tinkerer and then immediately finish the gen just a few seconds after. That would be a worst case scenario, but you can always pair it with the Scorelands if you're afraid of multiple people. So basically, Tinkerer gives you a head start that a gen is about to be done. It shows you where the gen is about to be done, and for the next few seconds, it also gives you undetectable. This undetectable is useful, I would argue, on even stealth killers. Even stealth killers benefit from this. If you're playing Sadako, guess what? She doesn't have a lullaby if she's un if she's manifested. So you can you can take advantage of the fact that she doesn't have a foot like uh like foot um, like footstep sounds and grab someone. If you're playing pig, you can use the tinker to grab someone out of a gen without necessarily crouching, which would make you slower. So it is useful on even the killers that you would think it's not useful on. Needless to say, it's also amazing on killers with chainsaws or insta downs. It's it's really useful on killers like Wesker or Pinhead that are naturally quiet. Even on killers like Nemesis, which are very loud, getting that little drop can be useful. And being able to know when a gen is about to be done pairs very well with perks like Pop Goes the Weasel. If you have multiple gens available and one of them is tinkered, 
then that pop is going to do a lot of damage. So, yeah, it's very good. The only thing this perk lacks is sustained use. Unlike Nowhere to Hide or unlike Eruption, which we'll talk about later, you cannot spam this perk. Once the perk has been used, that gen is a little bit weaker because it cannot work twice. So that's something that you got to look out for. You, you can't keep utilizing this perk. But other than that, it's a fantastic perk that works super well on most characters that works particularly well on a few that has great synergies with other perks that can help you in the end game um, as well to know which gen is being finished and basically what this perk does is it gives you insurance there will never be a time where a gen gets done and you go huh that gen was being worked on huh that so quickly you will also have a bit of information the fact that you can also count how long a gen takes can give you insight on how many people were working on it so, for example, um, when when Tinkerer triggers, you know that you can wait out the whole, I believe, 16 seconds and then count eight, more or less, and that's how long you have. So, you can you can know how close a gen is to being 99, and if it triggers faster than that, you can look at your perk and figure out, okay, it was two people. Uh, okay, they had proved themselves. You can actually figure out these things if you know the timer well enough. So, that's nice as well. Next, we have Hex Undying. Hex Undying starts out as a lighted up Hex perk. And what this perk will do is basically do a get down Mr. President for any other Hex. So if you have a Hex, let's say it's Ruin and you have Undying, if they cleanse Undying, well, it's gone. And if they cleanse Ruin, then Undying will, it will swap with it. So basically this perk will copy any Hex that gets done and keep it in the game. This is really useful. If you have Ruin, now you have two Ruins. If you have Haunted, you can have two Haunted. So you can have two Insta Down 60 second periods. If you have Devour, you have two Devours. And yes, if you somehow have Pentimento, you can have two Pentimentos, even though typically by that time, Undying should be gone. So Undying will basically always be your first Hex to go. If you have three Hexes and Undying, whichever Hex gets cleansed always will be Undying one way or another. So it's a really, really nice delay method and an incredible, difficult, steep um, a hill to climb for survivors trying to get to your hexes. If you have Devour, Hope, and Undying and survivors suddenly realize that they have to do two totems, that is a big slap to the face. On top of that, uh, this perk also has a secondary effect that can give it away early if survivors pay attention and it is that it shows you the auras of any survivor that walks by a dull totem. And this can be sometimes helpful at the start of the game when you're looking for someone. And even in chase, sometimes you will see the art of someone around a loop that has a dull totem. This, believe it or not, on its own is already decent. I've had many games where I play with random perks and I run Undying with nothing else. And I've won chases thanks to Undying. So this is a perk that on its own is already very, very, very decent. But then on top of that, it, defend the other, it defends the other hexes. So yeah, this perk is incredibly mean on killers and builds uh, around hexes. Um, and it just makes every other hex, including Devour and, and, and Blood Favor, which we talked about, just all that more powerful. So for that reason alone, it's just a really, really solid perk. And now the one that we've talked about so much, Hex Pentimento. Hex Pentimento is not a get down Mr. President. It's more like get back to life, Mr. President. Pentimento <laughs> is um, a perk that gives Killer the ability to summon back totems. So anytime a totem has been cleansed by a survivor, uh, whether it's a Hex or a Doll totem, this perk can, can reignite it into a Pentimento special totem. Um... And the more, the more totems you have, the more effects they have. If you have one totem, survivors do gens 30% slower, then they do 30% slower healing, then they recover on the ground 30% slower, then the gates take 30% slower, and then if you do all five of them, which would be a miracle, but I've done it once, then all of the, all of the totems get blocked and all of these effects are locked in. Now... You should never aim to go for the four or five or even three, honestly. You should never aim to do that. The really important part of Pentimento is the 30% gen slowdown. That and sometimes the second one for the healing. That is it. That is it. You don't need one, you don't need 20 Pentimento stacks. You just need one or two. Uh, and, and typically you have two so that then you'll have one for longer. So that is the thing. Doing gens 30% slower is 
absolutely brutal. It is a CIA level torture. It is awful. No one on this planet should do a gen for two minutes and still not be done. And that's what this basically is, two minute gens. It is awful, awful. Not to mention that if, ha if you have pop or other gens to kick, it will make the gens take even longer. So that is a heavy, heavy, heavy price to pay. Um, so how does this perk come to play? Number one, sometimes you play against survivors that, God bless their heart, do totems for inner healing or other survivor perks or even archives. And then this perk becomes an instant, instant pressure on the team, especially if the team is not coordinated and they don't really know what's going on and they don't know where the totem was done and they can't go and cleanse it. So if you have one Michaela uh, doing totems for clairvoyance or one Nancy doing totems for inner healing and then you go on and, and pentimento that, you destroy their team unless they get their act together. And the other thing that you're going to do is have other hexes, including Undying. So you can have Undying Devour and when they do it, bam, you relight it with Penti. Now, believe it or not, this might always be enough. If you're chasing totems more than you're chasing survivors and you have a build and a killer that is very slow paced, I've sometimes been in games where they have to, they, they do like four or five totems, but because I'm so slow on the hooks and the pressure, they get away with it. And eventually they, they manage to stall out the game and win. So you can't just go on a side quest to slow on the game and expect survivors to die by themselves. You still need to do everything else. But on some killers, uh, especially killers like Sadako, Onryo, who can teleport, killers that can keep the pressure on the totems or trap them or puke on them like Plague. All of this is so ridiculously strong. It is so powerful. Not to mention that the re reignited totems count towards other things. So, for example, if you have Thrill the Hunt, which will slow down totems, uh, slow down cleansing based on totems, re reigniting these totems counts as well and buffs those perks. So, yeah, very, very mean perk that single-handedly punishes a lot of otherwise good survivor builds and strategies. So, yeah, very, very mean one. Next up, we have Fear Monger, um, also known as Mindbreaker before it changed names. This perk is extremely easy to use, and it hits survivors on a multitude of fronts. It hits them on many levels. The first thing that it does is that it makes them exhausted for five seconds. Um, if survivors had a perk like Dead Heart, Spin Burst, Life, they cannot immediately use it. And as a killer, this gives you a lot of peace of mind. If there's a survivor injured on a gen and they're about to finish it and you're within lunging distance, you don't need to think, oh, they might run away or they might speed off. Or No, nah, you can just hit them. They don't have Dead Heart. They don't have Spin Burst. And that's really, really nice to know. Um, it also pauses any existing exhaustion. So if a survivor uses Spin Burst and now they have a 40 second exhaustion and they touch a gen, now it's frozen at 40 seconds. So this is a very mean perk to pair with other exhaustion forms or to punish uh, existing exhaustion from survivors. So that's something to keep in mind. And it also makes them blind. Uh, blind survivors do not uh, also for five seconds until they leave the gen. Um, this means that Fogwise gets countered pretty hardcore. Uh, Kindred gets countered pretty hardcore. Uh, Bond, um, not Streetwise, um, <laughs> Bond. Um, windows of Opportunity, lots of survivor perks that would otherwise be feeding information to the individual or sometimes the entire team if they're on comms, get completely stopped while a survivor is on a gen. And that's pretty nice. Now, another thing that is worth mentioning is that in the current meta, in the current patch, made for this is an extremely powerful perk. And this perk only works when you're not exhausted. So as you can imagine, anything that afflicts exhaustion, even if it's for a little bit, is a helpful thing against such a perk. And for that reason, uh, Mindbreaker, uh, sorry, Fearmonger is pretty high up. Now, one of the nicest things that this perk does is completely destroy solos. With solos, they don't see their teammates on the hook. They don't see the teammates that are not on the hook and could be going. They need to let go. Like, it robs them of a lot of information that is really, really mean. And it also makes it harder to know when a pain resonance is coming. As I explained earlier, when a survivor is hooked on a pain rest hook, if someone else is working on the gen, they will get hit by it, and if there's dead man switch, the gen gets blocked. Well, if you're blind, you cannot see the animation of the hook begin, so you cannot see it visually react and let go. So you have, if you have fearmonger and there's dead man switch and pain rest, which is a really nice triple combo, 
that messes with a lot of survivors and makes the DMS much more effective. So something to keep in mind and, and one of the easier, uh, simpler combos to run uh, with this perk. Really, really good stuff. Next up is Floods of Rage. Floods of Rage is also a Scorch Hook perk. Um, much like I said with Pay and Resonance, this has a minor downside, which is lock and RNG. On some maps, you have nice hooks in the middle, and some maps you get four white hooks on awful edges, and this perk is hard to use, and you only use it sometimes. Um, keep in mind, um, this perk only triggers when the survivor is removed from the hook by another survivor. So if a survivor has deliverance, they counter your devour hope and they counter this perk. And if the survivor uh, gets off the hook by pure by by sheer luck, this perk also doesn't trigger. But in any other situation where the survivor is rescued, which is most of the time, this perk triggers and it shows you the aura of all three other survivors, including the rescuer. So that is really useful. Seeing survivors anywhere, all the time. A few times per game, that's really, really good. Uh, this perk immediately shoots up in utility against killers that can hit through walls and can and can manifest themselves through walls. So uh, this on an artist is good. This on Pyramid Head is a bit weird because he uses cages, but it's still good. This on Nurse is unbelievably good, and you can pair it with Pain Resonance, which you were probably out of the using. So that information is really, really nice. It also lets you know if the person on the hook is healing the other the other other person if you have make your choice now you can find them um so yeah it's for the most part it's pretty good stuff pretty reliable uh information as long as the rng on the hooks isn't terrible and it can help you in chase as well the person that you're chasing if they're not as long as it's not immediately the person of the hook you will see their aura for a lengthy amount of time and even if you don't really immediately chase someone just just having an update where everyone is is a good thing because Keep in mind that many matches, um, they turn into a situation where you've hooked one survivor, you've hooked the same survivor, and now you hook someone else, and the gens are nearly done, and now you need to find that other survivor. You need to find the, let's say, the Meg, because she's dead on hook, and you are desperate, desperate to find Meg, and this perk can show you it. Keep in mind, if Meg runs distortion, this perk will not help you to find her. If Meg runs off the record for a long time, this perk will not help you find her. So this perk does have its holes. And that, I think, is maybe the saddest part of it. Otherwise, it would be a little bit higher, in my opinion. Next up, we have Agitation. When a survivor um, is on the ground and you pick them up, all killers move at a fixed speed. And this speed is, I believe, 92%. I believe it's 92%. If not, it's very close to 92%. So that's pretty bad. It's very, very slow. You move very, very slow. With Agitation, you move 18% faster. That is approximately a truck ton. It is a lot faster. It is so fast that survivors trying to take hits or going for body blocks will, uh, or going for a flashy save can very easily get caught up to. So this can let you hit survivors while you're carrying, which is very effective with Sedebus for Last, because it, it works while you carry. It's very effective with Force Penance, which will trigger. It's very effective with Starstruck, if they're stupid enough to get hit and insta down by it. And it's just effective with anything, uh, you know, related to, to carrying. So really, really, really good stuff. Um, and on top of this, on top of being faster, uh, watch out for survivors that could have um, breakout and stuff. You won't catch up to those. Um, on top of being faster, you also have a bigger terror radius. This bigger terror radius can sometimes uh, help you to inflict Starstruck and other terror radius related um, perks and, and maladies, including Chlorophobia uh, and a few others that are not really worth mentioning. But just so you know, it's mostly useful for Starstruck. So this is pretty good. Um, with Agitation, you can make it to hooks that are fast much quicker. You can make it to basement from across the map. You can make it to your to your Scorch hook and save quite a bit of time. You can make it to another hook after someone sabotages. You can take a hit and because you got there faster, still have time to hook. So it gives you a lot 
lot of flexibility, goes well with scorch hooks, goes well with basement builds, goes well with killers that want to make it to basement at any given time, such as hunters, for example. It just saves time in general, so it's a comfy perk. And as obviously you can imagine, it goes well with Starstruck and so on. So yeah, very, very solid perk. Uh, keep in mind that um, all killers move at the same speed, so it's not like it affects the slower or the faster killers. Uh, in particular, you might not like this perk as much on killers like Freddy, who doesn't have a terror radius for some people and can teleport. So killers that can teleport, maybe this perk is not as useful, but for most others, um, it is a very, very serviceable perk. Next, we have Franklin's Demise. Franklin's Demise makes it so that whenever you hit a Subaru with a basic attack, they drop their item. And if this item uh, still has charges left, it will begin to lose them. So a medkit that can only give you one heal now will give you 0.8 heals. And 0.8 heals might as well be zero sometimes. So this is really, really good. It is an amazing tool to eat up medkits and make them heal you less. Uh, though, you know, there is some counterplay. And if you are lucky enough to hit someone with a toolbox, you might be able to make them lose quite a bit of it. On other items like flashlights and so on, it is not quite as useful, but you would be surprised how many survivors are greedy little goblins, little hungry gremlins that want to get their item back ASAP. I've seen a lot of survivors um, waste time and risk injury or death by trying to get their, their, stupid, uh, their stupid flashlight back. This also is helpful on killers that were... This was helpful on killers that were countered by specific items, such as Hag or, or say, Nurse against Flashlights, but those things have been patched out, so it's no longer uh, that big of a deal. Um, so yeah, you basically will... Like, if you uh, play against multiple medkits, unfortunately, anti-healing perks, such as Leverage or Sloppy Butcher, might sometimes not be enough. And medkits used to be really, really strong, so this perk was really high up there. Luckily, now items are a little bit weaker, and some of the stronger items you can't even counter with this. So it's not as big of a deal, but it's still a really nice tool to overall hurt the efficiency of medkits and make it a little bit harder for people to use uh, flashies and so on against you. So that's not too bad. On some killers, you can trap the items or keep an eye on them to make things really, really nasty, such as Hag. Uh, but keep in mind that survivors that are smart will call out this perk and they will drop their item prematurely. They will leave it by a gen or they'll use it and then drop it so that they don't lose it upon hit. So it's a perk that has a bit of counterplay and sometimes, you know, you might, you might feel like, why the hell did I even equip this? But the fact that you can get rid of some really strong items uh, for the low, low price of one perk slot, it's not, it's not, it's not really too bad. Next up, we have Merciless Storm. This is one of the first perks that we've covered so far that is really not very good on its own or on a generic build, but it is a very effective niche perk in some high-level builds and also works pretty well if you're a beginner. If you're a beginner, I think this perk is awesome, and I think it's one of the reasons why Sadako had such a high kill rate. So... This perk affects each generator once. So there are seven generators, it can trigger up to seven times. When a generator is in the final 10% of its life, in the final 10% stretch, the perk triggers, and survivors get a constant barrage of skill checks. If there's multiple survivors, they will get through them quicker, but if any of them miss it, then it will trigger. So they get skill checks that they need to hit, pew, 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 and if they hit them, they do the gen fine. They don't hit any grades, so technically this is a slight, slight slowdown perk because it means that they don't get any great skill checks they can shave off a second, right? Um, so if they hit all the skill checks, which is relatively easy to do for experienced survivors, nothing happens. However, if they let go or if they get interrupted or if you push them off physically or with your power or whatever, then the gen gets blocked. If they miss the skill check, not only does it get blocked, it also loses 10%, which is a big deal. 10% and then it gets blocked for 20 seconds. That's pretty significant. Now, so how do we make this perk good? Number one, the doctor. The doctor has an effect that makes survivor skill checks go in reverse and appear at different parts of the screen. If survivors are in madness tier one, it happens a little bit. If they're in madness tier two, it happens a lot more, and if they're in minus tier 3, they can't do gen, so it doesn't happen at all. <laughs> but yeah, basically, if you keep survivors in minus 1 or 2, it is almost impossible to do this. If you have a nerving presence on top of that, 
Even other killers can make this really difficult. It is very, very, very difficult. I've tried it myself, and honestly, even with good FPS, it is super difficult to hit unnerving skill checks against average killers, let alone a doctor that makes the skill checks switch directions and, and places on your skin. So this is basically a massive, massive skill check to the average team that will buy you an extra 20 or, or 40 or 60 seconds per game very reliably. You can also run it on Artist, on Freddy, on other killers with Tinkerer that can interrupt the gens and yeah, they'll never be able to do a gen in your face with this perk. If you interrupt them, it just gets blocked and you have 20 seconds to maybe get a hook, do something in the meantime. So it's a bit like Deadlock that is even stronger if you apply the correct pressure and you have the right build for it. And for that reason, I think it's pretty damn high. Understanding, of course, that on the average killer, without that kind of pressure and that kind of specific build, it doesn't work so well. Next up is a plaything. Plaything is a hex that works different than most others. It doesn't start out on the map. Instead, every time you hook a survivor for the first time, that survivor creates their own hex by turning a dual totem into a lit orange hex totem. And as long as that totem is up, and only that survivor can do it, then that survivor is oblivious. Uh, what does this mean? It means that if you hook three survivors, those three survivors do not hear your terror radius. Now, if you're playing Freddy, they'll still hear your lullaby. If you're playing Huntress or Trickster, they'll still hear your lullaby. So it's not like you're completely stealthy. If you're playing a loud killer like Nemesis, they're, gonna, they're still going to hear your, foot, your feet stomping. So it's not a complete stealth, incredible package kit, but it's still pretty damn incredible. Having no terror radius on some of the scarier killers in the game, like Wesker, is a big deal. If you can manage to get enough hooks on people early to make this perk active on a couple people early, it will absolutely hamper and put a dampen on their efficiency. Sometimes the survivor will be looking for the totem to get rid of it, sometimes they will ignore it, but then they'll be a bit insecure in how they approach. Um, and if you give them blindness, they won't be able to see their own totem, which is normally highlighted to them. So yeah, there's a lot of ways you can... Oh, not to mention that if you have a certain... Like if they're doing their totem, they still don't hear your terror radius. So you can go to them and, and, and then interrupt them. So there's a lot of situations that this perk creates where you get very um, unfair, but very beneficial situations where you find a survivor and you just immediately hit them and they had no idea you were coming. So that's great. That's wonderful. Not to mention that if they do totems, you can then use Pentimental to reignite them or Retribution to see everyone. So yeah, there's quite a... Not to mention that sometimes survivors do the wrong totem and then they screw up. So there's a lot of situations when this perk is very, very mean. What is the problem? Well, there's two problems. Number one, if you, if you plan to get three or four hooks on different people early on, you might as well run Pop. You might as well run Pain Resonance. At that point, you're almost already winning the game if you have other perks, so why run this, right? So that's one. And the other is that sometimes people use this uh, external cheating software called Discord where they talk to their friends. So they might be like, oh, he has plaything. Oh, yeah, he's on me. He's on main building. Yeah, guys, do gens. Yeah, no, he's on me. I got adrenaline. Just finish the gen. Yeah, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Open the gate. Okay, we're all out. Sometimes survivors will simply not care about this perk and all your plans around it are going to be useless. So, keep that in mind, try it a little bit, if it seems like it works, keep it as part of your build. If you find out that it's not for you, take it out. Overall, decent bird. Next up is Bamboozle. This is another ultra-specific niche perk. Uh, maybe that's not fair. This is a perk that really shines on some killers, and that is not extremely necessary on others. If you put this perk on all of your killers, you're gonna realize that a lot of killers you, you just don't really need it on. If you have a survivor that is constantly humping a window and you're playing Deathslinger, you're just gonna shoot them and down them and you're gonna be fine. You don't need Bamboozle. But there are a few killers that get massively countered by windows and them removing one window in the vicinity makes their power so much stronger. Killers that come to mind that are really good with Bamboozle, the Cannibal, the Hailbilly, basically anybody with a chainsaw. It's also pretty decent on Myers. He already has a naturally faster vaulting animation, so 
It's it's even greater with this perk. It's also very decent on Trickster to counter Shack and other main building structures that would otherwise make it very difficult for you to use your knives around corners. And perhaps a few other killers here and there. So on those killers, this perk is pretty much the bread and butter and a staple of their builds. And for them, it's pretty good. Um, Needless to say, the 15% extra speed that you get is nice, but the main the main thing that this perk does is block... Uh, I didn't even express... I didn't even say what it does. Uh, the main thing that this perk does is it makes you vault a little bit faster, and it blocks the window after you vault it for a few seconds so that a swabber cannot repeatedly take it three times until it gets blocked. So this is pretty awesome. This is pretty great. It makes a few parts of some maps that would otherwise be like lengthy time wasters um, a very simple dawn and deal but do be careful. Sometimes with this perk, you run the per you run the risk of being a bit too predictable. Sometimes, if you run into a loop and you immediately vault the window, survivors are going to pay attention. They're going to notice it, and while you are busy vaulting windows, they're just going to run to the next one and use the other window, and then you're going to be there left looking like a fool. And sometimes. It's okay to just hit people with your M1 at a window instead of trying to block it. So just be be sure that you don't let this perk put you on autopilot. And then it's a good perk. And it's helpful on the killers that I mentioned. Moving on, we have Starstruck. Starstruck is an interesting perk that activates whenever you are carrying a survivor. Anyone within your terror radius will be affected by Starstruck permanently until they leave your turret radius or you let the person on the hook or on the ground. So it works forever within your turret radius until you no longer carry, and then it lasts an extra 30 seconds. So for 30 seconds, they are affected by this perk, and they become exposed. Now, this is not a perk that you want to run on Trickster or any other 110 killer. You want to run this on killers that are good at catching up, and that hit with basic attacks. So this used to be really good at Nurse until she was changed. And right now I would say this is a, a staple of um, killers like Deathslinger. Who are very good at catching up or even spearing you from afar. It's decent on killers like Wesker who has a big terror radius. But I think it's a bit of a trap because you should be using your power rather than this. Um, I also recommend it on Trapper or Hag. It can create very chaotic situations where no one can take hits. On Hag in particular, if you apply it to a few people and then chase them in the right direction, they might end up stepping on a trap that you previously set up and give you massive, massive snowball potential. So yeah, you put it on a killer. You can also run it with agitation so that your terrorist is bigger and it uh, affects more people. And obviously, this is a perk that you don't want to run with Tinkerer or Plaything or some other perk that that would make survivors not hear your terror radio. So it does have a bit of anti-synergy. So uh, that being said, how strong is it? Fairly strong, but also quite predictable. And it does have the problem that it makes survivors stealth around you. And it might, sh it might be uh, a bit counterproductive. Many times I hook a survivor. I look around myself. I see no one. I see no one. All the gens around me are done. If I go too far away, maybe I don't know what I'll find. So... It's a very awkward moment where everyone waits for 30 seconds until the perk effect has worn off. Um, so yeah, you're, you're basically in a big rush to down someone after the 30 second as soon as you hook with this. It's not bad, it's not bad, just a little bit risky, mind it. Uh, next is Rancor. This perk does a lot of things. First is a negative. Whenever a generator gets done, the obsession will see your aura. For the most part, unless they are running Dark Sense, they're going to quickly figure out what is going on. They're going to think, wait a minute, why am I seeing Zara? Oh, okay, he's got Rancor. And if it's a team, then everyone will know about it. Even if the obsession keeps switching around, they're going to find out. Um, one nice thing, though, is that if you're undetectable, let's say you're playing Wraith, they won't notice it. And it will only be until the end, where the last gen gets done, that they'll see, oops, exposed by Rancor. So, yeah. Um, the, the obsession sees your, loca your location at any given time. Keep that in mind. It's very easy to forget. Uh, whenever gens are done, this perk also pings the location of every survivor. It's not an aura, but it's like a uh, like a scream location. This is useful 
This is very, very useful. On killers that benefit from knowing where everybody is, using this information is helpful. Say you're doing plague and you want to know whether you should cleanse, you should uh, pick up from a, pla uh, from a plague fountain that someone's cleansed on or something like that. That little bit of information is really, really helpful. Um, and it will happen every time a gen gets done. But the big, big kicker is that at the end of the game, if you find the obsession, they will be permanently exposed, so even if they're healthy, you will instant on them, and once they're instant out, you can moi them on the spot. Now, let's talk about some advantages that this provides. First of all, the obsession is going to be really, really scary in the end game. They're probably not going to open gates in front of you. Needless to say, they're not going to come and take hits for their teammates or anything like that. Um, if they need multiple people for a rescue, they won't be able to. So if you have a person on the hook and you want to defend that, the, the obsession can't come and risk it. And that's really, really... Um, it can be, it can go both ways. It, it might cheat you of another kill, but in my opinion, it's something to consider. And keep in mind, killers have at least two or three ways to create a new obsessions. So if you're a little bit crafty and 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 evil, you can use perks like uh, Nemesis, which is more or less avoidable, furtive chase, not to forget about it, and mostly uh, the perk. Uh, game of foot to create a new obsession and then the new obsession can be insta down and insta killed so that is kind of a big deal that is a big deal this perk rancor used with game of foot can result in very wild end games where anyone can become the obsession and no one is safe even if you haven't been hooked at all so um, this perk is mean, it can be used in end game with some evil builds it gives you a little bit of information Overall, it's not the best at anything, but it is a pretty good second chance perk for the end game. And if you're evil enough, you can have it. You could also run it with Bitter Murmur, which shows you the aura of everyone in the end game. And that could throw uh, the obsession off. They might be hiding in basement or doing something stupid and you'll see their aura. So yeah, it really, uh, not to mention also it counters adrenaline and insta heals uh, of any kind. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty mean perk. You just have to understand its weaknesses. The fact that it's telegraphed and also, you know, don't expect the other side to be stupid. They'll try to play around it. Next up is Barbecue. This perk used to give you extra blood points and was the most popular perk in the game. Now it doesn't do that anymore. Uh, it's still not a bad perk. Whenever you hook a survivor, uh, any other survivor that is further than 40 meters away from you will be revealed to you for four seconds. That's it. It's not incredible. It's not the biggest deal in the world. If you're playing a slow killer that is to set up like Hug or Trapper, seeing someone fraud away, I mean, it's not the most actionable piece of information ever. It's not the biggest deal, but it's still not too bad. On the average killer, it's okay. It tells you what to do and what gens are being worked on. Uh, keep in mind, survivors that hide behind gen auras are hard to see. Survivors inside lockers are invisible. Survivors with distortion or off the record won't be picked up. These, in my opinion, are the biggest uh problems with barbecue sometimes you will hook a survivor and see one person and be like wow barbecue value yeah this is so good and then you don't see the other one or two people that are actually healing or something but they have off the record so you don't see them so it does have its holes and its gaps but it is pretty good uh, it particularly shines on killers that have mobility or teleport if you see someone healing across the map and then you teleport to them as a dredge or a sadako or appear next to them in three seconds with one of the fast uh, killer powers like Hailbilly, um, good add-on spirit, Bly with any add-ons really, like this is good stuff, it's really really good stuff, it lets you ping pong between chases and waste time, um, and waste a minimum amount of time between chases which is good, so for that reason, because it helps you stay in the flow, it is a decent perk, but one that needs to be used on characters that can take advantage of it. Next up is Thwack. Thwack is a bit like barbecue, but you activate it whenever you want. It triggers every, or rather, it activates every time you hook someone, and then it stays on until you use it or if you use it. Um, and the way to activate it to get its effect is to break a pallet or a breakable wall. In some maps, you don't have a lot of breakable walls, and this perk is a bit more meh. But there are also a lot of maps that have a lot of breakable walls around the middle, and then this perk becomes really interesting. The nice thing about this, compared to barbecue, is that you can trigger it on a time where it's more beneficial to you. You get into a chase, and someone drops a pallet, you can break the pallet and see the survivor. They also scream, 
which is kind of nice. Because it means that even if they have distortion, you will still find them. They for for a survivor to fully counter this perk and fully dodge this perk and stealth underneath it, they would need to run Calm Spirit and Distortion or off the record, which is or Soul Survivor, which is a uh, that's never gonna happen. So this perk might help you hear a, a person that was hiding next to you that would otherwise be not found. So that's really really nice. Uh, if no one screams or no one shows their aura, that means that no one's there. So you can also down a survivor, hook them, break a breakable wall, and if no one screams, that's good. It means no one's there, and you can go far away. So it can also give you negative information so that you know to not waste your time and go elsewhere. Um, you can use it a bit in chase. You can use it while you're camping. This is very effective, by the way. Sometimes you can selectively leave some pallets and walls behind. Say you're playing Nemesis, who's very good at breaking pallets from a bit of a distance, you can leave a break of a wall or a pallet somewhere, and then you camp someone, and when they're about to hit stage two, you can break a pallet with your tentacle, and if no one screams, that means they're not coming. If someone screams, you can now go for that person. Um, this works really well as well if survivors are trying to do totems, so it works really well to defend totems. It works really well to interrupt them from doing boxes. It's not a terror radius based perk, so it can work even on stealth killers and really mess with survivors. So it's really, really nice. The thing is, it doesn't help you in your first chase. It doesn't help you in super long sustained games where you don't get enough hooks. Uh, but it's nice. It's nice. The range, I believe, um, let me let me double check so I don't tell you. The range, I believe, is pretty significant. It is 32 meters. It's basically your entire terror radius for the average killer. Uh, that means that you can also use it in endgame. While survivors are looking for the hatch or you're trying to find out that one survivor that might be hiding, you can break the occasional pallet or leftover break of a wall to find them. And it's not too bad. It's really not too bad. Some killers just don't have that time to break those pallets. And some killers just have other perks that are a bit more reliable. But this one is a nice filler one and worth giving a shot if you never have. All right. Next up, Enduring. Uh, enduring cuts the time where you become stunned by a pallet by 50%. It makes you recover twice as fast. Now, let's talk about some of the things that uh, Enduring doesn't help you with. If you get stunned by other things, like Blast Mine, the size of Strike, Head On, um, that doesn't work. If you get Pallet Rescued, if a survivor that you're carrying gets rescued by a Pallet, that is technically not a Pallet stun, so it also doesn't work. Um, there's also a killer called the Singularity that has a overclock where he eviscerates a pallet and that doesn't count as stun, so it doesn't work. Um, but other than that, any normal pallet stun, it works and you recover faster. So there's a few things you can do with this faster recovery. The first and most simple one, you can break the pallet sooner and then catch up sooner and lose less distance. That's not too bad. Another thing for some characters is that you can immediately queue up an attack. So if you get stunned as a Pyramid Head or as a Slinger, you probably shouldn't, but you know you can sometimes ready up an attack and hit them over the pallet before they get away. So that's something that can happen as well. So many. This is a very common occurrence. Sometimes when there's a bit of laggy connection issues, a survivor dropping a pallet will end up on the same side of the pallet as you. And with Enduring you will be able to hit them or grab them if they were out of the injured immediately. Without enduring, this cannot happen. If you get stunned and the survivor stuns you from the same side as you or you get teleported to their side, without enduring, they would just vault to the other side and you would be fine. But with enduring, that is gone. You can immediately grab them or hit them. There are also a variety of techs that survivors can do to you on a pallet, and I know that some of them might seem pointless, but there are all, there are some legitimate situations where a survivor can stun you. If they're cornered against the edge of the map and they have life, they can vault into you and then run into the map, and they're, they're not cornered and zoned out. But if you have Enduring, they can do that. If they stun you from the other side and vault into you, you're going to hit them or grab them right away. Um, there are also many situations where, with a bit of lag, you might swing at a survivor, hit them, and then immediately they stun you on the same side and get grabbed. So, this is really, really good stuff. I think Enduring is nice on killers that need to play around pallets with their power quite often. I personally really like it with Legion. Many survivors try to, to, to end your frenzy with Legion, and then you can just 
not really give an F and sometimes even get free downs. So it's it's quite comfortable. Just make sure that if you have enduring, you're not a stupid um, predictable killer. And sometimes sometimes it's better not to take the 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 enduring stun. But for the most part, this completely eliminates any fear of 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 um of you being stunned and losing the survivor. It can also be paired with a Spirit Fury, which is a perk that we'll cover in a minute. And it will make you so that when whenever you get stunned by the pallet and you break it and you activate Spirit Fury, you will essentially be a killing machine. Again, watch out. If survivors know that you have this perk or this combo of perks, they will typically pre-drop the pallets. And if you go against survivors that have pre-drop pallets, they just drop them super early. Enduring does literally nothing. So, it drops off a little bit in utility, that's why you need to run this on a killer, where doing that is a little bit harder, such as Legion, as I said. That's my personal favorite Enduring user, but maybe you have your own. Uh, moving on, we arrive at Hex Crowd Control. This is a Hex that starts out lit up at the start of the match. It can be cleansed immediately if you're a bit unlucky, but if you really care about this perk, you could also run it with some other protective Hexes to keep it up a bit longer. Uh, this perk is really, really nice. Any time a survivor vaults a window, fast or medium, basically making a noise, the window blocks itself. Unlike Bamboozle, you can actually have this on multiple windows. So if you have a survivor that vaults a window and then vaults another, both of them will be blocked and they will have to find something else. This is not something that most killers need very dramatically, but it does have its moments. You can put this on Plague to really limit the amount of ways survivors can play around your red puke. You can put this on chainsaw killers. You can put this on a variety of killers and make survivors do a lot of mistakes. Now, the nicest, absolute nicest thing of this perk by far is the way it works on teams. So it's something that you, you, running this perk with distortion might be a good idea. Say that you um, are on the game, Gideon Midplant, and you're in, one, in that one room where there's a big drop and survivors go from it. If survivors don't know about this perk or they're a bit stupid, one of them will take the window and then the window gets blocked for the second guy. And then you can insta down them or stalk them or use your chenzo or whatever. And they have nowhere to go. Same with Shaq. If you hook someone in basement and someone takes the window, then the other person cannot take it. So survivors can sandbag each other and get in the way of each other with this perk. The one way survivors have to counter this perk other than cleansing the totem is to slow vault. If a survivor slow vaults the window, this perk doesn't trigger, and that's a big counter. Um, so yeah, that's something they can do if they are aware, but when survivors panic, most of the time they're not, and that results in this perk being decent. Should you run this perk over Bamboozle on some of the killers that need Bamboozle kind of badly? Eh, hard to say, probably not. That's why maybe it has a bit of a niche that doesn't really, that gets filled by other perks better, but I still overall quite enjoy it. Next up, we have Eruption, and let me tell you right now, I think I've changed my mind on this. Uh, it's gonna be one of the few perks I say this about, but I think Eruption could honestly be a full line higher. It could be around agitation levels of strong. This perk is still really, really good. Now, this used to be by far one of the strongest perks and easily the most annoying perk in the game. Uh, go watch my older tier list and stuff if you wanna know more about it. Um, but it's still, Really, really good. Whenever you kick a generator, that generator gets afflicted, gets trapped by eruption. And later on, you can do this to multiple gens, by the way. And if you down a survivor, those gens that you've kicked will activate and they will lose minus 10%. If any survivor was working on this gen, their aura will be revealed to you for 10 seconds. The aura revealing part of the survivor, eh, that's not a big deal. Typically, you already know that they're working on it or that they're not. But the 10% is pretty good. And it can be done on gens that are nothing. You could go to a gen that's at 1%, kick it, and then later on, if you're downing someone and that gen is now at 30, boom, it goes back to 20. So this is not a perk that most killers have the luxury to apply. This is not a perk for Trapper. It's not a perk for, for characters that very slowly need to set up. The, the, those killers typically suffer from this. But the killers that are fast-paced, the killers that are already applying perks um, 
such as nowhere to hide, eruption, I'm thinking Wraith, I'm thinking Nurse. These skillers massively benefit from this, especially a nurse that could read your aura from eruption, that could down someone and then come right at you and see your exact location. This perk is really, really scary. So if you have a build that's geared towards that kind of playstyle, you will find that this perk is actually pretty nutty and also works pretty well still in defending your final three gen. So overall, it's a pretty decent perk. You just need a build around it. Keep in mind that if you keep if you kick a gen and then that gen gets ignored, the perk does nothing. If that gen gets done before you down someone, the perk does nothing. But unlike Jolt, this is not a perk that triggers on basic attacks. It works on any down. So if a survivor goes into a locker, if you hit them with your hatchet, if you hit you with your with your basic attack, it all works. So that's a nice thing about it. And now we move on to machine learning. Machine learning is a bit of a strange perk. It's a bit like Eruption in that you need to kick a generator, but it works after kicking gens twice. So basically, the first gen kick is the, the warm-up. Let's just call it the warm-up. So you kick a gen, and the perk is like half active. Now, after that, the next gen you kick, or the same gen, if you can, after they touch it, will be trapped. So kick a gen, let's say gen A, then gen kick gen B then gem B will be trapped, and you'll hear a distinct noise. When that trap gen gets completed, for the next 30 seconds, you will be undetectable, which is a big deal for that long, and 10% faster. Get a load of this. If you kick a gen, and they complete the gen, 30 seconds off, undetectable, and plus 10% movement speed. The 10% movement speed is very oppressive on most killers that can, I would say on almost any killer. It's a really, really, really good thing. Maybe a hag that teleports doesn't need it. Maybe a nurse that moves at the speed of light doesn't need it. Maybe a slinger that shoots you anyway doesn't need it. But for almost every other killer, this is really good stuff. Uh, theoretically, since there are five gens that need to be completed, if you are a mastermind, you could get this perk to trigger four times, but it only stays active on the last gen that you kicked while it's on. So, from my experience, you're gonna get this perk to trigger two, maybe three times, maybe one time if you're not very lucky. That's not too bad, even that one time it could be a bit of value. Um, but... This is a perk that you cannot... It, it, earlier on, I talked about perks like Corrupt or Deadlock that you just put on and kind of forget. This is not a perk you can forget about. This is a perk that you need to actively have a, a, a genius level of assessment of what's going on. You need to be like, okay, they're doing that gen. I'm going to kick that gen, but then I'm going to kick that other gen. But that other gen, I'm going to let them finish that, but I'm not I'm not going to let them finish this other gen, but I'm not going to kick it either, so it does not. You need to really, really thread the needle of all of these things that are inter interlaced and, and, and linked together and figure out how in the world you're going to kick a gen, but simultaneously not have, and, and have that gen be completed, but not have another gen get completed that you're not going to kick, because if you kick the other gen, then the perk switches. So, it's kind of tricky. It's really, really tricky. But, if you are that kind of guy, if you are that kind of person, a guy or gal, that wants to manipulate survivors and make them do that, getting the 30 seconds is pretty good. Uh, I need to say that this perk right now is bugged. If you are in the endgame and any of the three gens that you kicked are, are completed, it doesn't matter. There's like a bug that makes all of them get completed at once. So this perk will always trigger. I'm going to assume that this perk is not bugged for the sake of my discussion. Right now it's a little bit stronger, so maybe it should be a bit higher. But assuming that they correct that bug, then yeah, this perk is a little bit hard to use, but gives you a very significant boost. Uh, 30 seconds in the end game where you are 10% faster, maybe have no it, and 30 seconds of undetectable, it's, it's pretty wild. So you cannot really sleep on that. And it pretty much um, destroys any survivor movement speed perks that they might have for a small duration. So yeah, the effect is big enough that if you're willing to go through the hoops and loops, the perk is sometimes worth bringing. Uh, definitely if you run other gen kick perks, this becomes a bit more, it sweetens the deal a little bit. Next up is one of my favorite perks in the game, even though it's not the strongest. It's called Darkness Revealed. This perk works whenever you open a locker. It uses every other locker in the game as a sonar, and it shows you the aura of people around them. Now, uh, killers that reload at lockers, such as Huntress and Trickster, and that's it, 
they will be able to reload their power while getting info from this perk simultaneously. So for them, this perk is really, really sweet. And also, obviously, if you see the auto of someone in the distance, you can immediately use it to line up a hatchet or something like that. So I really, really like this perk on these killers. I also think it's really useful on Dredge, because being able to see people around lockers in the early and mid game can sometimes show you survivors that are about to go into a locker and get grabbed. And that happened to me today, <laughs> if you can believe that. So yeah, that's pretty fun. Uh, for every other killer, it's not that big of a deal. There's a lot of maps that have no lockers nowhere, and then this perk really, really hurts. I personally like to run it on a few select killers, and that's it. It's not a super universal perk, but it is more useful than you, you, than you, than you would believe. And on killers that can use... Uh, or, or close the gap quickly with this perk. It's really not. It's really not bad at all. Uh, moving on, we have bitter murmur. Whenever a generator gets completed, the orders of people around the generator. Typically, it's only the people completing it, but sometimes it can also catch people in the vicinity. Are shown to you for five seconds. This isn't amazing. Many times when a gen gets completed, survivors stand behind it while they heal or they run in a bit of an awkward angle and the generator bubble hides much of the aura that you would otherwise see. But the five seconds are still nice. They give you an idea of where they're going. Sometimes you can try to line up a shot with hunters and that's a good idea. Or you can just see where they're going and use that information for later. Uh, if you're a Ghostface, yes, you might want to go and try to go for a, f for, for a stock. Uh, if you see them start to heal, you might try to go interrupt them. But you can, you can also just see where they're headed and remember that for future chases and, and, the, f and the next few minutes of your match. And just, just have that information as part of your overall um, insight as to what you're going to do next. The nicer part about Meter Murmur is what happens when the 5th gen gets completed. When the 5th gen gets completed, not when you close the hatch, that would be a bit strong, um, the orders of all of the survivors are shown to you for 10 whole seconds. A bit more if you have Lethal Pursuer, of course. So that's not bad at all. If you have a survivor on the hook, or one out of the dead, you can already get an idea of where the other ones are, whether or not they're going for a heal, whether they're gonna touch the gates anytime soon, blah, 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 blah. You can have a quick glance and gather all of that. And if you're a killer that can do quickly destroy survivors in the end game, uh, nurse someone with no it, that auto beating is incredibly, incredibly good. And sometimes unexpected by the survivors who might be hiding around the tree thinking that you have no idea they're there. So this perks, biggest uh, asset is the fact that it complements all of these strong perks such as Know It, which we talked about earlier, Rancor, which can help you find the obsession unless they go into a locker, and a few other perks like that. So for that reason, it is a serviceable common perk that every killer has access to and one of the ones that I would run if I didn't have any teachables. Next up is Play With Your Food, a very complex perk that I'm going to take a little break before I talk about. Okay, apologies for that. So, Play With Your Food is a perk that triggers when you enter Chase with the Obsession and then lose the Chase. Now, entering Chase is a bit of a complex mechanic. Typically, what needs to happen is that you look at the Obsession, that the Obsession runs, typically, and that this happens within a certain distance. So, it might be a bit annoying for you to half chase the obsession and sometimes it doesn't happen. So, it's something that you'll become used to when you practice using this perk. Um, some characters lose chase immediately upon doing certain actions. Uh, most notably, the Wraith can immediately lose a chase by cloaking. Myers can also lose a chase by staring at people and stalking. So certain characters can lose chase on command, which is really, really useful to get stacks quickly. For the rest, what you'll want to do is chase the survivor and then immediately look back and stay away, and that will end the chase as soon as possible. Uh, sometimes this perk has been visually bugged, but either whether it's bugged or not, you have a bit of a cooldown so that you cannot enter chase, lose chase, enter chase, lose chase, enter chase, lose chase. There is, a, I think, a 15-second buffer so that you cannot spam it. So you will need to find the obsession on and off, maybe chase them a few times on and off for this perk to work. Using Discordant is a great way to often find the obsession or paying a lot of attention with Lethal Pursuer. So it's something that you can, you can use other perks to try to keep an eye on the obsession. You can also run Nemesis 
to create an obsession on command, which can be cute on some builds. So, uh, what happens when you leave the chase with the obsession? You gain one token, you can do it up to three times, and each of these tokens gives you 5% movement speed. Mind you, uh, confirmed by the developers, this is not a 5% flat, it is 5% of your total movement speed. That means that it is 5% of 110 or 150, and so it's a little bit more than 5%. It is quite noticeable. Anytime you attack, you will lose a stack. And this also applies to most, not all of them, but most secondary attacks. So for example, Pinhead using a chain will count as an attack. Um, so what is the deal? What do you want to do with this perk? What you want to do with this perk is occasionally use uh, the obsession to get a speed boost to help you in the next chase, and sometimes go a little bit out of your way to get one or two stacks for the next couple chases. Ideally, this is a perk that you run on killers that insta-down or that already get everybody injured and then quickly down one by one. You do not want this perk on a killer that will be attacking several times because then you will lose it. So a good example of a killer that you don't want to run this perk on is Trickster. With Trickster, every time you throw a knife, you lose a stack. And the speed that you gain from it is insignificant if you're going to lose it in three knives. Same with Huntress. Uh, then again, you could run this perk on a killer like Cannibal with an insta down. And then if you have three stacks, you can get three saws off. However, if you use the charges, you, you lose them quicker. So what are the best users of this perk? In my opinion, a, a heavy tier three Myers can be really good. Legion, I think is amazing. With Legion, you can get everybody injured. At some point, find the obsession with your killer instinct power. And once everyone's injured, now you get that 5%. And the nice thing about the extra 5% is that it messes with survivors. And obviously, uh, beginner survivors that don't run very efficiently, you're going to catch up to them very quickly. But this perk really messes with survivors that are good. Good survivors understand what they can get away with, and they run loops really tight. And if they see you a little bit further than you need to be, they will go for that extra loop. And with the spur, you're going to eat those two hours for breakfast, and it is deeply, deeply satisfying. If you're smart about picking the killer and using it relatively well, most survivor teams that are not competitive teams don't really mind the obsession. Sometimes even the obsession will be a bit stupid and come and take hits or come and give you free stacks. So when that happens, you will be doing very, very fine. On a few select killers, I think this perk is decent. However, the fact that you lose stacks even for missed attacks, the fact that it doesn't work on certain killers, the fact that survivors uh, might uh, endure attacks with off the record, dead hard, made for this, um, the fact that they can have several lives does make this perk a little bit less appealing and a little bit more risky. So study it, use it on the killers that it makes sense on, and it's a decent perk. Uh, next up is Surveillance. Now, this perk does two things, and I'm going to talk about the second one first because I feel like everyone forgets about it. The, the, the second thing that this perk does is to make generator repair sounds a bit louder. When survivors are working on a generator, there are two sounds that happen. The first is the ones from the generator themselves. <laughs> that they, they get lo uh, louder and louder as the generator nears completion. And the other one are the repair-specific sounds. If they are on a side of the gen, you'll hear the clink, clank, clink, clank from the levers. And if they're on the side, from the front or the back, you will hear the, pss, 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 the little snap um, electricity sound from the wires. With this perk, you will hear these sounds from further. And sometimes you will get so close that you'll be able to distinctly hear both of them. So you can sometimes tell that there's two survivors working on gen because you hear it so clearly. Many survivors work on a gen until they hear you close enough and then they get out and they expect you not to know they're there. But with this perk, you're going to hear them from very far. And that is a very nice thing. That can sometimes mean the difference of you finding a person that you want or losing a survivor or finding them on the spot. So that part of this perk is very underrated and worth mentioning. Wouldn't be worth a perk slot on its own, but it's it's really, really nice. The other thing that this perk does is it colors gens based on their state. If a generator is regressing, 
no matter how, whether it's from ruin, jolt, or because you kicked it, it will turn white. It will remain white until it reaches zero, and then it goes red, or until someone touches it, and then it will glow golden or yellow for a little bit, and then go back to red. So, this is essentially a really nice way to know which gens are regressing and when someone has gotten back to them. Uh, it pairs, I mean, on its own, it's a decent amount of information, I suppose. Nowhere to hide is much, much better. But the nice thing about this is that it triggers from a distance with Ruin, with Jolt, even with Pain Resonance. And that's amazing. That means that you can have Ruin at the start of the game, and if someone leaves a gen, it will turn it will turn white and you'll know exactly where they are. So that is a really nice track and perk. Is it better than other track and perks that we've discussed already? Not always, but it's also a little bit hard to counter. It's not as easy to counter by distortion uh, so, uh, like barbecue is. So it is, a, it is a nice perk that goes well in quite a few builds that you should definitely try if you haven't given it um, your time yet. Next is Infectious Fright, one of the simplest perks in the game. Whenever a survivor is downed by you or by any means, really, this is a bit of a funny one. If a survivor downs themselves by a zombie or by a trap, this perk also triggers. So whenever a survivor goes down, typically by your hand, but also by any other way, anyone within your terror radius will scream. So what this typically translates to is that you down someone and... The only perk that can counter this is Calm Spirit. Calm Spirit is extremely unpopular at the time. So basically, <laughs> this is guaranteed to work, pretty much. Whenever you down someone, if there is someone in the vicinity, they're going to scream. And this can help you chain multiple hits together on aggressive killers like Oni. That's why it's a popular perk on him. And it can also help you just be aware of what's coming to, pre to prevent... Um, and predict potential pallet saves, flashlight saves. This is a great perk if you are afraid of pallet saves and, and flashy saves because, you know, anyone following you and trying to be sneaky might find themselves in, in a bad spot. Most killers would be well advised to be very careful when they slug and leave people on the ground. Right now, the combo of Unbreakable and Made for This and just made for this in general, makes it very, very risky to leave people on the ground because people could be com could be coming and picking them up and not even go down afterwards. So I would say, watch out. Don't leave people on the ground too much. You're now very incentivized more so than before to hook people. Um, but if you're a killer that is very good at doing that already, this perk is great. Subabras that scream also interrupt certain actions. So if you have a big terror radius, like say Wesker, and you down someone, you will make people scream 40 meters around you and that will interrupt things like totems. If you're playing the pig, she can also make people interrupt their box searches. And if you have a box search that's like 14 or 16 seconds and you're like almost at the end and then you get interrupted, that is a massive waste of time. Same with a totem with Thrill the Hunt, for example. We've made some builds on that if you wanna check them out. So yeah, that scream can be useful. Ultimately, though, it might be a bit redundant on some builds. Sometimes you need to care more about generators than about immediately nearby survivors, and this perk can lull you into a false sense of confidence that could easily backfire. So as long as you are aware of that, it is a decent perk. Just one that doesn't really... It doesn't really stop survivors from doing anything. It just tells you that they're there. So it's not like this perk is suddenly going to make them cower in their boots or make the gems go slow or anything like that. So yeah, uh, whenever a survivor on the ground gets hit by this perk, they also scream and it interrupts their, their healing for like a second until they press the button again. So it's also a nice perk for, for slugging for that reason. But yeah, do be careful. Awaken Awareness is an extremely simple perk. Whenever you pick up a survivor, anyone within 20 meters of you is revealed to you and you will see their aura. It's a very quiet perk that unless they have distortion or some other perk like that that can give it away, will not really inform the survivor that you have it. And as such, you might sometimes get very sneaky um, ambushes on survivors that thought were uh, outsmarting you. Say you carry a survivor, you have starstruck, that you see someone run behind the bush, guess what? You go there, you hit them, now they're down. This is particularly useful on killers that already naturally um, insta-down, 
because they don't have to, they don't have the, the the fear factor of survivors running away from you and trying to outtime Starstruck. You will have many times survivors going into lockers or doing really stupid things. Even good survivors will fall for this. So it's a perk that you put on, and as you navigate, you gather useful information, and it's quite nice. You can also use it with Noid. At the end of the game, you can carry someone, leave them, go to Noid, and see if someone's doing your totem. A lot of lots of little synergies here and there. However, do be warned that survivors have distortion and off the record and thus can sometimes dodge um, um, out of reading. And keep also in mind that you don't... Um, sorry, <laughs> what was I talking about? You don't always cover enough distance. If a survivor gets, uh, gets picked up and you have a terror radius of 32 meters and then have agitation and it's 40 meters so robbers are just going to run away and this perk is not going to be useful uh, and it also suffers a little bit this is what i was going to say of the big map syndrome if you're in mid -witch, everything is really close together you're very likely to see people through different floors and stuff if you are on cowshed or another equally large map there is such a high chance that survivors are just splitting up anyway and in that situation this perk is going to feel no gaps of knowledge at all. It's not going to tell you anything you don't know already. You know that everyone else is splitting up doing jumps far away from you at any given time. So it does have its own risk in those maps. It might sometimes be a little bit underwhelming. Otherwise, a decent perk that is most, more often than not worth the perk slot. Next up. Hold up. Uh, next up, Dragon's Grip. This is a very awkward perk that has like three different built-in timers. Essentially, when you kick a gen, that gen is trapped for 30 seconds. If a survivor doesn't touch it, 30 seconds will pass, and then the perk goes on cooldown for 80 seconds, which is a big deal because that's a long time. If a survivor does touch it, then that particular survivor will be exposed for a whole minute. A whole 60 seconds. And then after that, the perk goes on cooldown for 80 seconds, and then it triggers again. So, right off the bat, this, this is already a little bit questionable. Um, it only lasts 30 seconds, which is not a big time. It only applies um, an expose that might not actually do anything. What if the survivor is out of the injured, right? And then there's 80 seconds, whether it works or it doesn't. So, it's a long, long, long time. And in the average DVD match you're going to use this perk twice if you're lucky, and then it's gone. However, here's the thing. There are some situations where survivors not touching a gen for 30 seconds is very, very nice. If you have other perks to make um, the gen kick powerful, such as Eruption, Nowhere to Hide, Calibri, not so much, it's a bit weak, Overcharge to some degree, then these perk, this perk has a bit more meaning. If they don't touch the gem for 30 seconds, then the other perks have time to trigger and do their own thing. And if they do, you might just have the chance to insta down the survivor. Even if the survivor is already injured, that means that for the next 60 seconds, they can't really heal because they would still go down. So it's really not that bad, especially if you play a character that is very good at stalling. There will be many situations where certain killers in particular are good at holding three gens or a couple of gens left. Um, and in these situations, the longer time doesn't matter. You just kick gens, the fan, kick gens, the fan, kick gens, the fan, until they make a mistake and then BAM! Then you get them. You might also sometimes get very lucky if you run discordance and find groups of survivors. You can kick this gen, pretend to go for one, then go back, hit the other. And with stealth killers like Sadical, this can lead to some very early downs. And even if it's if that's all the perk does, that's not too bad. Because of these situations on these specific killers with these things in mind, I think this perk has a little bit of potential and is a little bit higher than I would otherwise place it. The cooldowns make it a little bit too awkward for other killers. And keep in mind that the expose only works on killers that hit with their basic attack. You don't want to put this on hunters, for example. So, yeah, that's what the perk does. <laughs> Next is Ruin. Ruin is a regular hex perk that starts at the start of the game. It means it can be cleansed right away if you're unlucky. And also, it is one of the only perks that disables itself whenever any survivor has died. So if you kill one survivor by any means at all, the perk just, it just completely stops 
existing and all of its effects are paused. So what does it do? Why, why, what makes this perk so dangerous, huh? This perk, as long as it's active, makes every generator regress on its own. Now, the speed at which it regresses is very, very slow. It's only a little bit faster. Uh, actually, um, isn't it exactly 100%? Let me, let me double check. I'm not. Yes, <laughs> it is exactly. Um, it is exactly 100% of regression like just just think of it this, this way okay essentially ruin regresses four times as slow as a survivor makes the gen uh go um on their own so in order to undo one second of repairs because the normal regression would be 400 in 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 reverse uh ruin is only doing a fourth of that it's only doing uh, 0 0.25 charges per second. That means that in order to undo one second of repairs, you need to let the gen be alone for um, four seconds. Now, this sounds pretty awful. And in most scenarios, I agree it is. You, like, a survivor can leave a gen, do a heal, come back. The gen's basically the same. However, however, this doesn't get in the way of other perks. So if you have a gen that's 50% and then survivors leave it, okay, now it's 49, now it's 48, now you hit someone with jolt, now it's 40, now it's 39. So it can actually stack quite nicely with other regression perks. You can even put it on with deadlock, and when the gen is blocked, it will stay at 40%, and if survivors leave it, then it will go to 39, 38. So it can, it can stack nicely with other hexes. And this is a perk that you often bring with Sloppy Butcher or some other anti-healing, some other nasty perk or killer um, or, or, or killer power that makes survivors busy. There are a lot of killer powers that keep survivors off gens, um, for example, Pinhead's Box, and whenever those are in, in play and you pressure survivors properly, that 100% regression on Ruin is actually fairly decent. And of course, you can also pair it with Pentimental, which is even much worse if Ruin gets cleansed, and other hexes to make it a bit meaner. Um, it also it immediately gives information through surveillance and and can be triggered easily from a distance with, with certain killer powers, uh, including Nemesis Zombies that chase survivors off. So for those reasons, the perk is actually fairly decent and can see some good usage on selected builds. Even though by itself has it has the risk of being cleansed, disappears when a gen, when a survivor is killed, and doesn't have doesn't pack that much of a punch. It's all in how much you you complement this perk. But put it in, in a build as I explained earlier and it actually it actually gives decent value. Next up, we have Face the Darkness. Uh, Face the Darkness is an interesting perk that triggers... Um, it's a hex perk that doesn't appear at the start of the match. It only appears when you injure a survivor, and it stays on as long as that survivor stays injured. If you have the survivor heal, or if you down them, the perk goes away and cannot be cleansed until it's re-enabled. So the funny part about this perk is that it can go on and off, on and off. It can appear and reappear, appear and disappear, and it's a bit of a whack-a-mole... Uh, clown fiesta until the survivors actually find it um so what this perk will do is that everyone um w once you get this survivor injured the other survivors are going to have to deal with a very annoying intermittent screaming and auto reveal um this can be mitigated a little bit by distortion and other auto hitting hiding perks but the scream will still interrupt them this scream is really really nasty um on an average, oh, uh, and by the way, the survivors, they need to be outside of your terror radius. So that means that if you're playing Wesker and you injure a survivor and everyone else inside your terror radius, this perk does literally nothing. But for stealth killers, this is a big deal. Uh, for killers that um, have a small terror radius, this is a big deal. Anyone that's moderately far away from you will be revealing their position and you can go and stalk them and harass them. And their screaming also interrupts actions. It is extremely, extremely powerful on the pig. If she 
Uh, if she has plaything, for example, the person that is of the hook will never be in a terror radius, so they will constantly be uh, susceptible to this. And they will scream during box searches and other critical things like totems, so it can really, really mess up with survivors. I've seen survivors do the totem to try to cleanse it and then scream during it, so it has quite a few... Um, it can induce quite a few uh, inconveniences onto teams, and it can also give you information so that you can teleport to them with Sadako, which is a pretty interesting and useful strategy. So, yeah, it's nice on those killers. You just need to understand that they need to be outside of your turret radius, and if you play against survivors that immediately heal through medkits or whatever, this perk might lose a little bit of its value. As every other hex perk, it often goes well with other hexes, but you already figure that out. Next is Gift of Pain. This is another one of the Scorch Hook perks, and it's one of the weaker ones. There's four right now. I would say this is the third weakest. Uh, this perk triggers when you hook a survivor on a white hook at any time, um, and they become unhooked. Uh, obviously, that, that's can, that can only happen twice. <laughs> when, a when a survivor is hooked on, the, uh, on, a, on a white hook or any other hook for the third time, they just die. So there's no point in doing this. This works when they become unhooked. And it gives them a bit of a lose-lose situation. If they stay injured, healing takes longer. They have mangled status effect, which is nasty that, you know, they take longer to heal. It's like a sloppy butcher, but that applies through the hook. But if they heal, now they do gens 16% faster. Uh, sorry, no, faster, that would be crazy. 16% uh, slower. It is not insane, but 16% slower is kind of significant if they have to go on to do a couple of gens. Now, uh, there are two problems for this. The first one is that this perk can be somewhat dodged. Uh, you cannot 99 the heal, because there's hemorrhage as well, so you, you can't really do that, that's good. But the problem is that you can stay injured. And sometimes you don't need to do that many gens. Think about it. Let's say you've hooked a survivor. Let's say you've hooked two survivors and they both have this perk. How many gens are left? Realistically, they've already done two, maybe three gens by that point. So there's not that... These survivors are not going to go on to do four gens. It's not like the 16% is that big of a deal. And if they stay injured and they get adrenaline at the end of the game, so what? They don't really care. They get adrenaline anyway. So... Yeah, this perk, even though it's hard to trigger as the as the other Scorch Hooks, it doesn't hit as hard. Uh, it's not that insane. Sloppy Butcher is much easier to apply to multiple survivors at the start of the game and not one by one slowly through hooks. Um, so you could run that and it would be more effective and more straightforward on most killers. Um, I would say this is decent on killers like Oni and Spirit that really punish survivors for staying injured, but even then, Sloppy Butcher on Spirit makes more sense. On Oni, yeah, he doesn't apply it with his power, um, if he uses his Demon Dash, so it makes sense. Uh, but more so than this, this perk has an interesting uh, dilemma, and that is the fact that if you tunnel a survivor, this perk does nothing. I'm not saying that you have to tunnel, but most situations, in most games, ideally, if you're playing brutally efficient, you want to chase the same survivor multiple times. So if I hook Claudette, and then I hook Dwight, and then I try to go for Claudette again, this perk does nothing. It does nothing. Even the slowdown of 16% goes away if you injure the survivor. But if you commit to them and then try to down them, guess what? The healing doesn't matter, the gems doesn't matter. So this is a perk that doesn't help you in tunneling at all, and in fact encourages you to hook a survivor and then just never chase them again so that they get the most slowdown possible. That is very sweet and very friendly and very cool, but also not the most efficient. And that is the main problem of this perk. It encourages you to hook multiple survivors, which is something that you can only afford if you're already doing extremely well and it doesn't help you get there. Haunted Ground is a hex perk that starts out at the beginning and it's kind of funny, because instead of taking up one totem, it takes up two. So there are two totems, and if you cleanse any of them, uh, one of them will disappear, the other one will become a doll, and then 60 seconds, every survivor is exposed. Unless they run visual, in which case it takes a bit less. But 60 seconds of everyone exposed. Now, this on its own is 
pretty useless. If this was the only hex perk, then survivors would just ignore it and it wouldn't be a big deal. Or they would only trigger it while everyone is injured, which is something that they should be doing anyway. But this perk is not the only hex perk. It's one of several. So the nice thing about this is that you can run this on aggressive killers and run it with other hexes. And survivors need to be very careful. If I see a hex at the start of the game, I don't cleanse it because it could be this and I could get my team in trouble. So I need to find a way, like just because this perk exists, I need to find a time where everyone is injured and this perk wouldn't hurt so much to trigger. So that alone, this perk has that psychological effect on survivors. It can trigger once in the worst possible time. With uh, with Undying, it can trigger multiple times. Um, yeah, it's a pretty mean perk. The sad part about it is that there's a bit of RNG so if you're a bit unlucky, they could get your Ruin or your Devour, and then this perk could be there sitting, and there's a 1 in 3 of that happening, roughly, roughly, not exactly, with other hexes, but pretty much. So, yeah, do you want to have RNG on top of RNG? Maybe this perk is not for you. Otherwise, if you're willing to take some uh, calculated risks, I reckon you will enjoy it. A Nurse's Calling is one of the simpler perks so far. Any survivor healed by other survivors or healing themselves, any survivor doing the healing um, will be shown to you within 28 meters. This includes survivors healing others on the ground, but it does not include survivors healing themselves on the ground. That's called recovering. That's not called healing. So healing on the ground, healing yourself, healing others will be picked up by this perk. This is awesome. This is great. Uh, you go around the map. Uh, survivors typically hear your terror radius, which is normally 32 meters, and they stop healing. So this perk doesn't catch all of them. But if you play a character with a smaller terror radius, or if you're a character that is undetectable and is just being undetected by... Survivors have no idea how close you are. You can sometimes close the gap really, really quickly and appear an inch away from them to interrupt their healing. If on top of this you have Mangled from Sloppy Butcher or Mangled Add-ons, if you interrupt the healing, they will lose the progress immediately, even if you don't manage to squeeze a hit in right away. So that's really, really good stuff. Overall, this perk is pretty awesome. Uh, the main downside of this perk, survivors like to rub medkits. M survivors heal after they've been unhooked. So in a, in a horrible but common case scenario, I... Chase Dwight, I down Dwight, I hook Dwight, Dwight gets unhooked, he has a medkit, he heals himself, but because he has off the record, guess what? Uh, invisible. Off the record, soul survivor, distortion, mostly off the record, this hides you from auto reading. So even if survivor, even if survivor Dwight is healing, I wouldn't see him. So this perk unfortunately has several counters, the most common one being off the record. So I wouldn't see him. A uh, funny part is, is that if Dwight gets healed by someone else and that someone else doesn't have off the record, then you will see you will see the person healing, but not the person healed, and then you'll put two and two together. So that's kind of funny. Um, yeah, another thing that could happen is that Dwight is injured, but instead of healing, he just works on the last generator and gets adrenaline. And then guess what? You don't get that. So yeah, that sucks a little bit. This is a decent perk that has become just less and less reliable over time for those reasons. Overall, though, still a decent perk on stealth killers and killers that are good at interrupting heals. Next up is Third Seal. Uh, when fully upgraded to tier 3, this perk applies to up to 4 survivors. Anytime you hit them with your power or your basic attack, they become blind forever until the totem is cleansed. Um, there are a few situations where this can be disastrous for survivors. If survivors are on on separate, um, if they're all solo players and they're all in their separate bubbles and they don't have any communication outside the game, this is really rough. They don't see each other on the ground if they're being slugged. They don't see each other when they're on the hook. They don't know who's going for what. They might not be able to use their perks like Kindred or Windows Opportunities. So this really hampers and, and hurts their efficiency, which is nice. Survivors that are on a team are mostly immune from this perk. Uh, if, it, if it's only applied to a couple people, it will do basically nothing. If it's cleansed earlier, it's a normal hex, so it can be... Uh, it will do almost nothing other than waste a little bit of their time. But, believe it or not, if you are an efficient, brutal killer, 
Even team survivors can find this perk a little bit overwhelming. Even good survivors will often struggle to coordinate effectively if you're one of those killers like Dredge that can be everywhere at once and they have a struggle finding the hooks, finding this, finding that. Sometimes even team survivors can, can really struggle to, to, to get these things going and it can help out quite a bit. So it is a decent perk. Now, very, very important distinction. Blindness does not affect killer props. So if you're thinking of playing pick and you're like, oh, I'm gonna make them blind so they don't see the box, or oh, I'm gonna make them blind so they don't see the fountains. Oh, I'm gonna make them blind so they don't see the vaccine cases as Wesker. That doesn't work. Keep that in mind. Those things are separate auras. They don't they don't get the they don't get um removed by blindness. So if you had an evil plan, that's not gonna be part of it. Next up is Hex Retribution. This is a highly underrated perk that is quite, actually quite strong. It is a trap, um, it is a trap type hex, meaning that if survivors don't touch any totems, this perk basically does nothing. It does nothing. So <laughs> anytime you put this in a, in a build, be careful. You're adding another perk, much like Hunter Ground, that if survivors just ignore it, it does nothing. You want to have retribution with things that survivors cannot ignore, such as um, Blood Faber, Devour, sometimes Plaything, those kind of stuff. Otherwise, it's going to be very underwhelming. So what happens? Whenever a survivor cleanses or touches a doll or a Hex Totem, they become oblivious for a very long time. This means that even if they don't have plaything, um, you will be able to walk up to a Swabber on a Totem and then whack them on top of the head and they might not hear you coming. And if they have plaything, they will continue to have oblivious for a long time after cleansing it because of the lingering 45, 45 second obliviousness. If they cleanse Haunted Ground, they will be super confused because they'll be oblivious during most of it anyway. So the oblivious part is nice, but the nicest bit is that if they cleanse a Hexburg, including itself, but not limited to itself, they will reveal the auras of everyone for a very, very long time. More than 10 seconds, which means that it will consume multiple distortion tokens, if you have any left. So, it's basically like Lethal Pursuer. It shows the auto of everyone everywhere, unless they're in a locker. So what this means is that if you run Undying and this perk, you are pretty much guaranteed that one of the hexes is going to be removed and the first one will always be retri will always uh, apply retribution. The fun part about this perk is that when you cleanse retribution itself, it doesn't show up for survivors. But when you cleanse other perks other than retribution, it gives the retribution effect. It's kind of weird the way that works. So survivors are often confused. And if you have hot other hexes, sometimes they might still believe that they are affected by other hexes, even if they cleanse them. So I found that this perk does confuse survivors a little bit. And it works great with other hexes and traps. Um, talking about specific killers to use it on, I am a... I mean, obviously it works great on Nurse and any killer that can destroy you through walls. But I have found that it's very effective on on Pyramid Head, since he can also hit through walls, and on killers that can quickly use that burst of information to really wreak havoc on survivors. Uh, Oni, for example, uh, coming to mind. Also, being oblivious against Oni is really, really scary. I don't need to explain why. Next up, we have Force Hesitation. This is a very strange perk that doesn't come into effect very often, but when it does, the effects are undeniably strong. Anytime you down a survivor by any means, any other survivor within 16 meters of them, not of you, but typically that doesn't matter, will be slowed down by, I believe, 20% for how much? I think it's 10 seconds. It's for a decent chunk of time. So basically, say you're playing a killer that can insta down. If you insta down a survivor and another survivor was next to them, the other survivor is going to be comically slow for a very long time, which will often lead to multiple downs in one spot. In my experience, survivors don't get together unnecessarily too much, especially after they figure out that you have this perk. So this perk could be one of those that goes the entire match without seeing any use after the initial scare. It also has a bit of a cooldown, which means that sometimes, it's not very big, it's only 40 seconds, but it means that sometimes the times you would want it to be used, it might be on cooldown. Um, as I said, because survivors split up naturally against some killers, and spe especially against this perk, 
I don't have the greatest consistency in using it, but there are a few situations where you can engineer um, when you can engineer situations where, where survivors cannot avoid it. And in my opinion, the most consistent one is with say the best for last or other killers that are good at like doing quick sets of events. Say that you have a survivor on the hook and say that their time is running out and say that a teammate is coming and you know that they're gonna try to trade to rescue their teammate, you can down the rescuer and the person of the hook will be so slow that you can probably hit them. And because they're so, so, so slow, you can hit them twice. And that is the real strength of this perk. In my opinion, it doesn't come into play very much, but if you run it with say that was for last or put it, on, put it on one of these killers that is really good at double hits, like Pyramid Head, for example, it's really good at hitting survivors twice, right? then this perk becomes really, really mean, and it can turn an easy one down into two downs. And that alone makes you have to respect this perk at least a little bit. It is a bit of a one-trick pony, though, and survivors can play. Like, if you're camping a survivor and hoping for an exchange, what if they have deliverance? What if they have reassurance? You are opening yourself up for some counterplay there, so watch out, this is not a foolproof plan. Next up, we have Thrill of the Hunt. This is a hex that spawns naturally, and it becomes empowered by the amount of totems available on the map. If a cleansed totem becomes reignited by Pentimento, that counts too. So typically, this perk gets weaker and weaker, but sometimes it can go and it can grow its strength back. So for each totem. Um, this perk gives extra blood points, no one cares about that, and it makes cleansing and blessing actions longer. Uh, naturally, survivors are already slower at, at blessing hexes, so what this perk does is it makes boons basically horrible, horribly inefficient. If you have this perk, setting up a boon on a hex takes like a minute. It's awful. Cleansing your first totem takes twice as long as usual, which I think is 28 seconds. That's brutal. Imagine doing 28 seconds of cleansing, and then in the final second you get interrupted by a doctor's crib. Imagine you do 28 seconds, and then it was haunted ground, so you get your teammate killed. Bruh. There are so many situations where the 28 seconds are awfully long and can be interrupted at any given time. So... With Thrill the Hunt, you make doing totems awful. A combination that could be really, really powerful. Uh, obviously, if, if Thrill the Hunt gets cleansed, then the effects are gone, but then they have to deal with the other hexes. Uh, but you can run it with Undying. So you could have Thrill, Undying, Devour Hope. And now their first totem will take... And then Pentimento or something like that. And then their first totem will take 28 seconds. The second one will take a little bit less, but still a lot. And then you start to use Pentimento, and then they might still have the bar. Oh, it gets it gets a bit of a headache there, there, doesn't it? It gets really, really messy. And survivors that are not quick, uh, that are not uh, appropriately equipped and, and quickly adapt to this situation could easily find themselves overwhelmed. So it is a very, very mean perk. Then again. It's hexes, we all know what can happen with them. Uh, even Devour Hope has its own holes. You could have a perfectly good plan and then survivors ignore hexes, do gens, and are ready to get out before your plan even takes off. So keep that in mind. Next up, Game Afoot. This might be the most complex perk in the game. If there is one perk that I will freely admit uh, and be honest with you that I don't understand is this one. This perk is just so complex and it's so weird i understand it but at the same time i feel like i, I feel like i still um need to unlock its true potential this is a perk that triggers when you are chasing the obsession when you are chasing the obsession and the game detects that you're chasing the obsession if you break a pallet or a wall or kick a gen not something you do in chase but whatever you become 10 percent faster for 10 seconds that's not insignificant. Some killer, uh, normally when you break a pallet, they gain so much distance that it's kind of pointless. But some killers can break pallets relatively quickly, like Nemesis with his tentacle. And that 10% is nice. It's comfy. It can help you. However, keep in mind, this is just for the obsession. Just for the obsession. So there's a chance you might not do it very much. And the other thing that this perk will do is that whenever you hit a survivor, if that survivor is the one that you have chased the most out of all of the survivors remaining, they become your obsession. So that means that during your first chase, when you hit a survivor, by very definition, 
Like, that survivor will be the one that you've chased the most. So that guy will become the obsession. That might be good. That might be bad for other perks. You need to be smart. Uh, another nice thing is that survivors that are dead do not count. So technically, if there's one survivor left, or say two survivors left, and the obsession is already dead, if you hit one of them, there is a very good chance that they'll become the obsession just, just because there's everyone else is dead, so they might just be the last person uh, that was the most chased. The game has some inside clock that measures how many people have been chased. So this can make it very easy to become to make people become the obsession in late game to them rancor them, which we explained earlier. Rancor lets you insta down, uh, insta kill them um, after you. After you've, uh, if, uh, after you, you can't insta down them on the first hit. They have to become the the obsession first, but it lets you insta more them, which is really really mean. So yeah, this with some with some creativity can be pretty good. Uh, for example, on the singularity, if you break a pallet with your overclock, that will count, and you will get the speed boost. Um, so this is a perk that you really, really need to study, really need to test out to really understand it, and really need to build around it. And when you do, it ca it can have its occasional moments of brilliance, and also its moments of like, oh, this guy became the obsession. Well, that's terrible. I don't really care. Of So yeah, it goes from anywhere from mediocre to, to really, really fun and quirky, and everything in between. So use that if it seems something fun to you. Next up, we have Thrilling Tremors from Ghostface. Whenever you pick up a survivor, um, even if it's from a grab, even if you grab them out of a locker, whenever you grab a survivor to pick them up, uh, all of the generators that are not currently being done will be blocked by the entity for 16 seconds. The generators that are being done will not be blocked, which is bad, but at the same time, this gives you information. So what this perk will typically do is you pick someone up, and on the way to the hook, you can already look around yourself and you'll see one or two gens that are maybe red and those gens have people in them or had people a second ago. This is really, really, really good. Um, the only major downside of this perk is its hefty 60 second cooldown that starts after the 16 seconds. So um, if you're doing relatively well, you're going to have this perk uh, work in like half your pickups, more or less. Um, but this has good stuff like the fact that survivors cannot fool this perk is a good thing if survivors um let go of a gen so that their position is not revealed that's also good because it's 16 seconds that they cannot rush that gen to to full progress so it's still really really decent and unlike distortion um unlike other perks like barbecue it cannot be triggered uh, it can the, the, sorry it, when it triggers it is completely uh, unable to be countered by any survivor perk. You cannot have distortion to hide from it. So it gives nice info. Now, one other quirk about this perk that is really interesting is that many killers are capable of artificially pushing survivors off gens. So you can do smart things. Um, you can send a knight to a gen and then pick up. You can use your blast as a doctor and then pick up. You can send a bird to a gen and when they let go, then you pick up. You can pretend to teleport to a gem with Freddy, and when they, they 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 get spooked, then you can pick up, and then you will block a gen, and somewhat um, guarantee that for the next few seconds it's gonna be fine. Obviously, when a gen is blocked, that means that you cannot hit it with pain dress. But if you have pain dress, you can then use that time to hook elsewhere if that's something you want to use. So it does have some anti synergies. And when a gen is blocked, it doesn't regress, continue to regress, but still, it's a nice, nice perk that is fairly consistent. It gets a bit outclassed by the other gen info perks like Discordance or Tinker, but for the most part, it is, it is solid and decent. And as I mentioned, it has some interesting synergies with a few killers that can make it uh, happen a bit more often or have the blockage be a bit more meaningful. Uh, moving on, we have I'm All Ears also from Ghost. So it's funny that they're together. This perk triggers whenever a survivor does a fast, um, a fast action. Now, I believe that this should work when coming... Wait, is this... Yeah, this is... It, it doesn't work. Wait, does it work out of a locker? I believe it works out of a locker as well. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think it should. Like, I don't think they patched it out. For, forgive me, I'm, I should have studied this. 
yeah, <laughs> sometimes sometimes a Zubar with, with can go into a locker with this perk, and it would it would trigger it. Yes, um, but for the most part, this is a perk that triggers on vaults, vaults on pallets, and vaults on windows. Whenever a survivor rushes them, you will see their aura for the next few seconds. Now. We're starting to already have a few problems. The moment that you see their aura is only a few seconds. It's not that big. The perk then goes on a pretty lengthy 40 second cooldown, which is pretty painful. That means that many times in chase, the perk will be wasted and on cooldown. If you are very unlucky, let's say you run this on Pyramid Head, which is a pretty common one. You might have smart survivors spam vault from a distance to trigger this perk and make you waste it. I've seen that happen at least once. It's a pretty out there scenario. So you could waste it. And it doesn't work if the survivor has qu uh, quick and quiet. Quick and quiet is a perk that makes rush actions be silent. And you would think that maybe this perk would counter it, but it doesn't. If you play against a mech with quick and quiet and she falls a window, this perk doesn't work. Also, because it's only auto reading, guess what? If they have distortion, of the record, anything like that, you don't see their aura. So that's a lot of potential downsides and that's what keeps this perk so far down the list. But what are the good things? This perk shows you the aura of a survivor. That is amazing. It means that you can mind game them. You can walk one way and see if they run into you. You can walk, you can show your red light and then watch them come and know exactly where they are to do a mind game or hold up a hatchet and ready up around the corner or teleport through them through a wall or hit them or ready up a bird or a pyramid head punishment hit. So the options for mean hits and insane, insane mind games on places that would otherwise be super safe are very, very amazing amazing so that's great uh just sad that it's somewhat inconsistent and had in and has these gaps in in its reach um so yeah that that's pretty much it i recommend this perk on on the aforementioned nurse pyramid head i also like it on lesion a little bit because everyone's out of the injured and you're a short killer so you're more likely to sometimes be able to do mind games where they don't see your head poke from above certain obstacles and so it's not a bad perk just has just just has a very unforgiving cooldown uh next brutal strength a very simple perk that makes you kick generators and pallets faster breakable walls as well this is not an ideal perk for killers that already have some kind of animation to break them if you're playing demo or nemesis this perk is completely useless you you might as well just use your power it is it is that good um though for killers that don't have that or killers that like to kick um generators relatively frequently this perk is comfy it feels good and it can sometimes help you a little bit in zoning you can break a pallet in an area where a survivor would typically outspeed you somewhere and you gain a little bit of distance. Is it enough to make a huge difference? Most of the times, most of the maps, I would say no, it's really not that incredible. Um, however, it stacks up with other um, add-ons and perks that increase your speed, such as Fire Up and the Shadow Dance add-on, so that's a little bit of fun. And if you're gonna go for a build that is all about kicking stuff anyway, this, this perk does add up sometimes. And can, and can make a little bit of a difference. If you like that kind of confidence, uh, I would recommend it for almost every other build. I For almost every other person, I would recommend other perks. If you're, if you're focusing on kicking gens, nowhere to hide is probably a nice addition. Eruption could be considered. If you're worried about uh, pallets in particular, I think there are other perks to deal with them faster, but it's not a bad perk. Spirit Fury serves... Hold on. Hold on. I have a little something that's not working. There we go. Uh, Spirit Fury serves a similar purpose um, in order to destroy pallets, but it works very differently. Whenever you have broken two pallets, um, don't use Spirit Fury at level 1 or level 2, please, because it makes you have to break 3 or 4. But at tier 3, whenever you have broken two pallets, the perk activates. The next time a pallet would stun you, you automatically break that pallet. Now, if you get... Th there could be a situation where this wouldn't be very good at all, and that is if they do a pallet rescue. If they stun you with a pallet and they rescue a teammate, 
the palette will break, but your animation will still be very long. And then they'll get away and it will barely, barely make a difference. Another situation where it's not ideal is if you hit a survivor and you hit them at the pallet and they there's a bit of lag and they stun you. In this situation, it's not ideal because you waste a perk and you break the pallet. But guess what? You already had the down on the survivor, so it's not a big deal. Now, in other situations, though, the perk is pretty nice. You hit a survivor. They drop the pallet on you, bang, it completely resets your cooldown of 2.7 seconds. You can hit them almost immediately again with very little room for them to get away. Not zero, but very little room for them to get away. And that's what's amazing about this perk. If you're an instant down killer, uh, like say Cannibal, um, you can chew through pallets relatively easy. Um, you can... You can be a bit cheeky, maybe lunge at the pallet, which is one th one thing that this perk does on killers, it, it makes them lunge because you want to get stunned, right? So people, if you see a killer lunge at you, even when it doesn't make a lot of sense, they often have this perk. And then if you get stunned, you eat the pallet really quickly and then you can insta down right after. It is a very mindless perk that you can put on and your average team of survivors is not coordinated or smart enough to play around it that well. And it basically means that every other chase you'll get a free hit or a free or a free down. And that's comfy and it's nice. However, survivors are not stupid once you keep getting better yourself. They will see this perk coming, they will call it out, and once they figure out that you do you will see that they just drop the pallet early. They get to a pallet, they immediately drop it. They don't try to stun you, they just drop it. And if they drop it, they outplay Enduring and they outplay Spirit Fury both at once. And now if you don't have Brutal Strength, you have to just break it and you don't have two perks. If you play a killer like Clown that slows down survivors um, a lot, then it's harder for them to stun you. But guess what? Clown is very good at playing around drop pallets anyway. So... There's not that many killers where this is ideal. Any killer that you think, oh, this is really, really good on, they almost always have something else, including Blood Favor, which is a lot more straightforward and a lot harder for survivors to outplay. They can't just speed up the pallet, right, if you run Blood Favor. So, yeah, it's a mindless, it's a pretty mindless, uh, brainless combo that is fun and makes for some fun clips. But if you're going to play at higher levels, you will eventually gravitate towards uh, different alternatives. We now reach the tier of perks that get a little bit worse. I will be talking a bit less about the upcoming perks, uh, forgive me, in the interest of time. But my turn Abuse, we're going to dedicate a bit of time to it. My turn Abuse is a weird perk that gives you a little bit of extra field of view when you're not in chase. This is something that will be removed down the line, by the way, but right now it still does it. Um, this... It's not really worth talking about much more on that when we talk about Shadowborn. Uh, the important thing about Monitor Abuse is that it makes your terror radius dynamic. Um, you have your normal terror radius, which is normally 32 meters. And when you're in chase, it gets bigger than normal. But when you're, uh, when you're out of chase, it becomes smaller than normal. So it, 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 it goes from being plus 8 to being minus 8. Now... On the average killer, this translates to you being able to sneak up on survivors and gain an extra 1.7 seconds or so. That means that if a survivor is on a gen and they just react to your terror radius immediately, they will gain, uh, they will they will take about two seconds longer to realize that you're coming. That is pretty significant. If you're a fast killer like Oni, you can run at survivors, they will hear your terror radius, and a second later, they're already within smashing distance. Pair this with Infectious Fright, and you can get the best of both worlds. You can have a small terror radius outside of chase to sneak up on people, and a big terror radius in chase to make Infectious Fright reveal people 40 meters around you. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, on killers like Hag, you might also benefit from the bigger and smaller terror radius that goes on and off. You can chase a survivor. Um, they run away, they lose sight of you, you run away, and because your terror radius goes from being um, big to being very small really quickly, that means that on their end, it almost sounds like you just disappeared, even though you might not be that far. And with a smaller terror radius, sometimes survivors might not realize you're around, they might do sillier things, they might be more susceptible to being caught in traps, to being uh, found by nurses calling and all other kinds of ambush type stuff. So it's really not too bad. 
Obviously, having a small turret radius on a killer that has no turret radius is kind of stupid. So this is not a perk you want on stealth killers such as Wraith or Ghostface for the most part. But it's still it's still something that on average, if you have nice info perks or info add-ons and you run this perk, on average, you're going to get a little bit of value. Uh, of course, uh, for every rule, there's an exception. And sometimes you will play against teams that are so utterly coordinated that they will basically be calling you out at any given time. If you're one of, if you play against one of these teams, or it's one of those games where survivors are constantly, and I mean constantly, in your presence, this perk will do next to nothing for you. And then it might not be so much work the perk slot. Next up is oppression. Oppression is a cute little perk that triggers when you kick a generator, and then it goes on a cooldown for 80 seconds. This is bad. This is a big cooldown. On killers such as the Skull Merchant, who can extend chases, sorry, extend games for a long time, the cooldown doesn't feel so bad, for, but for the average killer, it is a bit of a big deal, and the main reason why this perk is not so good. Um, but cooldown us out, what does it do? When you kick this gen, three, uh, up to three other gens in the map become kicked as well, and they begin to regress. Uh, they don't regress at any higher speed, they just regress at the normal speed. Now, normally, in a normal match, this means that you will be regressing the gens that people are doing. Though I have to say, it's only up to three. So if you're, forgive me, if you're extremely, and I mean extremely, extremely unlucky, there could be a situation, theoretically, where survivors have a gen 99, and then a gen 1%, a gen 1%, and a gen 1%. And then if you kick another gen, you could hit the three gens that are 1% instead of the one that's 99. That's almost, un that's almost impossible, but it is something that could theoretically happen, because this perk doesn't kick all the gens at once. So, when a gen gets kicked, it begins to regress. If you have um, surveillance, you will see their color change. And if a survivor is on it, they will get a skill check without much of a warning. And this skill check is fairly difficult. I think an average survivor will miss it. Um, you know, half the times. Good survivors, especially if they've already seen it and they're already aware, they're gonna be fine, they're gonna hit it just fine, and it doesn't really hurt them. But, keep in mind, even if they only miss it every now and then, missing a skill check is a minus 10%. So if you run this with, with uh, Hunter's Lullaby and some other perks that can make the skill checks harder, it can be a bit nasty, honestly. So oppression is alright in this, in this build, in this situation. For the most part, though, the perk is just not that good as a generic perk. But even if you only make them miss a skill check once or twice, that minus 10% hurts quite a bit. It's an alright perk, just kind of weak on its own and has the weakness of the massive, massive cooldown. Next up is Dissolution. Dissolution triggers whenever you injure a survivor, and it's active for, I believe, 30 seconds. For those 30 seconds, all survivors within your terror radius, so this doesn't work well on a killer that has no terror radius, uh, there's only a few of those, but still, uh, all survivors within your terror radius see the icon on their HUD, so they know that they're affected by this perk. And if they fast bolt a pallet, the pallet breaks. Now, keep in mind that pallets don't appear in the map already dropped. So most survivors, you know, when you hit them, they will run away, then you will catch up, then they will take a window, then they will drop a pallet, and then by the time that happened, this perk is already off. So this is a perk that really begins to work if survivors have already dropped a few pallets, and, and you're actually starting to poke at them, and then this perk gets a little bit uncomfortable. Really stupid survivors, and when I say really stupid, I mean average survivors, um, they fall for this perk for pretty often. They don't know what it does or don't know how to counter it. The way to counter this perk is to not drop pallets, and if you need to vault them, to slow vault them. Much like crowd control, if you slow vault a pallet, this perk does nothing. Um, if you can afford to, of course. But if you fast vault it, the perk goes away. Um, for some killers that can kind of keep you close to them and make those 30 seconds... Um, painful, this works pretty well. It works pretty well on Clown, it works pretty well on Slinger, especially with Cigar and other add-ons to recover fast. And the idea is that a survivor vaulting a pallet fast in your face, uh, doing it slow is it's a bad idea because you can get caught so quickly by these killers. And doing it fast will obviously 
mean, mean that you can just walk right through them and hit them right away, unless they have life, in which case they'll speed off, right? So it, this perk creates a few situations where survivors have to be a bit smart, but guess what? They do get warned, and in most of the time, if you, the survivors that you're playing are bad, they're gonna die anyway. And if they're good, they're gonna play around this perk. So I have found this perk to be somewhat okay. If you are lucky and you hit a survivor and you keep the pressure, it can make a good survivor have more limited options in chase, but they still do have some options in chase. Ultimately, it is a perk that only works sometimes, and as such, has a lower placement on the tier list. Next is Force Penance. Force Penance is a situational niche perk that has an incredibly strong effect. Whenever you hit a survivor that is taking a protection hit, willingly or not, that survivor becomes broken for an obnoxiously long amount of time. I think it's 80 seconds. That means that for that time, that survivor is broken and they cannot ever heal to full. If the timer expires, then they can begin to heal, but they'll typically still take a while. So basically, if you hit a survivor that's trying to take a hit for another, you can expect that survivor to be injured for the next two minutes, oftentimes. That is pretty crazy. Believe it or not, this perk is running tournaments, where killers obviously have to face very coordinated survivors that will take hits for each other. Uh, in your average match, I don't think it's all that good. Survivors, as I explained earlier, don't typically line up to get hit. If you play a killer such as Oni, where survivors obviously do not want to give you any hit whatsoever, forget about running this perk. Horrible, horrible idea. Uh, but if you're a little bit sneaky, this perk's all right. Now, uh, what, are, what are some situations where you can hit survivors? If survivors are unhooking each other, you can hit them and apply broken. If someone is trying to uh, take hits while you carry, anytime you carry a survivor and you hit someone, that 100% is going to be a protection hit pretty much by default, so that will count as well. And basically, it's, it is a big, big perk to make people stay injured, and on some killers, that can be quite meaningful. Is it worth running over other more aggressive options? In my opinion, mostly no, but if you play a particular set of killers that likes to keep people injured, it can be all right. There are also a few, only a few killers that are afraid of altruism and survivors grouping up. For example, Twins is a killer where if survivors have healing perks and they split up in groups of two, they're basically invincible. Um, if you down one of them, the other one will kick you and then pick up the other guy and then they'll be constantly be healing each other and it's very difficult to keep up. But if you have this perk, you can apply broken, keep multiple people injured and then you can down them one by one and they will never have ch a chance to get a full reset in that situation. And it's also pretty common for survivors to take protection hits accidentally against twins. In those situations, I think twins might be the better user of force penance. You might want to... Uh, Consider including it in your build. Otherwise, though, very niche perk that doesn't have much use for the general user. Aha, uh -huh. there we go. Make your choice. Anytime a survivor is unhooked by another survivor, not if they self unhook, not if they have off, uh, you know, sorry, uh, self unhooking perks like um, Deliverance. Anytime a survivor is unhooked by another survivor, that other survivor will scream and for the next 60 seconds be. Um, um, be susceptible to be one shot. They will be exposed. This sounds pretty amazing. Think about it. You don't really do anything. You just hook and go away. As long as you stay 30... Uh, is it 32 or 24? I believe it's 32. As long as you stay 30... <laughs> I'll check right now so I know what I'm talking about. Is it... 32 meters, that's right. As long as you stay uh, further than 32 meters, which is not that crazy difficult... Um, the survivor that unhooks is a prey, and basically if you do this, you can only keep this one at a time, it doesn't stack multiple times, it has a cooldown that lasts as much as, um, as the effect does. So you, this can only happen on one person at a time, but still, that's one person that can't really do anything in front of you for 60 seconds. It's not as good as it sounds, even though it sounds like it's not much work. Most of the times, survivors do not send... An like like a like a vulnerable survivor for the rescue. If you have a team that is actively working well, they're going to send the one guy that has the fewest hooks. So essentially, if you want to have make your choice 
give you value, you need to trust that the Suaves are going to be a bit stupid. And, and you're going to be actively following their orders. So if someone unhooks and they're injured, this perk doesn't do much. If someone unhooks and you haven't hooked them yet, you will be chasing someone that is suboptimal. And maybe maybe he's the best survivor in the whole team and you don't really want to chase them. So it does force your hand sometimes. Not to mention that survivors have a lot of tools to unhook and disappear really quickly. In most large maps, it is very difficult to actually go back and find the culprit and find the the survivor that you want to get. So, in an if you put this on an average build and forget about it, it is a very forgettable weaker perk. Now that being said, there are some killers that can immediately go back to hook and really mess with survivors. Uh, Freddy, um, Demogorgon, Dredge, Sadako among them. And these killers use this perk a little bit better. Um, Killers like Demogorgon and, and Dredge in particular can do a very mean strategy of hooking someone in the basement. And then when make your choice triggers, they teleport to the top of the basement with portals or, or Freddy teleportation or, or locker teleport. And then it's basically an inescapable hit. Keep in mind, if that guy has deliverance then you don't get to do this twice. So this perk has way too many little counters and way too many weaknesses. Um, and you might be waiting for the unhook and then maybe they use reassurance. Like you you could be, you're basically having a perk that is set, the, the pace of which is set by two hours. And this more often than not is frustrating and hard to translate into actual pressure for you. For that reason, I don't super love it in its current state. Next up is Remember Me. Anytime you damage a health state from the obsession, this perk gains a token. For every token, the exit gates take four seconds longer to open at the end of the game, or if it's the last 1v1 person. So that means that it can quickly go up to 16 seconds. Now, a normal exit gate takes 20 seconds, and with this perk, you can add 16 seconds on top, 36. If the, if the survivors have wake up or whatever, it will be less, or resilience, it will be less. So already this perk is a massive, massive downgrade from No Way Out. Unlike No Way Out, this perk only works on three survivors. The, the obsession is not affected by Remember Me for some crazy reason. And at most, it gives you 16 seconds that survivors can make faster with perks like Wake Up. Then compare that to No Way Out, where at its worst, at its absolute worst, where you don't hook anyone, it gives you 12 seconds, and it cannot be outplayed by any perk, and it cannot be sped up by perks like Wake Up. So, yeah. Why does, why does this perk exist when, when No Out exists? It's crazy. The nice thing, though, is that you can run them both, and then the effect is pretty significant. And even, even compared to No Way Out, even though this perk is like far, far less superior, the effect is still not too bad. There are a lot of games where survivors try to plan things. They, they do calculated sacrifices, and they're like, okay, I'm gonna go down, but my teammates... They have 20 seconds to open the gates, it's gonna be fine, I'm gonna die, but then no one else is gonna die. But then, mm -mm, if you have an extra 16 seconds to open the gates, yep, uh, like, uh, until the very moment where they open the gates, they don't see the indicator. So that could really catch them off guard, and survivors could give you an extra kill or two, because they mess up like that. So, it's not a bad perk by any stretch, but it is a perk with holes that doesn't work on the obsession and gets widely outclassed, so why would you really run it? Next up, we have Overcharge. When you kick a generator with Overcharge, it has a funny little thing going on. At first, it actually regresses less than normal. So kicking a generator without Overcharge is actually better. Um, but over time, this, reverse, uh, this reverses. And eventually, the generator loses more and more and more and more progress. And it doesn't have an ending. It doesn't have a limit of time. So if you're in one of those rare situations where you kick a gen, and then for the next minute or two, no one touches it, overcharge will actually do a bit of a number. It will actually steal quite a bit of progress over a long period of time. I don't think these situations happen very frequently, but if it does, Overcharge is there to back you up. Um, 
Another thing that overcharge does is that it, it, it activates a bit of a trap. And the next time that generator gets touched by a Subarber, they will get a skill check that is moderately difficult. It is similar to the oppression one. A Subarber that is a little bit of this distracted will often miss it. A Subarber that is being pressured could easily miss it. A Subarber that is really new to the game will often miss it. Um, Subarbers that are keen or are the aware or have already seen it, they will often hit it. Now, there are some things to make this skill check even harder. If you have a lullaby, if you have a nerving presence, if you have something to, to make the skill checks harder, like certain add-ons on the Skull Merchant, then this can be kind of nasty. And then when they miss the skill check, they get an extra penalty for it as well. So that skill check can really destroy some unprepared teams. So that's not too bad. Um, the perk, in my opinion, is fairly inoffensive and fairly fairly harmless against the stronger teams by itself. But as a part of a larger team and against beginner teams uh, or, or, or average teams, it can be quite brutal. Um, uh, also, the skill check, of course, gets affected by anything related to the doctor. So it is a nice perk to run on the doctor himself. It's his own teachable because hitting the skill check when you don't have a warning from Lullaby or it's all over your screen, that can actually be fairly difficult even for seasoned players. So overall, it's an all right perk. It just doesn't do that much. And it can actually be a bit worse than nothing in some rare instances where survivors never miss a skill check and they get back on the gem quickly. Next up, Gearhead. Whenever you damage any survivor, the perk triggers for the next few seconds, and it will show you the aura of people hitting skill checks. If they hit great skill checks, they avoid it, but most survivors don't do that all of that consistently. So what this translates to is that you hit someone, and then as you look around the map, you will occasionally see the autos of survivors for a decently long time too. Um, yeah. Um, it is an auto reading perk, so it gets countered by distortion and all the other ones. We've talked about this a million times, so that's a problem. Another thing that's really annoying is that this perk shows you the aura of survivors on gens, and many times the gens themselves block the aura. And even if you're looking really hard, you can easily miss someone working on a gen because the aura is like a few pixels. Not to mention uh, people that are maybe hard, uh, not hard of hearing, um, that are um, visually impaired and have a hard time uh, distinguishing red and orange and so on, they, they will have a really hard time seeing this. So the perk isn't the most reliable, but there are a few killers that really, really like seeing artists from a distance. If you're playing artists, you can harass people with birds constantly. If you're playing a stealth killer, you can bounce back from one survivor to another and have the certainty that you're going to find someone and mess with them reliably. If you're playing nurse, you can just manifest yourself across the map on people that have no idea that you're coming. So yeah, that's not too bad. I also like it on Oni for a similar reason. Um, so yeah, if you want to have a perk that's a little bit unreliable, but that uh, but that offers uh, the occasional burst of interesting information uh, for ambushes, so this perk is quite nice. And as I said, um, it is something that some killers can take advantage of more than others. Definitely not a perk you want to put on Trapper. Even if you see someone from afar, what are you really going to do about it, right? So yeah, overall, not too bad. Uh huh. Moving on is Hubris. Hubris is a perk that triggers whenever you get stunned by anything, and the person that stuns you is exposed for 20 seconds. This includes head on and decisive and anything else that's a stun. But for the most part, if that person stuns you, they're either going to be too far or out of the injured, so it's not a big deal. Most of the time, this is a perk that triggers with pallets. And yes, you can run this with Enduring and Spirit Fury and instead on someone that stuns you. It's kind of stupid, but it can be done. There's also a few other situations where you can trigger the perk, but um, obviously it only really helps you if it leads to an insta down on an already healthy person, right? So from my experience, um, are there any killers that can use this uniquely well? There's a couple. Um, do not use it on Singularity. When he breaks a pallet using his overclock, he doesn't technically get stunned, so it's not actually good. It is good for the event that is going on right now, if you're curious. If you get stunned by one of the fake pallets, uh, yeah, that does work. But outside of these gimmicks, uh, who, who can use this perk? 
In my opinion, the best user of this perk is Spirit and Dredge. Spirit and Dredge are uniquely good at catching up to you after being stunned. The Spirit, because she's the Spirit and has a billion million uh, percent movement add-ons. And remember, exposed means that you need to hit them with your basic attack. So the Nurse and the Blight, they're not very good at this because even if they catch you quick, they hit you with them too. You need to hit with a Name 1, Mouse 1 basic attack. And Spirit is one of the few fast killers that can do that. Um, so you can be stunned. She even has some add-ons to regain her power upon stun. Uh, call the Uchiwa and also, yeah, uh, something, uh, the, the, the teacup as well. If you break a pallet that you stun. So you can be stunned, get your power back, and then yum, and hit them. And that's pretty decent. The best perk on her, not really, not by a mile. But yeah, my favorite user, however, is the Dredge. The Dredge is really good at getting stunned and zoning out survivors or even teleporting to lockers ahead of them. So he can make the 20 seconds really good. Many other killers, in 20 seconds, they can't do anything. If the survivor reaches another pallet, they can stall you there for 20 seconds easily. But with Dredge, you place one remnant, you go the other way, and you are able to force the survivor into an unavoidable hit in less than 20 seconds. So he is by far the best user of it. Hardly the best perk in the world, but, you know, kind of cute, kind of nice. Um, but yeah, for almost any other killer, I would say this isn't the most reliable, but it goes well with Enduring, and it's an, it's an okay perk that can result in some fun moments, so it's got that fun factor to it, at least. Uh, moving on, we have Superior Anatomy. Superior Anatomy is a really interesting perk. It activates and becomes enabled whenever you have a survivor fastbolt near you. It's almost like a copy, copycat perk. If they fastbolt, then you activate the perk and then you can also fastbolt. It makes you vault fast, um, it makes you uh, vault much, much faster than usual, much, much faster than usual. And this is something that you don't wanna waste. You don't wanna like down a survivor through a window and then vault it and then, you know, waste it. You wanna save it for times when you really, really wanna catch up. Uh, there are some killers that do not vault windows much or that vault windows with their power, such as Legion. And in my opinion, this perk, it doesn't work with their power. Like, for example, Wesker and Legion, they don't vault faster while using their power. So don't bother using it on them for that. Uh, but for the other killers, it's not bad. It stacks with Bamboozle, it stacks with Meyer's naturally faster speed, if you want to go for something ridiculous. It stacks with Singularity's faster uh, vault as well. Um, but but honestly, this is best used on killers that are that don't have any natural faster abilities to mess with survivors at jungle gyms and other places. Uh, what you wanna do is you chase them into a window, you pretend that you're gonna go around, the survivor then gets in front of the window to try to react if you're coming from one side, and then you immediately vault it, and you're gonna be so fast that they cannot make it around and you get the hit. And as a tool for that kind of stuff, it is an okay perk. Now, what are some of the downsides of this perk? If you go on the game, where, there is, where it's like 25 pallets and like three windows, I know it's more than three windows, but bear with me. Um, this perk is basically useless. There are also a lot of games where by one, for one reason or another, survivors just don't play windows. They just draw pallets, draw pallets, take the hit, go away. It is a very infuriating thing, but believe it or not, there are a lot of situations where survivors just, maybe to a fault, they don't use windows. And you will find this perk has been in your inventory or your loadout for two games and you've used it once. And I find that very infuriating. But if you send yourself to a certain map or have a certain expectation of what map you struggle with, maybe you find the, the very fast vault gimmick uh, fun. It's definitely it's definitely fun when, when you get to use it. Uh, knockout. Knockout is a bit of a mean perk, okay? Whenever you down a survivor with your basic attack, so it doesn't work on all the killers, they are they are deafened, they don't hear very well on the ground. Uh, this can be helpful if you want to set up traps or something around them, they might not hear you around corners. They are blind for, I believe, 15 or 16 seconds, uh, which means they don't see their teammates around them. Not a big deal. Um, and they move slower. Now, that last bit is actually fairly useful. There might be a lot of situations where you down a survivor, you down another survivor, and they're both crawling to the exit gate. And if you make them much slower for a few seconds, that's enough for you to pick one up, take them all the way to the hook, and still have time to pick up the other. So that slowdown on the crawl is possibly the most reliable uh, thing this perk does. 
But the main gimmick of this perk is that survivors that are on the ground are invisible to their teammates from afar. And what this means is that you can be a very mean person and down a person, down a survivor, and then leave them. If especially if you're not interested in them, if they're you down them because they were taken ahead and you just want to go for something, you just leave them. And then their teammates don't see them and they have to crawl to the center of the map and try to get a help. I've played against a killer that tried this recently, and it does put an immediate stress on on survivors that are playing solo. Luckily, it was a big map and it didn't work out for him, but it could have worked out really badly. And and again, against solo players, it puts a bit of stress on them. However, if you're playing with um, with a group of survivor studies on team uh, and they're coordinated and they're on comms, this perk is basically useless. Uh, I went down in shack. Oh, okay, I'm coming. It doesn't matter that they don't see each other. So this is a very mean perk, as I said, because it affects solo survivors way more than it does teams. As such, use it if it feels like it's something you don't mind. <clears throat> Next up, we have Huntress Lullaby. It is a normal hex that spawns at the start. It doesn't actually um, curse survivors immediately. I think they, I think until you get one hook, they don't get notified. So that's nice. And it has two effects. Okay, the first one is very easy to forget, but it's actually quite meaningful. It makes all of the regression from a missed skill check greater by six percent. If a survivor misses a skill check, which doesn't happen very often in a normal match of good survivors, but still, if they miss a skill check, instead of losing 10% of a, on a gen, it will now be 16%. If they have Merciless Storm or Overcharge and they miss a skill check, it will be minus 6%. There is one killer that has add-ons to add on to this, Freddy. So you can have survivors basically make a pop happen. They can lose like 20% of a gen with add-ons, which is crazy, really. So... This effect is actually quite mean. If you have a build to make skill checks hard on Doctor or other characters, this is not something to sleep on. Uh, and the main effect of Lullaby, uh, which streamers like me hate, they make the skill checks give less of a warning for every hook. And it goes up to five tokens. So after the first hook, you will hear the bling, uh, and then skill check faster. And after five, the skill checks happen without a auditory warning, which means that if you're not paying attention to the screen at every, every given moment, it's hard. And things like overcharge, when you touch a gen, you're gonna get a difficult skill check without a warning, which is really, really awful. And if you miss it, minus 6%. Obviously, all of this goes away when it's cleansed. Now, there is one tiny problem. If you play a doctor game where you're ready to kick gens for 20 minutes, and go for a very long time. That's great, but guess what? In those long games, hexes typically get cleansed at some point. So this is a bill. This is a, a a hex that would really benefit long-term stalling builds. But it's a hex that can be cleansed. So should you pick this over another perk? It's hard to say. Overall, I think it's fun and it's decent. And on some Freddy builds, it can be really really fun if they miss one skill check and lose like a quarter of a gen. Um, just be aware of that fact and plan around it carefully and maybe protect it with other hexes. And it's an all right perk. Situational, of course. Next up is Chorophobia. Chorophobia doesn't come into play very often. Um, but when it does, it does have a very strong immune effect. Um, this perk activates around your turret radius constantly. And any survivor healing or healing someone else on your turret radius gets affected by a massive cut of 50% of their speed. That means that if they're healing someone else, which would normally take 16 seconds, it will take them now twice as much, 32. Oof, that's a big deal. Now, mind you, this does not affect recovery speed. If a survivor is on the ground, they recover at the same speed. That's, that's recovery. If they're being healed, though, that does take a bit longer. We'll get to that. So, yeah, sometimes a survivor will have already started healing, and then you'll walk into them, and your turret envelops them, and now the last bit of healing takes forever. And they also get faster skill checks, which are very easy to miss if you're not paying attention. So this is a great tool to interrupt healing, uh, especially if you have Mangled and Hemorrhage. It can make the healing very, very, very nasty, and make survivors kind of want to give up on it, especially if it's a small map. Now... Um, if you leave survivors on the ground and they need to get picked up by other teammates, this normally takes um, a little bit less than a second. Uh, I think it's 0.8 seconds from the top of my head. But if you have this perk, 
they cannot heal themselves on the ground quickly. So it's very easy for you to get hits on people trying to heal each other off the ground with this. So it's a great slugging perk to leave people on the ground and make it really difficult for them to get up. It also stacks, not, not additively, but it stacks uh, in some way with Sloppy Butcher and other Mangled. So it's pretty, pretty mean. Now, what are the main problems of this perk? If you have inner healing and you're here in a locker, you don't care. If you have adrenaline and you heal automatically, you don't care. If you have a second win uh, or a syringe and you heal over time, you don't care. This perk doesn't really stop that kind of healing. Sometimes a bit, but not too much. So survivors can just stay injured and not give an F. They can heal through those means. Or if you happen to play in a large map, which is like half of them, they can just walk a little bit out and they'll be fine. So this perk has a strong effect, but making it consistent and adapting it to all the ways survivors can heal can be a bit of a challenge. That way, for that reason, I don't super mega recommend it. If even if you're like, oh, but what if I bring a very strong big Terradius build on my Wesker or my Doctor? Guess what? You're probably gonna struggle to get those injuries anyway. By the time you got three people injured, they'll have done four injuries. They'll be looking forward to their adrenaline kicking in any second now. So it's a bit difficult. Next up, Grim Embrace, another perk with a very strong effect that is just really hard to trigger. One of the hardest perks to make use consistently. When you have hooked every single Swabber once, all of the gens get blocked for 40 seconds. Not regress, but blocked. And on top of this, if the obsession is um, still alive, and if they're around, their aura will be revealed to you for a few four seconds as well, no matter where they are, which is nice. If the survivor that you hooked last was the obsession, you will see their aura on the hook, which is extremely useful, like, oh my god, yeah, they're on the hook, yeah, I just hooked them there, yeah, they're not going anywhere, good. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you will see them else, uh, elsewhere on the map. That's not, that's not too bad, by the way, seeing a survivor from afar can be good on nurse, can be good on artist, and you definitely want to run this kind of perk on nurse or artist, because Guess what? You need a strong killer for this. You do not hook four survivors easily, especially if one of them hides and they, they're playing well. It's very difficult. And you can do it and still lose the game because then no one's dead. Um, the fact that all the gens get blocked for 40 seconds is incredible. That's amazing. But keep in mind, if you're hooking everyone once, at that point, they will probably be healing and licking their wounds. They don't mind too much. Most of the times I run this perk and I trigger it, survivors are either already losing or they're just in a recovery mode where they're just getting some heals, getting ready for the rescue. It doesn't hit as hard as some of the other blockage perks, sadly. So yeah, this is more of a flex perk that you put on to show everyone that you're very good, very fair, and that you like to hook all survivors. But it's not something that you put on with any expectation of the perk helping you out. It is incredibly difficult to get four hooks on four individual survivors if those survivors are playing smart. Um, it also opens you up to all kinds of counterplay. If you are hooking every single survivor once and they come and take hits without the record, you're screwed for some killers. If they have deliverance, your pressure is going to dissipate in the middle game at some point because you're letting them all trigger their deliverances and they're not even, you're hooking everyone, which means you're not actively focusing on getting anyone killed and they are unhooking themselves with deliverance. Pff, there's no way you hold gens then. So it's a very risky... Uh, perk with a payoff that's not even that great and a requirement that is really really difficult uh, Yeah, this perk probably needs a rework before it's really really worth running Next up is dark devotion whenever you injure you cause damage to the obsession either insta down or whatever whenever you actually damage them This perk triggers and it does something kind of funny. It makes your terror radius go away. You become undetectable completely stealthy and it makes the obsession have a 32 meter terror radius so it's kind of like you switch places um now um if you have perks to change the terror radius that doesn't affect it it will always be a 32 meter terror radius even if your killer has a 24 meter it doesn't matter 32 meter always and it doesn't go away um although if they are oblivious they won't hear it but it will still be there now uh the elephant in the room does this affect other perks yes it does if you have Chorophobia, Starstruck, Unnerving Presence, whatever, all of these perks are carried and work on the fake terror radius that is affected by is a, is a, is applied by Dark Devotion. However, just because you can do something, it doesn't mean you should. Think about it this way. If you injure the obsession and then you down someone else, and now the obsession has Starstruck on them, what's the point? What's the point? They're injured. 
what's the point? Like it's and oh, the, but they're very far away and they're applying it to other people. Yeah, but then those other people are far away from you, so they'll hire and you'll have no idea where they are and you will have no idea who has Starstruck. So even though it does have um um you you can make the doctor blast uh, happen across the map even though it does have some interesting synergies for the most part they don't really make any sense and they're not very competitive so my opinion don't bother how to actually use this perk the first idea is to hit the obsession and then immediately go for other people and this will mess with them hardcore um, the first time you hit the obsession and you leave them for the next few seconds, they're going to think that you're still chasing them and it's going to freak, uh, freak them out. Um, then they'll probably realize that you have this perk. And, and what you can do is actually mess with them again. If you hit the obsession and you leave, they'll be like, oh, okay, they leave me. But then if you get close to them from a different angle, they're not going to hear your tower radius. They're just going to hear the constant one. So you can, you can first trick, uh, trick the obsession uh, the first time and the second time you can actually leave them and come back to them and you'll often catch them off guard because they have no idea where you actually are if they don't see you and another thing that can happen is that you can leave the obsession on the ground and then go for someone else or hook them quickly and because they have a terror radius sometimes people that would go for the rescue are going to be a bit spooked but this depends on you know whether or not the survivors are aware and they're communicating and they correctly identify that this perk is in play um, so yeah fun little perk that can lead to some fun moments grab of the hook and so on but for the most part it's not all that crazy. It's one of those perks that can be easily called out by experienced players. Next up is Trail of Torment. Uh, this perk triggers when you kick a generator. The generator becomes colored yellow for survivors for some reason. And then you are undetectable until you either damage a survivor or someone touches a gen or the gen reaches zero. Now, this is a problem because... These three things can happen really, really quickly. If you kick a gen that's like at 4%, guess what? You do 2.5 damage in, in no time at all, the gen is at zero, and then the perk stops working, and it goes on cooldown. And if you injure a survivor, it goes away. If a survivor touches it, it goes away. And because survivors see the yellow color, after a second, they're going to put two and two together and figure out that it's this perk. They might get a bit confused and it's one of the other survivor perks that does a similar thing, but eventually they'll figure it out. The smarter the survivors, the faster they'll figure it out. So, this perk, on its own, on an average killer, is a horrible, horrible waste of time. There are a few things you can do with this perk, however, to make it a bit of a trap, a bit of a more engaging, interesting, multidimensional um, issue. The first one, run it with Dragon's Grip. If you run it with Dragon's Grip, you can kick a gen, and if they ignore it, well, the gen regresses and you're stealthy for a long time. And if they don't ignore it and they touch it, now they become insta down. And oops, that's a, that's a mistake. So that can work. Um, if they were injured, maybe not so much, but that can work. Uh, you can also run it with other uh, gen kick perks, like Nowhere to Hide or Oppression, to give them a bit of a distraction, and then um, you're more likely to make the undetectable stick. But even then, Trail Torment is a little bit weird. I think it's best used on killers that really benefit from closing the gap. If you put this on a cannibal and even once per game manage to sneak up on someone and get a free saw, that is incredibly, incredibly good and can make this worth the perk slot. Otherwise, really not so strong. Uh, next up is Blood Warden. This perk has two things it does. The first one is that if survivors are in the exit gate area, it shows you their aura. So it's a great way to see what if survivors are healing at the end, uh, at the exit gates, you know, it's it's useful. Maybe sometimes as a hunter, you can line up some shots or something like that. So it shows you the aura of people in the exit gates. And whenever the endgame collapse has triggered and the exit gates are open, if you hook a survivor, the exit gets both of them get blocked for one minute. Now, this sounds pretty amazing, and in the right situation, it can be. If the exit, if the engine collapse is close to reaching zero, and you hook one guy, you could kill three other people or all of four of them really to the timer, which is really funny and has happened countless, countless times. But it runs into a major issue. Most of the times, if survivors are not going to go for the rescue, they're just going to leave before you uh before you hook sometimes survivors don't want the timer to start too prematurely and they don't they don't want the timer to put more pressure on them than necessary so they do this very common strategy of 99ing um the exigates they leave them almost finished when you get the hook and they're ready and they heal then they trigger it 
So Subarus have a very natural um, inclination to 99 gates. Even I, I run a lot of random perk streaks and random perk challenges, and I have this perk oftentimes in my loadouts. And even solo players that are clueless, oftentimes just 99 the gates until you get a hook. And then they open it, and they time it afterwards to avoid this perk, even though it's not that common. It's, it takes so little effort to counter this perk that most survivors do it without thinking. And for that reason, you cannot really rely on this perk. Even though the potential outcome and the potential payoff is enormous, you really do need survivors to be a bit stupid. And most survivors are not stupid, and they'll check for this, and if it's there and you time it pro um, properly, they will often just outweigh the whole 60 seconds if it's possible. Oh, but what if I outplay them a lot? If you outplay them a lot, other perks would probably do the job better. It's just that simple. Not bad though, fun perk though, definitely fun. Uh, Coup de Grasse has a big, big effect. It makes your launch 80% longer. You can begin to do your attack, which makes you very, very fast, and it takes it 80% longer. Basically, it makes it double. If, if Cool the Grass was on all the time, this perk would be insane. It would make every loop basically unplayable for survivors. <laughs> so, yeah, that's pretty significant. However, you only get up to five of them, and you only get them when a gen gets done. So, essentially, whenever a gen pops, you get one cool token. And then the next launch that you do, you will have a longer launch and you can use it. Now, let's talk about some extremely annoying things about this perk. If you're, if you're lunging and during the middle of the launch, a gen gets done, you lose it. You lose it straight up. You lose it. You don't even benefit from it probably, but you still lose it, which is extremely annoying. Um, moreover, if you do a launch that is not longer than normal, even a tiny launch, the game still considers that an extra long launch and you lose a token. So you could have a you could have three gens get done immediately and you could waste two tokens immediately over nothing and get no benefit from it. Trying to play around this is so annoying and it almost not quite, it's still worth the personal sometimes, but it almost counters itself in that it makes you do a lot of um unnatural place to try to preserve the stacks so yeah it's a perk that makes you stronger in chase but when you lose gens and when you're losing gens you're already losing the game so is that something you want to use yeah sometimes it can be okay believe it or not having that little bit of extra help in chase near the end game can help you seal the deal on a very important chase now in my opinion, this is not a perk you want to give to the average killer. You definitely want to run deadlock and other endgame stuff so that you don't lose too many gens at once and then go on to lose the game immediately. Uh, but there are a few killers where this perk is quite useful. Uh, on Demogorgon, this perk is nice. Uh, Demogorgon deals with straight tiles really well, where if you go to like a car that's really straight, he can just catch you. But then the rocks that are round, he struggles with those because he cannot he cannot shred around corners so easily, right? Um, so that, so this covers that weakness really, really well. A similar deal uh, happens with Wesker. I made a Coup de Grass Wesker video if you want to see that in action. And it can also occasionally be nice on Clown. I also made a video covering about uh, talking about uh, Clown and how uh, he can preserve stacks and use them. So there are a few killers where if you're ready to use this, it's it can be occasionally all right, but it's always a perk that feels like it's really held back by its own trigger uh, trigger condition. So, I really wish I could tell you it was a little bit better than this, but it's really not. Next up is unnerving presence. Unnerving presence uh, triggers when any survivor is inside your turret radius, and they do things. Um, such as healing or generators. They will get a red indicator, so they know they're being affected by the perk. They will get skill checks more often. This is technically a bad thing for you, because if they're very good at hidden skill checks, that means that they're more likely to get, you know, that extra percentage of progress. So that's bad. Having this perk on an average bill just like that, that would downright be bad. Uh, if you pardon me and you don't mind hearing a bit of an anecdote, I once um, had a friend... Um, do skill checks to see how many they would hit on average and when I had this perk just this perk on its own They got better at doing skill checks. What? Yeah, making the skill checks better uh, Smaller, which is what this perk does it actually somehow affected their focus in a way that make them better 
So this perk doesn't really make the skill checks any harder on its own. It's really not that big of a deal. They happen more frequently and they have a smaller zone, but they're not harder to hit. So the perk, in my opinion, is a complete waste of time. However, however, the skill checks that are already a little bit difficult, they become very hard with this. So if you have this perk and Chorophobia, hitting skill checks is downright impossible when healing. If you have this perk with Overcharge, hitting that Overcharge is very difficult. If you have Decisive, unfortunately, that Decisive skill check is not affected by this perk, so that doesn't change it. Um, but other things like Merciless Storm, even normal killers with Merciless Storm is really hard to hit it, and it's very reliable um, that Merciless Storm will be missed by survivors. On Doctor in particular, it's just downright impossible to do Merciless with this perk. Uh, if you have uh, Hunter's Lullaby and other skill checks uh, add-ons like on, on the Skull Merchant, really, really diabolical stuff. So on those builds, I reckon this perk has a very niche use and you could toy with it. I've had some success running it, um, but it needs to be very specific builds. And then it's all right. Otherwise, definitely not worth the perk slot. Uh -huh. Trickster. Uh, did I say Trickster? Whispers. Sounds close enough. Uh, whispers. <laughs> uh, a very unique perk that I also think I covered in a video recently, if you want to if you wanna watch it. Um, I explained in that video and, and use some visual. This is a perk that you would really benefit from seeing it visually. Uh, Old Tofu made a guide some time ago. And if you look up um, Whispers or Starbo or Whispers or Tofu, if you watch that visually, I think it will help you a bit more. But I'll try to explain it regardless. So this perk creates a bubble around your character uh, with a radius of 32 meters. And if a survivor is within this bubble, the perk will turn on and will start to do little little whispering noises if a survivor is away then it turns off if multiple survivors are on it doesn't matter how many there are it will be on off on off um this counts all survivors on the ground um uh, up and standing on the hook in a locker any survivor gets counted unless they are dead disconnected or sacrificed or or out of the exit gate somehow so if the survivor is alive they will be counted um, so essentially what you can do with this perk is walk towards a, an area of the map and the moment it turns on, you now have a rough idea of how far the survivor is ahead of you and which direction as well. If you're checking an area looking for someone that you think is there and the perk goes off, then you have 100% knowledge that no one is around you. You don't need to waste your time. You can go back until it's on and then resume your searches. So this is a bit of an... Uh, by the way, this perk is completely uncounterable. It doesn't really... You cannot avoid it with, distor with distortion or any stealth perk. So that's really, really nice. It's very reliable. And as you can imagine, in the endgame scenarios where it's one guy that needs to open the gate, 1v1, you're going to lose. This, all the survivor needs to do... All the killer needs to do is walk gate to gate. And whatever whispers turns on, they just stay there. They just stay there and, and stay on, on that on that gate until the survivor shows up. And if it's off, then they go to the other one. And, and it's basically impossible to do it because it covers so much ground, right? So in the 1v1, this perk is godlike. In the early game, it can be useful. In the mid game on some large maps, it can also be occasionally useful. The problem is that it's not too specific. It's hard to use for beginners. And other perks, such as Discordance, Tinkerer, yada yada, are just so much more direct. And if you want to have help in the early game, Lethal Pursuer is such a comfy, nice perk that also has the benefit of extending other auras. So essentially, this is a perk that is nice and that you can learn to use to a, to a nice degree and be somewhat reliably good with. But there's other perks that are just simpler and better. So it kind of gets outflanked and outclassed by those, and hence um, is a perk that is uh, relatively low rated. Uh, next up, we have Zanshin Tactics from the Oni. Now, this is a very similar perk to Windows of Opportunity for Survivor. Windows of Opportunity for Survivor um, is very, very popular because it lets survivors see the windows, the pallets, the breakable walls even, that are all around them so that they know where to run. Now, if this is, and it was very highly rated in my tier list too, if you watch my previous video. So if that perk is really good for survivor, why is it not very good for killer? Why is Zanshin Tactic Tactics one of the lower rated perks. Well, it's as simple as if survivors know where the pallets are and where all the strong stuff is in a map, they can go and use it against you. 
But if you know where the pallets are, that doesn't mean anything. They can still use it against you. Sometimes this perk will let you know that you have a window into a window, into a pallet, into a window, into a double window, into a little ramp that goes up to heaven. And what's the matter? You can't really do anything about it. Just because it's there and you see it doesn't mean you can avoid it. It's not like you can tip the survivor 20 bucks and ask them to go loop you elsewhere. Not yet, so... This perk is not as useful as the survivor counterpart. Also, as a killer, you already know which pallets you have broken. So it's not like survivors where they don't know if a pallet's gone and so on. That being said, after talking smack about this perk, let me tell you why it's actually quite decent. Even though I just said that you as a killer know which pallets you've broken, that's not really true, is it? How many times do you forget about pallets that you've broken? I personally, at least once every now and again, I go to a survivor, they go around a corner, and I swing at them thinking that they have a pallet, and then I see that I already broke that pallet, and I go, huh, ooh, yeah, right, oops, and that was a waste, and I missed a hit, because I'm stupid. With this perk, that never happened. Um, it's also a very comfy perk for killers that have a chainsaw, and that are good at zoning. If you chase a survivor, and they're going around the corner, you might not immediately know if they have a pallet or not, and you don't know what's the right play. But if you can see with this perk that they don't have any safety, then you'll know that you can actually take your time to use your power and you're going to get it down. Um, it's really, really good on Cannibal and Billy. It's very decent on Premium Head and Artist. Because these killers can hit you through walls, they can actually line up birds and punishment hits through jungle gyms and sometimes do like an x-ray hit where they cover multiple things at once and with this perk they can do it very easily and seeing perfectly where exactly they're aiming towards so that's pretty nice uh, there's also been uh, <laughs> um, a very dedicated clown player that found out that this perk is really good on clown and i agree it's really nice on clown because if you're if you're a very forward thinker you can already plan ahead your yellow bottles ahead of time and see exactly how you're going to cut off survivors before they make it to the next point of safety and you can choke out their options really really quickly so that's really nice and overall believe it or not if you're a beginner this is one of these perks that unlike all of the other ones that we've talked about recently if you put it on it's going to help you most of the games it's not bad and it can help you learn structures and identify what you see very very quickly now that being said there are some maps such as um, dead dog saloon that have extremely rigid and consistent RNG. The windows and the pallets, they're all in the same spot, and you seeing them there doesn't really change the hell a, a bloody thing. They're almost always there. So in those maps, this perk will be a little bit redundant. And everyone else, it's information. Information doesn't always, you know, it doesn't kill survivors on its own. You need to really learn to do what you must with it. Next up, we have Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden lets you open chests, oh sorry, <laughs> imagine, it lets you open lockers 50%, no wait, what's the speed of it, let me double check, yeah, it's 50% faster, now, this is a important distinction, 50% faster doesn't mean that, that you do it twice as fast, that would be 100% faster, this is 100%, this is 50% extra speed, and the way the formula works is that, an extra 50% in speed means that you do it one third quicker. This is important because on killers that need to reload on lockers, you will now reload one third faster. This is nice on Huntress and it's nice on Trickster, but please, please be warned, even though this perk feels really comfortable on those killers, it's not the best perk in the world for them. If you're constantly dropping chase to reload, I don't think that's incredible. It sometimes would benefit you more to have um, add-ons to help you reload less frequently, like extra hatches, extra knives. So please don't run this perk on them automatically just because it feels good. It might end up hurting your chases and your performance overall. But obviously it is, uh, it is a decent pick on those killers because it helps with the reload. Um, Swabbers coming out of a locker, any locker will scream and will also be insta-downable. Now, there are a few killers that can take advantage of this. Um, some people like to use this on artists because people go into lockers. I don't think she's the best at catching up, but, you know, you run it. Eventually, you'll get some use out of it. Uh, personally, I quite like running it on Doctor 
Doctor um, is a character that puts survivors into madness, which slows down people, and they go into lockers to try to avoid it. And when they do, guess what? You're going to find out, and bam, you're going to be able to insert on them. Or at least they'll have to be really, really careful. On killers like Cannibal, people sometimes hop into lockers, and it might be an idea to, to, to do this. Personally, I don't think you have to if you know how to play those killers properly, but it is an idea as well. Um, but yeah, other than that, is this perk amazing on anyone? Nah, you could run it with barbecue to make sure that you catch people that are trying to dodge barbecue that go into lockers, but people can also dodge barbecue by just having distortion off the record. So this is hardly the most amazing thing in the world. It will occasionally destroy teams that have, um, that have head-on, uh, that can no longer hit you with a, with a head-on stun and then run you for a while. So yeah, it can, it can be a bit of a bully... <laughs> a bullying tool for teams that try to play around lockers and stuff, but those are not too f too common. They're far and in between, and even those teams are pretty pleasant compared to some others, so it's not something you have to look out too much. I don't think it's just... It's a very niche perk that I don't think is all that strong. One nice use of this perk is to run it with Darkness Revealed. If you have this and Darkness Revealed, you can reload or open a locker in like a second, very, very fast, and immediately see people around the map, which is pretty comfy and pretty nice, and I do like it on a variety of killers. So that's my favorite combo with it. Oh, sorry, I think my nose is a bit stuffed. Uh, next up is Lightborn. This perk makes you completely immune to all blinds. Uh, firecrackers do not work. Uh, flashlights do not work. If you get hit by a blast mine, you will be stunned, but the, the visual thing of blinding you will not be there. You will still see it around you. And for some people, this is very comforting. Some people see three flashlights and they're like, oh, I'm going to get flashy save and it's going to be all, I'm going to be looking at the ground all the time. It's going to be, my eyes are going to be burning. If you are bothered by those players, I think eventually you will grow to appreciate them because those players are not being as efficient as they could be. But if you're bothered by those players, then Lightborn is probably your favorite perk. You put it on, you ruin their day, and they probably try to do saves and stuff and end up messing up, and then they end up dying. Uh, also, anytime a survivor tries to blind you, you will see their aura for a lengthy amount of time. And for some killers, that little bit of aura read is very helpful. So that's nice as well. That's it. That's what it does. Um, you put it on when you see a bunch of flashies and you try to outplay them. Personally, I do think that you would still be better off trying to outplay them naturally. We've talked about other perks like Infectious Fright to help you find people around you, Flood Favor to prevent pilot saves and stuff. You would be better off with perks like that, personally. But if it's your cup of tea, then use Lightburn. No one's stopping you. <clears throat> Next up. We have Shattered Hope. This is perhaps one of the only perks in the game, maybe the only perk in the game, where if survivors don't bring certain perks, the perk does nothing. Even Lightborn? Lightborn only works if they have a flashlight, right? But even if they don't have a flashlight, they might find one in a chest. But this is a perk that only works if survivors have boons. If survivors have boons, you can walk up to the boons, and when you destroy them, um, the, the, the totem itself will explode, and then you can use Pentimental on it. Uh, also, the people around you will be visible. You will, you will have, like, a auto reveal around you, which is kind of nice in some small maps. It can be quite nice. So, what is the best case scenario? If you play against four Michaelas, and they're all setting up boons everywhere, and you have this perk on Pentimental, you can break boons and then simultaneously apply Pentimental, which is a massive, because it's a broken totem, right? It's a massive, massive slowdown. But since the nerf of Circle of Healing, survivors are now more than ever relying on Adrenaline for healing self-healing medkits and syringes, and some of them even staying injured with made for this. So right now, there are very few boons, very few boons. And bringing a perk that might only work when they are there, that's it, this is it's just so risky. Why would you do that? There's really no reason to, unless you are deeply scarred and deeply, uh, uh, deeply traumatized by one particular boon type, and you wanna deal with them if they show up. Uh, I already explained what they do, uh, what this perk does, and there really is not much else to it. That's all there is to it. Not very good in the current meta. We'll see someday if Voons make a bit of a comeback. 
Next up is Terminus. Terminus takes every survivor that is injured in the end game, whenever the last gen is popped, and if they are injured, they become broken and are permanently unable to heal forever until the exit gates are open. When the exit gates are open, then the perk lingers for another 30 seconds and then survivors can heal again, which means that in practical terms, they're not going to get their adrenaline if they were injured and they will be injured for the entire end game and one minute after the exit gates get open. This does push survivors to open exit gates very aggressively, which means that if you have, um, if you have Blood Warden, this is a great way to persuade them into opening an exit gate for you. But it does have its it does have its issues. Um, the first one that I think it's worth commenting it's it's maybe an afterthought, so completely forget about it. I have heard that depending on the ping, this perk might not work. If you play on a certain ping, I've heard that some people might get adrenaline triggering before this perk works. But that's a bit of a rumor. I don't know if it's confirmed. It definitely was bugged at some point. Right now, it's not anymore. But why is this perk why is this perk so low? Adrenaline, if you watch my survivor tier list, is easily the best or one of the best survivor perks in the game. Shouldn't this perk help to counter it? If you have four injured people, adrenaline makes them all healthy, right? So that should be pretty good. Well, the answer is no, it's just not enough. Adrenaline just does too much. And there's too many alternatives to adrenaline. And this perk doesn't cover all of them. Let's talk about some situations, right? If survivors are on the ground, adrenaline still heals them. So this perk doesn't stop them. If you are chasing a survivor, adrenaline doesn't heal, but it does give them a massive speed boost. So them being injured doesn't matter nearly as much because you're still going to take a long time to catch up to them. If you chase a survivor that has made for this and hope or just hope alone, the fact that they're injured doesn't matter. They are very hard to catch depending on the killer that you're playing. So, do you really want to run one of your perks for maybe countering some of them? Sometimes, not even fully. Just not that many situations. However, there are a few killers where this perk is actually quite a banger. In my opinion, the best one is Plague. With Plague, survivors are already naturally broken because they are infected. And what they typically do in the endgame is to drink from a pool of devotion, the fountains. And then they get their health back and then they open the gates. And it's like getting it's like a getting a, it's like getting a natural adrenaline. But this perk will stop them. When they cleanse from a fountain, they will still be broken. Not infected, but broken anyway. So with this perk, if you have three people injured by your infection, they will all start to cleanse. Well, however they can, they will give you your powers. And then guess what? They will still be broken, so you can still destroy them in one hit with your red puke because you're a strong killer. You could also run this on some other killer that can mop up injured survivors quickly, like, uh, for example, uh, for example, twins. If you have twins and you have a few people injured, if you prevent three of them from healing with adrenaline, that is a big deal, even if they have hope, even if they have made for this, because well, guess what? Victor is 150. So on a few killers that have unique abilities to keep people injured in the endgame, Sure, this perk can be all right. Uh, beyond them, I wouldn't really recommend it. Next, we have a perk that is simple and weird. It's called Genetic Limits. It's from the Singularity. And it makes it so that whenever a survivor finishes healing themselves or somebody else in any way at all, that survivor that did the healing action gets exhausted for 32 seconds. Uh, of course, if the survivor keeps running, the 32 seconds pauses, so a survivor basically needs to be on a gen or sitting or walking somewhere for a whole 30 seconds. And if the gen has Fearmonger, this is paused, so they'll be exhausted forever. This is super weird. It's super, super weird. Like, why is this perk a thing? Who in... Like, it's so difficult as a killer to know who did what. How would you know that someone's exhausted? It's extremely bizarre. In my opinion, the only reason this perk exists is to counter the very common and popular mate for this. So if you hate the perk made for this that makes survivors 3% faster and gives them the endurance, then I guess you can run this and hope, hope that they mess up a little bit and that you counter it half the time. Very similar to Terminus, it aims to defeat a meta perk on the survivor, but 
it might not be there and even if it is you might not counter it entirely so yeah why would you ever do that very strange perk what if survivors don't run any exhaustion perks then you're looking like an absolute clown and an absolute buffoon not very good Next up, we have another exhaustion perk, but this one makes a little bit more sense. It's called Blood Echo. Whenever you hook a survivor, all other survivors that are injured become exhausted and they become hemorrhagic as well. That last part is kind of nice because if they were about to finish a heal, now you can interrupt them and they lose the progress. However, and, and, the, and the exhaustion is a long time as well. It's a, it's a hefty number as well. However... This is just difficult. There's not that many killers where you're going to injure a bunch of people and then hook one of them before the other ones have healed. Legion comes to mind and maybe a couple others comes to mind, but this perk is just... It's just hard. It's just hard to use. And essentially, you're trying to apply hemorrhage to people. If you're playing Legion, they might not even want to heal. They might not even care. And you're giving them an exhaustion... But who knows, maybe they don't have any exhaustion perks. So it is a perk to counter something that you don't know exactly how much of it you're dealing with. And if you're countering it successfully, you don't really know about it. You don't really know, oh yeah, this David had that hard, but he can't use it. Um, in some situations, it will become very clear to you that a survivor is affected by this perk and that will give you a bit of peace of mind. So if, you, if, if everyone is injured and you hooked one of them and then you chase a couple people for the next few seconds, you know that they won't be able to use a sprint burst or a dead heart or whatever. But this is hardly worth the perk slot for the most part. Next up is Leverage. Leverage uh, triggers every time you hook someone. Every time you hook someone for the next 30 seconds, I believe, I believe it's 30 seconds, uh, all the healing actions are 5% slower. And on the second hook, it's 10%. And on the next hook, it's 15%. And on the next hook, it's 20%. And it keeps getting higher and higher and higher. Now, obviously, there's only a finite amount of survivors and hooks. At one point, if you've out of the hook 10 of them, well, there's no one left to even heal anymore. So, of course, like, the perk has its own limit. Uh, but there's two problems. The first one that that is very apparent at the start is that a 5% slower heal is absolutely nothing. A normal heal takes 16 seconds. Let's say they hit some skill checks. Let's round it down to 15 seconds. So 5% of that is like, what, like less than a second? Like, it's not a big deal. So the first two or three hooks of this perk, they're barely going to feel it. It's true that if you run another perk like Sloppy Butcher to apply Mangold, now it's going to stack. And then that does become a little bit nastier. But even then, it's the other perk that's doing the heavy lifting. Now... Later on, when you've already got many hooks, it's true, once it gets to 20, 30%, that is a bit... If you have Sloppy Butcher and 20% slower healing, that is pretty significant. However, it's only for 30 seconds. So Avers can just hide, do gens, postpone it a little bit, maybe work towards getting inner healing or adrenaline or some other instant background healing like uh, syringes. So there's so many ways to outplay a time debuff that it makes this perk really not that good. The killers that hook a lot of survivors and that can really make this perk shine, guess what? They make all the other perks above it that we talked about much, much better. So yeah, it's a bit awkward and it's hard to say how they could really buff it, but right now it's just not that good. Now we have a fire up. Fire up um, is a little buff to your... It gives you a 4% buff to a bunch of different speeds every time a gen gets done. And this is stackable. If a gen gets done, it's 4%. If a two gens get done, it's 8%. Mm -mm, all the way up to 20%. In particular, it, it, it can make you up to 20% faster at breaking pallets and generators and walls. Not bad. Vaulting, definitely, definitely noticeable. Picking up survivors, which is one of the only things that can do that, and dropping survivors as well. And I think that's it. So that's pretty nice. That's pretty nice. If you have one of those games where, you, where you're really, really fighting hard in the middle and late game, this perk can have its occasional moment of glory. The faster pickup sometimes can throw survivors off and can make them miss their flashy timing and their pallet rescue timing. Uh, not super reliable, but it can be, it can be something that can happen. 
flashlights are definitely a lot easier nowadays so they're not gonna miss it um like like they used to with this perk but it has the same issues as brutal strength the effect is just not that big and it happens at a time when you're already looking to lose the game you should have other perks to help you fight gens such as eruption such as deadlock to help you stall in the mid game rather than this it does stack with Myers's faster vault speed and some other out of the innate faster things but it's another perks of course but it's just other than the gimmick the it's hard to justify the perks slot the effect is just too damn small for what it does thunderphobia is an interesting perk it is an extremely easy to use perk, so that's one of the things it's got going for it. Whenever you injure one survivor, all survivors are slower at doing gens, at doing, that's repairs, at doing totems, and also at sabotaging. Now, the sabotaging and the totems, I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, back when this perk was a bit stronger, you would occasionally have people try to sabo and, and, and miss by a little bit. Um, but the gem part is the more important one, because even a small percentage on a 90 second repair, it, it gets up to quite a bit. Uh, however, this only gets worse and worse as the survivors get injured. If only one survivor is injured, it's 2%, then it's 4 then it's 6 and then if you injure all survivors, then they all get slapped by a very, very severe 20% slower gens. So essentially, this is a perk that, in my opinion, does absolutely nothing it makes the red bar which is very psychologically damaging but more than that it does nothing for the first couple injuries however if survivors all stay injured and then they all get injured all four of them then doing gents becomes rough especially if they're also dealing with other perks so it's a perk that kind of convinces survivors to maybe have one person healthy at all times guess what survivors already do that for the most part um, you might be thinking, oh, but what if I run this on Legion and or Plague? Killers that are naturally good at keeping survivors injured. On Legion, I don't think it's that big of a deal. If you're getting four people injured and they're not out healing you, other perks would probably do more damage. Uh, play with your food could be really interesting to get everybody injured and now actually be good at dealing the, the finishing blow on someone and downing them, for example, but there could be plenty of other perks. And Plague would benefit so much more from information perks and sometimes even chase perks like Bamboozle or, or Crowd Control, whatever, to again seal the deal. So on these killers, you could you could find a variety of, of, of fourth perks to complement your build rather than Thana, which is a really boring, predictable perk that does so little in terms of numbers. It is true that on the Plague case, it might convince survivors to to cleanse um uh, and and give you your power but if you want to get your power really badly you have at least two or three add-ons that can do that and you can also pressure survivors to such a degree that they have to cleanse and that would probably be better and more reliable so don't even recommend it on those killers but if you must i guess go ahead next up we have scorch hook monsters shine this is the weakest of the scorch hooks it does almost nothing um monster shrine makes the basement have four extra scorch hooks now these scorch hooks will apply monster shrine and if you run other things like pain rest, they will also apply pain rest. so already the best thing that um monster shrine does is give you extra hooks in the basement for pain rest. so if you have pain rest and floods and monsters it's a bit of a kill but I mean, you can, then your basement will be four Scorch Hooks, which is really, really cool and really, really useful in some situations. But on its own, this perk is very, very mild. Um, when a survivor gets hook on a Scorch Hook, basement or not, um, you will have a total, obviously, four in basement, four outside. They will get a red indicator that they have it, so they're going to be warned that something is wrong. And if you leave the vicinity, they will die on the hook a little bit sooner. How much sooner? Not very. It's 10%, I think. Now, no, 20%. Yeah, now you might think, oh, 20% sounds really good. 20% 20 uh, 20 of 60 seconds is 12? No, that's not how the formula works. It's actually 10 seconds less. 10 seconds. And remember, 
it only works when you step away from the hook from a distance. So since that will take you a few seconds, it's only going to make them die eight seconds sooner. At that point, if they have reassurance, it doesn't matter. They can just rescue. So this perk doesn't really do anything. You put it on and if a team is struggling, yeah, they might be a bit late and let their teammates hit stage two. But there's so many other perks that would be better. So it's really not that great. It doesn't really achieve all that much and it's really risky and it tells a survivor. So if they're on comms, they're going to tell each other, hey, I'm dying a bit sooner, maybe show up five seconds sooner and we'll be fine. So very, very mediocre perk on its own. But hey, if you want to pair with other uh, Scorches, you can make them uh, happen in basement, which I guess is fine. Next up, we have Cal of Brine. When you kick a generator, this generator regresses normally at a 100% speed. In order for a generator to regress as fast as a survivor um, is, um, is, would normally do it on their own, they would need to regress at 400%. So this perk makes it go from 100 to 125. That is pathetic. That is pathetic. And it only lasts for one minute after you kick a gen. So that means that if you have two gens, simultaneous gens, okay? and you kick one and kick the other at the same time, after one minute, the gen with Call O'Brien will have regressed a total of three extra seconds. A little over three seconds. Do you honestly think that you're going to kick a gen for one whole minute without anyone touching it? And even if you do, do you think that three seconds is worth it? At that point, honestly, even Thana sounds like a good idea. So this is awful absolutely horrendous value. Now, the other thing the perk does is a bit more worth the perk slot. If a survivor gets on a gen and hits certain skill checks, you will be... Uh, if they don't hit great skill checks, I think, you will be warned. So it gives you an indicator that someone has gone back. You could also run surveillance for that, but hey, and it would be 100% reliable as opposed to only when they hit a skill check, but hey, if you want to, you can do that. So yeah, very weak perk with a very tiny effect that can sometimes help you keep track. But please do not run this on a gen kick build. It's barely worth the perk slot, in my opinion, after the big nerf it received a long time ago, or recently rather. Uh, coming up is Nemesis. Uh, Nemesis uh, makes it so that if, another, if a survivor that is not the obsession stuns you in any way, they become the new obsession. Um, this means that pallet stuns, decisive strike, well, decisive strike would make them the new obsession anyway, um, head-on stuns, uh, pallet, uh, rescues, yeah, um, blast mine as well, I believe. Yeah, anything that would stun you will make that person the new obsession. Also, Anytime someone becomes the new obsession, either by this perk or anything else, they become oblivious for a while. So if someone stuns you, they become oblivious. If someone becomes the obsession through decisive or through for the people or through furtive chase, they also become oblivious. So that's kind of cute, believe it or not. 60 seconds of obliviousness can mess with survivors. I've gotten some hits. I remember I made a video some time ago where I let a streamer uh, stun me and then I went around and <laughs> I pulled them out of a gen. It was a really fun time. But these are very, very far and in between situations. For the most part, if you're, if you're getting stunned by someone, they're paying attention to you. Them not hearing your turret videos is not going to be a big deal. And if they're on comms, they're just going to call you out and it's not going to be a big deal. So... Hardly the most important thing. The real value of this perk comes from the fact that it gives you control and allows you to make up obsessions on the go. You no longer need to find the obsession. Sometimes you can now make the obsession appear in front of you. The main goal or the, the main value of this is for Rancor. So you can now instant out and kill them. And also for play with your food. You can chase a survivor, they stun you, you cloak or whatever, bang, now you have played your food on that person. So, Nemesis and played your food. I think it's a bit of a complicated combo for two perk slots, but it can be used. So, if that's something you like, you can do that as well. If you want to go crazy, you could run Furtive Chase, make your choice, and this perk. And then when the obsession gets unhooked, the new survivor will become the obsession. When they become the new obsession, they will become oblivious. When... Um, 
Oh, oh, by the way, I forgot to say, when they become the obsession, you see their aura. That's maybe the best perk, the best thing about Nemesis for four seconds. And then they become insidonable. You could also do that with, you know, you could also use make your choice and and just floods of rage. But still, uh, that's nice. Uh, by the way, seeing the aura of the person that stuns you is actually kind of nice on some killers, especially with enduring. You can line up shots and do some nasty things. So seeing the aura of the stunner is actually not too bad. It also happens if you get blinded, by the way. I forgot to say, but that doesn't mind. It doesn't matter a whole lot. It's still pretty much the, the same deal. Uh, following up is Septic Touch. Septic Touch is a perk that affects any survivor healing within your terror radius. They become exhausted for a few seconds. And then when they stop, it goes away after a few seconds. Uh, absolutely unremarkable perk. Uh, completely, completely awful. I would have said that this had a very niche use some time ago. Some time ago, back when Deadheart was very common, you could run this perk with nurses, and if you ever caught a survivor healing, you knew that they were affected by your terror radius, and you could chase them, and you didn't have to worry about Deadheart. Nowadays, believe it or not, this perk is slightly more useful, because there's also a new perk called Made for This, that does all kinds of nasty things if you are uh, injured and not exhausted. It also helps you to tank hits when you heal other people, um, finish healing them, and it, you, can, you can tank a hit for free. With this perk, you completely stop that. However, the question remains, do you want to run two or three perks to maybe, possibly, perhaps counter a meta perk? Uh, for the most part, the answer to that question is no. So, Septic Touch is a bit of a sad perk that doesn't have too much going for it. Very, very strangely designed. Next up is Claustrophobia, uh, also used to be called Cruel Limits. Uh, this perk triggers when a generator is completed. It takes all the window vault locations around it and it blocks them for a 30 second period, I believe. This can be sometimes amazing. If you pair this with Tinkerer and maybe Deadlock to make sure that not too many gens pop at once, it can sometimes be surprisingly decent, especially uh, on killers that can catch people off guard and really, really mess with them uh, if they can use windows. I'm thinking particularly cannibal and other chance of killer types. Now, um, this could be something like the gem pops in front of your face and they try to go for a window, like on the game, that one window that's elevated and they can't take it. It can occasionally mess with survivors, but keep in mind, the moment they see it once, they're gonna see it coming uh, from that moment on. It doesn't stop pallets. Uh, many survivors will just have a spring burst ready. They'll just they'll just sprint right off even if they don't have a window you might not be able to do that much like like sometimes the gens will be done away from you on very big maps sometimes if you don't have deadlock two gens will pop at once and you won't really get value i have seen this perk sometimes give amazing value but more often than not it will just go without any glory it will just block windows and no one cares about and it will be a very minor inconvenience for the survivors that you're playing against Uh, moving on, we have Overwhelming Presence. This is a this is a perk with a fairly strong effect. Whenever you are uh, near survivors and they are inside your terror radius, any item usage that they do will be duplicated um, in terms of consumption. That means that if they had a medkit that would save them quite a bit of time and heal them twice, they will only get one heal out of it. Maybe maybe nothing if, they, if they've already wasted it. If they had a toolbox that would save them 20 seconds, it will only save them 10 seconds. It will run out really, really quickly. That sounds amazing until you realize that there's a lot of items that don't really have charges, like the firecrackers. If flashlights get a few less charges, it's not a big deal. They can still get a good few flashy saves out of you. Toolboxes will mostly be used far away from you at the start of the game, and you can't really stop them. Uh, and if they're used for sabotage, they don't consume that many charges, so it's not going to stop them. It doesn't make them any slower. And medkits, yeah, this is good for dealing with medkits, but if you get a bit unlucky, it might not be enough. And if they have syringes, and they realize, oh, well, I can't get a heal, they're just going to pluck their syringes and heal uh, over time. So this perk, again, does something to counter something that should be good, 
but you don't know how much it's working. It can still be countered. And it's the same story as all the other perks we've been talking about recently. It just doesn't do enough and you have no idea how much it's working. You just put it on and hope. And it's not a good thing that you hope. So I cannot recommend that on almost any build because it's just too far out of your control. Up next, we have Spies from the Shadows. And a lot of people swear by this perk and honestly, I think overrated slightly. It is true that it does warn you about survivors around you and on stealth killers in particular, uh, this perk is nice because survivors, uh, this perk only works within a certain radius and it warns you when birds are being disturbed. But if survivors hear your turret radius and they know you're around, they're gonna be very wary, they're gonna be very aware and they won't trigger birds easily. However, if you're a stealth killer, they will be less aware of your exact location. You might get really close, and this perk might actually reveal survivors around you uh, a bit more frequently. Um, the only way to really counter this perk is to have Calm Spirit, which is a very unpopular perk. So, yeah, it's basically guaranteed to work. However, let's talk about the problems. This perk, for the most part, is utterly outclassed by other actually reliable information perks. The moment you unlock those perks, this perk should disappear. Oh, this is really good on Ghost Fist. You know what else is good on Ghost Fist? Literally any other info perk we've talked about today. Nurses, Discordance, Barbecue, Whispers. Run anything like that instead of this perk. You will have far more reliable results. Uh, what this perk ends up doing many times is warning you about survivors that are already in front of you, that you're already chasing. Uh, it can be okay on the spirit because when she's using her power, you know, you don't really see birds and these notifications still work unlike other auto reading that doesn't work on spirit. So that's nice. Uh, and on on occasion, it can tip you off to a bird that you might you might have not seen. Watch out, however, because this perk is also a bit a bit of a liar. Sometimes it will show you birds be alerted on different floors. Survivors sometimes trigger birds on different floors and different parts, and it can sometimes be a bit misleading. So be sure that you understand. See, this is a perk that should be good for beginners, but it can actually mess with them. So uh, that's why I'm a bit reluctant to recommending it, and I would tell you to exercise caution when you run it. However, for the most part, it's a fairly inoffensive perk, the inoffensive harmless perk that you can put on and get some benefit out of it's it's definitely not worse than nothing it's not it's not a terrible perk or anything uh next up uh let me line that well is deathbound deathbound triggers when a survivor heals another survivor either from dying to up or from injured to healthy um the survivor that finishes the action or survivors that finish the action will be slapped by a... They will scream first and reveal their location. And if then these survivors split up from each other, they will become oblivious for, I believe, a minute. So, yeah. This is already a problem. There is a lot of survivors that will heal themselves with medkits, heal themselves with adrenaline, uh, inner healing, other forms, and then this perk does absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. And another thing that survivors can do if they're smart you could have two survivors heal another survivor to like 99%. And then if they let go and the survivor finishes the heal themselves, this perk is avoided. This perk only triggers on the finishing moment. So a survivor can finish themselves off and then this perk is completely avoided. Um, it is a little bit more reliable when you leave people on the ground. Because when you leave people on the ground, they can need help unless they have unbreakable. So that's nice. Um, so yeah, um, this perk... Uh, alerting you of survivor screaming doesn't have... It's not great. Um, it only works from a distance from you, so it doesn't work from up close. Uh, you can use it on a doctor, so that if someone gets picked up, you know that they're far away from you. And if someone someone gets healed and then on screen, you know that they're close, so you can blast them with your terror radius. Like, there are some things you can do. I think out of all the killers that this makes the most sense uh, on, I think Oni is really the best. The thing about Oni is that if you know where someone healed, you can show up there even a little bit afterwards and you will mostly find a bunch of blood from the from the time the injured survivor was there. So on Oni, this perk can be occasionally all right. On almost every other killer, I think the downsides and all the stupid gaps in this perk's power are not worth the perk slot. Don't forget that a survivor that is oblivious might make a terrible mistake, yes. 
But you might as well run plaything if you want to lean into that. And they could also be on comms, so maybe the mistake will be nothing at all. Maybe they'll call you out perfectly. So it's a really hard perk to rely on. So I, I really cannot recommend that too highly. Uh, moving on, Deer Stalker. This perk shows you the aura of anyone on the ground for up to six. Uh, uh, sorry, for up to thirty-six meters, which is really, really far. Um, most of the time, you down a survivor and you want to pick them up right away. It's only a few times you leave survivors on the ground for a bit, and even then, let's be honest, they don't typically make a great getaway, so you can find them just fine. Um, this is more geared towards. Killers that want to actively leave survivors or certain survivors on the ground for extended periods of time and to them help find them. And this perk, believe it or not, has a little bit of potential. If survivors crawl away and waste a lot of time, you will still see them. If a survivor has been on the ground for a little bit, sometimes they, when they think that you're far away, they don't know that you know that they're there. Because you see them with a perk, they have no idea. Distortion doesn't protect them from this perk, by the way, nor any other, nor any other auto hiding perk, or 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 I don't know, whatever. So that's pretty nice. Um, so what they might do is they might accidentally reveal their teammates. So sometimes with this perk, you might see someone crawl to a certain corner, and then you can be like, ah, oh, your teammate's here, huh? I'm gonna go and find them. So you can do that. You can run this with Chlorophobia, Sloppy, uh, any other anti-healing perk to make it really hard for people to get picked up around you. And then the perk becomes a little bit mean, but, you know, it's mostly the other perks doing the heavy lifting. This is just an info perk that, for the most part, is completely uh, redundant and doesn't have much of a role on its own. Mad Grid is a really stupid perk. It makes it so that when you are carrying a survivor and you do a basic attack, which is the only thing you can do, you can launch with it, you have zero cooldown. It's like unrelenting, which we're going to talk about in a second, but the cooldown is just zero. So you can just like, you can just like, you know, swing and hack away. And it's really, really funny. This is only for missed attacks. If you hit a survivor, the cooldown is normal. So this doesn't stack with, say, there was for loss. It doesn't stack with unrelenting because it's zero. So 20% or whatever percent of zero is zero. Uh, but yeah, this lets you, this zero cooldown, by the way, can sometimes be cool. Um, sometimes you can hit, uh, you can try to hit a survivor that's trying to take a hit, and the survivor will see you miss, and they'll bait you by running into you, thinking that they, you can't hit them yet, so you're gonna miss and then immediately hit them, and that's really funny. And honestly, the best thing that you can do with this perk is keep it a secret. Do not advertise this perk, do not show the survivors that you have it. If you get a little bit lucky, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna pick up a survivor, you're gonna carry them to a hook, Maybe next to that hook, there are other survivors finishing, finishing a gen, and they'll get the great, bright idea of, hey, the killer has been carrying this guy for a long time. He must be about to wiggle out. Let's go take a hit. Why am I talking like I'm a Canadian? I don't know. And then they'll go and they'll take a hit, and you will hit them, and this perk pauses the progress of the survivor that you have. So if they take a hit, and another hit, and another hit, and another hit, they will all be for not you will still get the hook. And that can be incredible. That is only likely to happen once or twice per game if they're really crazy but and they don't communicate it well. But even if that happens once, that can be really, really game-changing. Sometimes survivors, if they think that they can save a teammate that's on hook, they, will, they are willing to risk a lot. And this perk will turn that right on them. So for the chance of that happening, this perk is almost, almost worth equipping. But otherwise, it is a waste of a perk. Most of the time, survivors will not be looking to take hits, especially if you play a serious killer, like, like for example, Oni. Survivors don't want to give blood to Oni, so don't equip that on them. And definitely keep it a bit quiet, make it a bit of a surprise if you want to have it be the most effective. Okay, next up is Iron Grasp. Iron Grasp extends the time a survivor can be carried. Normally, you can carry a survivor for 16 seconds before they wiggle out. With this, it's about... It's, it's almost two more seconds, so... And, and it also reduces the amount of wiggle that survivors do side to side. So if you're really, really bothered by people running boil over and you have a hard time controlling, I mean, this, this could be a comfy perk for you to use. Is this better than agitation? No, this perk is terrible. If this perk only really benefits if you have to take survivors through very tight structures and you're kind of like clumsy, 
or if you have to carry subarbors for a very long time. But typically with agitation, you're gonna get to that same place sooner. So agitation is a straight upgrade and overall is much, much better than this and helps in more ways. So this is this really only helps with saving a bit of time and that. Uh, so, I'm sorry, this only helps with saving a bit of trouble with the wiggle, which is not even that uh, big of a deal, let's be honest. So overall, this perk means nothing. Could you run this perk with agitation so that you can carry survivors from even longer? Yes, you could, but at that point, you're basically completely telling survivors what your strategy is to take someone to basement from across the map and you don't have enough auxiliary perks to help you in that so now just run agitation and it's enough this perk this perk just does something that another perk does better and it's not worth stacking it so i would tell you to never run it honestly hysteria is a very strange perk when you injure a survivor Survivors that are injured become oblivious. So that survivor is oblivious. And then it goes on cooldown for 30 seconds. And after that, when you injure someone else, injured survivors again become oblivious. So the idea is, okay, you hit a guy, then you hit another guy, then you hit another guy, and then when you hit the fourth guy, everyone is oblivious. Well, guess what, Buttercup? When is that ever going to happen? When? When? How are you going to do that? It's very unusual that you're going to be hitting multiple survivors and somehow keep some kind of situation where everyone is clueless. That is almost never going to happen. Could you run this on Legion? Yeah, you could. But Legion actually wants to have a terror radius because that's how he or she or they detect survivors. So this perk, funny as it might be on Legion, and I've had some success with it sometimes during randomizer uh, games, it also fundamentally counters his own power. I think this perk is best used on Plague, because Plague injures people passively at a distance, so the time when they become uh, oblivious can be a little bit off-putting, and that can actually catch them a bit off guard, not to mention that if you're Plague and you pick up your red puke and you get close to survivors that are oblivious, that can be a bit scary. But again, Plague is such a powerful character that can use reliable info and stealth perks like Tinkerer, so much better than this piece of crap Hysteria. It's also so stupid to make the survivor that you're chasing oblivious, and this perk tells them that they're oblivious. So the first survivor that you injure, they're gonna know one of your perks, and if they're, figure, if they're smart, they might figure out the other three, and now you have less of a surprise around the corner for them. Why? What a waste of a, what a, waste of a perk, in my opinion. Next up is Unrelenting. Unrelenting helps you to recover from a missed attack. Um, now, as you get, there's actually three types of attacks, I suppose. Uh, the first one is the successful one where you hit a survivor. That is only for, say, the best for last. That's the only way to make that faster. So forget about that. This is for when you don't hit survivors. If you hit an obstacle, let's say you, you hit the edge of a wall or the edge of a window, this perk doesn't help you. So this perk doesn't help the dredge to break locks faster or anything like that. So forget about that. This is only if you whiff, if you hit the air. And this perk helps you to recover faster. Now, um, there are maybe three cases where this perk is worth running. Number one is if you're new and you miss a lot. If you miss a lot, you're gonna swing and miss and you waste less distance, so you might actually catch survivors a bit off guard. There are some killers that swing out of using their power. For example, uh, Hag, you can teleport and swing immediately to try to go for a hit. And if you have this perk and you miss, not a big deal. Uh, same with Spirit, you can use your power, face, swing, and if you miss, you don't lose much distance. So this can be a, a, a bit of a learning perk for those killers. Um, then there's also a little technique um, that all killers can use to save time around um, certain edges. Um, I've made a video, <laughs> and you can check my, my Dead by Daylight um, FAQ um, if, you wanna, if you wanna do a control F and search it. But the, the gist of it is that if you're a killer that needs to drop into, drop from a second floor and then go back into the building or under the platform, you actually save time by swinging at the edge as you reach it and then recovering during the fall. Because you get a speed boost and then the slowdown happens while you're naturally falling and affected by gravity, you basically save time. It's it's a bit complicated, but if you see it and you try it, you'll quickly realize it's true and very helpful. Well, with unrelenting, it becomes even more effective. So say you're playing on the game, 
right? And you're on the CCTV room, the one with the two pallets. And the survivor takes the drop that goes into the bathroom below. And then they run outside the bathroom. With this perk, you could swing at the ledge, then turn around and you would recover super, super fast and actually catch up to the survivor quite nicely. And this perk enhances that. And finally, we have a final, uh, the, the, the finally released killer, the Singularity, the, the, the very latest one. And that killer can actually benefit from this perk a little bit. You see, the Singularity, um, when he teleports, he becomes completely, completely immune to pallets. He can, he can basically destroy them without being affected. Uh, but if you want to destroy them, you need to be inside the pallet when it's dropped. So with Unrelenting, you can have this idea where if a survivor is ahead of you and you teleport to them, and you're overclocked, you can swing at the pallet and two things will happen. Either the survivor will drop the pallet and then you break it for free, nice, or they keep running. And if they keep running because of Unrelenting, you save you, you don't slow yourself down as much, so you actually go around and you just hit them normally. So it's a bit of a win-win. So uh, it can be a cute perk on him. Other than that, it's a waste of a perk. In 90% of your killer matches, you're not going to miss a single swing. So why bring a perk to help you in a failure that you're trying to avoid, right? So yeah, that's what I'm doing for you. And now we get to the very, very worst perks. Now, Hoarder used to be an actually decent perk because it would warn you when survivors picked up auxiliary special items. So on Pinhead, or on Wesker, on Nemesis, if they picked up vaccines, the cube, the first aid sprays, you got a warning. And this was awesome. But they patched that out. Now they're special items and this perk doesn't detect that anymore. This perk only warns you when survivors are opening chests and when they're picking up items. You can run this perk with Franklins and with other add-ons that make survivors drop their items so you know when they're picking their items up. And every now and then, it will help you find the occasional survivor that is opening a chest. But let me tell you something, newsflash, survivors that are opening chests are not that serious. Survivors that are serious, they bring their own insane items and they shred the, to the, the, the gens with toolboxes and they heal through their damage with their medkits. So this is not a perk that you bring against the strongest survivors that you're expecting. It's kind of mean. Yeah, it can help you. It has a big range, so you might find someone healing in basement from really far away and, you know, that could really destroy them. But it is really, really a perk that you don't necessarily want to bring. It also creates extra chests in the map for no reason. And even though this is unlikely, it could also lead to survivors finding more items than you want them to. I don't know, in some rare scenario where that ends up working out for them. So overall, not a great perk and definitely hard to use on its own. Next up, we have Bloodhound. Bloodhound makes the blood that the survivors leave on the ground be much brighter visually, which for some folks is helpful for tracking. Uh, you don't need to run this for Victor on the twins because he already makes the blood naturally brighter. But for any other killer, it's kind of nice. And it also works. It's not a basic attack perk, so it works no matter how you injure, which is also kind of nice that it works on every killer. Uh, the nicest thing about this perk, though, other than the, the blood being brighter, is that the blood lasts four seconds longer on your screen only. Not on theirs, but on yours. That means that sometimes you will go to a locker and you will see a little bit of blood in front of it, and the Suara will be like, oh, I didn't leave any blood, he doesn't know, and you will know, and they won't know why you know. So that's nice. And just in chase, it will be a little bit easier for you to pick up the traces of people that have been around. So it's a nice tracking perk, but that's literally all it does, and it's just four seconds, and it might not even ever come in clutch in most of your games. Eh, hard to recommend it. Next up is Wolfie Perk, aka Territorial Imperative. If you are relatively far from the basement and someone goes into the basement, this perk does a little sound and shows you the aura of the person in question. This is terrible. This is awful. I've run this so many times on killers that are good at defending basement, just in the off chance that someone goes there and no one ever goes there. The only salvageable... Uh, use for this perk, in my opinion, is to run it on a build specifically designed for basement with agitation and make your choice. And the idea here would be that you're going to hook someone in the basement, wait in the distance when this perk triggers, 
you will teleport. You can teleport with um, with Freddy, with Dredge, with um, a teleport from um, Freddy. Um, also, Demogorgon with the portals. Hag with the with the mint rag or if that's an add-on you can teleport with a variety of killers and then it's basically a trade right because they have to come out of the basement and they have make your choice so you're kind of screwed so basically you can use this perk to pretty much guarantee that you know when to teleport back to make that a trade are these builds incredible no but they're fun so yeah you can put that as part of that build otherwise though a wholly uninteresting and mostly useless perk Next up, we have Distressing. Distressing increases your turret radius by 26%, uh, making it about 40 meters long, and it is an awful, awful perk. With a, It also gives you extra blood points, but guess what? It gives you extra blood points in that category that's easy to max out. So, yeah, it doesn't really give you extra. It just makes you reach it faster. It's not very good at that either. Uh, having a bigger terror radius means that survivors will start hearing you uh, a few seconds, a couple seconds sooner. Depending on your on how you approach, it could be maybe two to three seconds sooner. And that is awful. You will play games where you're like, what? Where is everyone? Early game, you don't find anyone. And it's because they can hear you and they start reacting so much sooner. It is absolutely terrible and a horrible general perk. That being said, a bigger terror radius can be useful for a few killers. If you're planning to use it on Starstruck, instead use Agitation, which is a bigger uh, terror radius only when it matters. Um, and if you're trying to use Infectious Fright, please consider Monitor and Abuse instead. However, you could have Distressing on a Doctor build to make, uh, along with Calm Addons, to make your terror radius be like 60 meters long. And on some maps that envelops the entire place. So on Doctor, and maybe a couple other killers with very specific builds, this can be all right, and it can be somewhat worth the perk slot. On almost anything else, it is an actively harmful perk that you should probably avoid. Next up, we have Dying Light. Uh, Dying Light is a perk that makes... Um, first of all, the reason why it's this low, it's because it gives the obsession, number one, an indicator that you have this perk, and number two, a buff of 33% faster healing and 33% faster unhooking other survivors. Why? Why? This, that is better than some su su survivor healing perks. That is better than leader. It is better than better than new. Like, <laughs> why? Why does it buff survivors? I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, but then the actual effect for the killer is that every time you hook a non-obsession, the perk grows stronger. And for every stack, you make the you make healing and slow down uh, and slow and gens slower by three percent. So one hook, it's three percent. Two hooks, it's six percent. Three hooks, it's nine percent. To healing and gens. That sounds not too bad. I mean, th you get three hooks and things are 9% slower forever. That sounds pretty good. But this perk doesn't work if you kill the obsession, doesn't get tokens if you hook the obsession, and doesn't affect the obsession. Now, there are four survivors, right? One of them is the obsession, and it's never going to be affected. And the other one is one that you're constantly chasing, right? So you're chasing one of them, and then another, and then another. So there's going to be one survivor that you're constantly chasing, hopefully. So that means that at any given time, two survivors are doing gens 3, 6, or 9% slower. Is that a big deal? Absolutely not. When you consider the fact that the obsession might be doing some really nasty healing here and there, it is awful. The only, um, the only killer I would recommend this perk on is Lesion and or Plague. With Lesion... Survivor's so healing is not a big deal because you can undo it really quickly. So healing is a bit of a trap. And with Plague, they can't heal each other. So it doesn't matter. And the thing about Plague is that she's very good at using her fountains to get a few hooks early on. So it actually makes sense that you get a few hooks and then things slow down for a bit. And the slowdown actually comes into play. Even on those killers, as I mentioned with Thanatophobia earlier, there are much far better perks that you should consider instead. So uh, honestly, Dying Light is... A really weird cookie. Next up is Strider. Strider makes the healing, sorry, forgive me, uh, the injured noise of survivors louder and easier to hear. You don't hear it from further, but I think you hear it louder from the same distance. 
Now, uh, what this means is that any survivor uh, that is injured, that's trying to crouch or go into a locker or be sneaky around you is going to have a much harder time losing you. And it's going to be much harder for you to go past a survivor and not notice it. Um, some killers benefit from this kind of passively. For example, on Dredge, when you teleport across the map, you still listen around the map. And it's quite nice uh, to be able to listen to someone. Worth the perk slot? Absolutely not. Um, some people used to run this perk on Spirit. And you might see some old videos where Spirits run this perk. I don't advise that you do. I've tried it a few times and it is an absolute disaster. The thing is, us killer players, believe it or not, we get used to a certain correlation of noise, distance, yada yada. And when this perk is added into the mix, it messes with you. You will think that a survivor is right on top of you when in reality they are like three meters ahead of you. And it, it will make playing spirit almost impossible. For most killers, I think it's really not that worth it. Really not that worth it. And the really sad part is that survivors have one perk called Off the Record, which is very common. And the perk makes them zero sound, zero percent sound. And guess what? Louder zero percent is still zero percent. This perk makes those survivors still zero. So why would you run a perk that one of the most common meta perks and survivors can easily effortlessly outplay while they also do a bunch of things? What an absolute joke oh my god never mind um strider is actually the best perk in the game if you compare it to the next one furtive chase furtive chase is a perk that triggers when you hook the obsession actually it triggers when the obsession gets unhooked i believe and then the person that unhooks the obsession becomes the new obsession and then you go for that person presumably and then you hook them and then when they get unhooked the next person becomes the obsession and that's it. That's it. That's the best part about Furtive Chase, that it changes the obsession for you. Why would you want to do that? I don't know. Maybe you're playing Myers and you have that one add-on that only works on the obsession and makes them... Okay, maybe you have some weird agenda. Um, you could use um, other perks such as Game of Foot, which is far superior. You could use even Nemesis, which is more straightforward and that would be better. But hey, that's the thing. There is one build, one build only, that makes... This perk somewhat usable and is the most the most draconian Machiavellian plan ever. I'll probably make a video about it at some point. Either way, you, all you need to know is that switching the obsession and giving the power to the survivors to choose what the obsession will be is a horrible idea. Obviously, when they see the perk in action, they'll figure out that it's this perk. So if they have to play around it, they will. No problem. And it's terrible. Absolutely, absolutely terrible. Uh, now, the other thing that this perk does is even more embarrassing. Whenever this obsession change happens, you gain one token up to four. And your chase, during chase, your terror radius will become smaller. I feel like that bears repeating. Your terror radius will become smaller by four meters per token during chase. During chase. Why? What's the point? I guess the only point... Um, nowadays is that maybe you chase a survivor and some other survivor that is absolutely clueless, that's not looking at the HUD, that has no comms, no perks, no eyes, no ears, suddenly gets surprised. I don't know. It's super, super weird. Makes no sense. I've heard some theories about how this perk can help some killers like Ghostface to lose their terradius faster and how you can make your terradius like shrink into nothingness quicker like with pig crouch it still makes no bloody sense and it's definitely not worth the perk slot jesus awful ay 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 next up um i need a i need a minute break <laughs> Um, apologies for that. So the next perk is Hangman's Trick. This perk does two things. The first one is anytime a survivor is trying to sabotage a hook, you will get an early notification. This isn't a big deal. Most of the time this happens. You all like when by the time it happens, you already see it. And sometimes you seeing it um, doesn't really matter. If there's another hook, you'll go to another hook. Good. If there's not another hook, you'll be screwed, even if you know about it. So it's not a huge deal, but it can sometimes save your life and prevent as a, a successful sabotage. 
Um, be careful though, because survivors are smart. They'll sometimes wait until you're really, really close to really start it and finish it. So keep that in mind. And the other thing that's a bit more useful is that it shows you the aura of survivors close to any hook on the map while you carry a survivor. Now, it's only six meters. It's not the end of the world. Um, and most of the time, this means nothing. So, like, hooks almost never spawn close enough to other props of the map so that you will naturally see survivors. What I found most commonly happens is that you pick up a survivor and then... If another survivor was unhooked, you might see that they are healing under the hook. So you, you might be like, oh, they're healing. Guess what? That's pointless. Let me ask you a question. If you hook Claudette and then you chase Jake and you down Jake and you pick up Jake and you see that Claudette gets unhooked and then you see that Claudette in the hut goes healthy, what do you think happened? They heal under the hook. You don't even need to see their aura to know that. You can already figure that out. So the information that this provides is at at most okay-ish and 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 somewhat uh, empty. And at the and and more often than not, it is completely redundant. So what a waste of a perk slot. Damn, I don't even want to talk about it more. Let's move on. Uh, Predator. Uh, funny that you should talk about Predator. In the most recent update, the scratch marks on survivors have been altered. We don't know if this is intentional or not. Now they are very spready. They, they get all over the place. This might be an undocumented change or it might be a bug that they fix. But either way, uh, what this perk does is twofold. Actually, does it? It... Hold up. I might... Let me... Oh yeah, no, sorry, I, I was actually gonna tell you that this perk is better than it is. Uh, forgive me, I, I was thinking about Lightwood. Uh, it makes the scratch marks spawn closer together. Now, this is good for two kinds of players. Number one, for people that are kind of lost in the corn, and they just want to follow one straight line, and then this perk is kind of nice at helping you distinguish, you know, misleading scratch marks from the ones pointing forward. That can be okay. And it's also okay as a beginner spirit player uh, perk. When you use your power as spirit, you will follow scratch marks into survivors. And with this perk, the scratch marks are so tied together that it's actually kind of nice sometimes to really, really zone in and, and go and, and not waste any time. So that's nice. But for the average killer, the information from this is minimal. You already see scratch marks just fine. And this perk actually has a major downside. Because the scratch marks spawn so cluttered together, they are more likely to be hidden under grass and to not be visible from a distance. This, what this means in practice is that in a normal game, you will many times find survivors at the start and throughout the game because they run by a tree or they run by a barrel or they run by some other obstacle and you see a little bit of red there um, that they left when they were careless. But this kind of information that will often be very helpful is completely gone because with this perk, all of those scratch marks are flat on the ground. They don't actually stick to anything on the side because they're so tied together. And if you run this perk a few times, uh, after being used to normal scratch marks, you will find that you constantly lose survivors on the grassier maps, and it is super annoying. So for a perk to, on average, do more harm than good, you can already guess my opinion of it. It sucks. Um, coming up, we have Insidious. Insidious is a perk that makes you stealthy if you stand still for two seconds. There is no good way to use this perk in, in a way that doesn't make you waste time. The most creative and, and useful uh, application to this perk that I've discovered or that I've been told about ever is on twins. You can sometimes pretend to be Charlotte and pretend to be sleepy as if you're controlling Victor. And then if they go for an unhook, which should be impossible by the way, you shouldn't be able to be sleepy next to an unhook, you can go and grab them or something. So in that situation, yeah, that's kind of funny and that's pretty hilarious. Um, other things that you can do that people do all the time, they camp the hooks in the basement with Insidious. The thing is, if survivors see you and they call you out, you might be waiting there 30 seconds for nothing. Do you want to do that? It's not very... It's a bit risky, it's not very competitive, and it's more than anything else, extremely hacking boring. I'm also the kind of person that has sometimes kicked the gen 
and hit next to it with Insidious to try to grab someone. And that's funny, but what if survivors see you? You know, you could also do, if you want to do that, you can have Dragon's Grip and Trail of Torment. So the, 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 the walls are closing in. All of the options are going away. The truth is this perk for the most part is an absolute meme and how it still exists to this day in this game is beyond me. It's awful. Um, coming up, we have Beast of Prey. This, this um, perk gives you extra blood points in the Hunter category. That is actually one of the easiest categories to max out. And you're probably going to max it out without this perk, so it's not that helpful. It doesn't make you get more points on the max, so forget about that. And if you've been chasing a survivor for a long time, it makes you undetectable. Yeah, you shouldn't be chasing survivors for long enough for this perk to come into play. Not to mention that it's not just based on timer, it's based on bloodlust. So if you play a certain character like Doctor, every time you shock, you lose bloodlust. So this perk almost never comes into play. The only nice thing about this perk is that you being undetectable might occasionally outplay certain auto reading perks or add-ons or, or perks or whatever. So that can be nice. And it can occasionally, you know, losing your red your red stain in front of you can occasionally mess with survivors. But this is, we're talking one in a million. This is so unlikely to be helpful in a real game. I find it really, really bad and possibly one of the worst perks in the game. And then we arrive at Shadowborn. Shadowborn right now increases your field of view so that you can see more around your camera. This is something that some people find, I personally find it nice. It messes with me a little bit when I put it on and I'm not used to it. It makes me think that I can reach further than I can, so it can mess with your memory. But it's overall nice. However, for some folks that have um, certain um, certain difficulties with motion blur and stuff like that, without this perk, they get really, really sick. They don't. The 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 normal FOV of killer makes them really sick and they get headaches. So for those people that get used to this perk, it's really really helpful. Uh, there are also a few killers where survivors will routinely run into your feet to try to hide and dodge your hatchets or your chainsaw. And this perk does help you a little bit to keep track with them, and I do find it useful for that. Uh, but for the most part, this is a perk that you shouldn't worry about too much. The devs have confirmed that in the near future, they will turn the FOB field of view into a feature. So I imagine that this perk will be reworked into doing something different then. And then the field of view will, the field of view will be something that we can all use as a setting and we don't have to worry about too much. Anyway. These are all the perks of Dead by Daylight. I hope that you enjoyed. I know I talked about uh, some of them a little bit shorter than I could have, but if there's any gaps in my knowledge or any important information that I neglected to share, I would really appreciate if you leave a comment so that I can learn about it if I didn't know, and the rest of the viewers can learn from you as well. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one, which will hopefully not be... Actually, it will probably be longer than this. Uh, let's get some rest.